Hello friends. Welcome to the Muse fanfiction. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto had a power of goddess Nyx. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Sasuke. Called out a well-built young man, with no sign of fat on his body. He had cerulean blue eyes and bright spiky blonde hair with red streaks. He had an angular face with three distinctive whisker marks on both sides. His cloths consisted of a black armor vest. Underneath the vest was a black short-sleeved shirt, black cargo pants with a leaf symbol belt buckle, and combat boots. The young man turned around, showing the black markings covering the right side of his face. So it's you Naruto, Sasuke said with an impassive voice, looking at him curiously. What's with the wardrobe change, Dobi? He asked, remembering that Naruto used to wear an orange jumpsuit. Naruto Uzumaki is a genin of Konohagakure no Sato, or village hidden in the leaves. He is also the Jinchuriki of the Kiyubi no Yoko, or the nine-tailed fox demon. A beast powerful enough that with just one swipe of its tails, it can cause natural disasters, such as tsunamis or tornadoes. The fox was sealed in him when he was a newborn by the fourth Hokage, the leader of his village, on October 10th. As his dying wish, the fourth asked for Naruto to be viewed as a hero who saved the village by containing the Kiyubi, but sadly it was not meant to be. Instead the people viewed Naruto as the demon, reborn into human skin, powerless and weak. So in their hatred they hunted Naruto down. In his childhood, Naruto experienced hell. He was hunted down like a wild animal by an angry mob aiming to torture him before killing him. Throughout his childhood Naruto was beaten to a bloody pulp, stabbed, slashed with rusty objects, burned, and marked with a branding iron. One burn on his chest red demon and the other on his back that red Kiyubi. He was even poisoned to a point where he built up immunity and finally, he was drowned. All his wounds healed thanks to the nine-tailed fox, but the damage had already been done with his innocence and childhood lost. It was only through those beatings that Naruto found out he was a Jinchuriki. The only question he could ask was, why him? Why did the fourth Hokage choose him to live this life of hell? Naruto even asked the third Hokage, someone who he used to view as a surrogate grandfather. But the only answer he would get is that he didn't know. So, imagine the shock and betrayal he felt when he had to find out from the people who were torturing and trying to kill him. The blonde wanted nothing more than to lash out and seek revenge. To make all those people suffer as they did him throughout his life. But the blonde realized that it wouldn't matter. He couldn't get back the childhood he lost. He was forced to mature. He couldn't get back all those lonely nights of him sleeping in the harsh land or the food he was forced to eat. Such as rats, rotten food and other things he had to salvage just so he could survive. It was all lost to him and he couldn't get it back, so instead, he embraced his hatred, his suffering, his anger, his darkness, and even his curse. He embraced all of it and used it as a sort of motivation to make himself strong instead of stooping to their level of ignorance and mindless. Revenge. Along with protecting those who he considered his friends, people who cared for him when he was a child. A perfect example was Lilith, also known as Mother Superior. She, along with people she trusted, owned the major brothels, strip clubs and other business establishments in the red light, where Naruto lived the vast majority of his life. She has long brown hair, green pupil-less eyes, DD cup, tan skin, a heart-shaped face, a perfect hourglass figure, and she would usually be seen wearing her black kimono with a dark blue flowering design blue thigh high heels modified to store a hidden knife and holster several senbon. She was after all a former anbu, which were considered the elite warriors of a hidden village. She, along with her girls, would always hide Naruto from mobs and would always help him. This, at the least, made Naruto's life bearable. And it wasn't just her or her employees. Everyone in the red light saw Naruto as a hero and not the demon reborn. Most were former shinobi. They could tell the difference between a storage scroll and a kanai, unlike some of the villagers who saw Naruto as a demon and unwanted material. It was the 10th of October, when the blonde and them first met. Naruto was being chased by a murderous and angry mob. That's when Naruto bumped into her. She instantly recognized him from her sources and felt a huge amount of anger at the mob that for trying to kill him, so she hid him in her main brothel the Heavenly Leaf. Ever since then, 
Naruto would come and hide there and Lilith and her girls would always hide him, considering all her girls saw him as their little brother or the older girls would see Naruto as a son. It was also worth mentioning that Lilith took great care of her girls, making sure they were safe and healthy, even in that kind of profession. Naruto respected them, regardless of their profession and still saw them as equals, looking past what society thinks of his sisters and motherly figures or the people of the red light, though he knew they could handle themselves as a majority of them were former shinobi and kunoichi. Naruto ignored the Uchiha's question and insult, instead he had his own question for the Uchiha heir. You're really going through with this aren't you, he asked, though it wasn't really a question. Naruto knew the depths Sasuke would go to in order to gain more power. You're really going to that traitorous snake bastard for power. Sasuke nodded, he needed this power to kill his brother, the person responsible for killing his entire clan and their parents. He was also pampered by the civilian council, the people responsible for most of Naruto hellish ordeal. Also they could get favors and elevate themselves through the delusional and revenge-driven Uchiha. The blonde sighed. Idiot doesn't know anything about what his brother did. Naruto knew the truth behind that fateful day, the Uchiha massacre, but Itachi Uchiha made him promise to keep it a secret. Then I have no other choice. By order of the Hokage, I hereby place you under arrest for treason, Naruto stated, shocking the dark-haired teen, before suddenly laughing. And who's going to bring me in, you, please, Dobi? You're dead last in the academy. How can you bring me, who was dubbed Rookie of the Year and top of our class, in? Huh, Dobi? Sasuke said in a mocking voice. He felt insulted. He thought they would at least send someone stronger than. The duck ass haired teen was suddenly and abruptly broken from his thoughts when he felt a fist collide with his face and a hand grabbing the collar of his shirt. Before the Uchiha knew it, he was underwater. This all happened within a fraction of a second. The hell, he thought in disbelief. Sasuke swam up to the surface and channeled his chakra to his hands to lift himself up from the water. He did the same thing to his feet so he could stand on the surface of the water. What Teme, you look dazed. The last loyal Uchiha looked up to see Naruto standing casually on top of the water. I didn't even see him move. No it was only a lucky shot, he thought. You could surrender and save me the trouble of having to drag your pampered ass back to Konoha, Naruto offered, causing Sasuke's shake in sheer anger. How dare this, this commoner trash underestimate him, a noble Uchiha. He'll make him pay. With that thought in mind, Sasuke charged at the blonde with murderous intent. The blonde sighed tiredly and muttered, I tried reasoning, before easily sidestepping Sasuke's attack and kicking the Uchiha up into the air. Naruto quickly leapt upward, not giving Sasuke time to react. The bond kicked downward, sending the Uchiha hurtling straight to the cold water. The duck ass never even touched the surface, as Naruto kicked him again sending him to the right, and then he kicked him again, this time to the upper left. Hope you can swim after this, Naruto said, grabbing Sasuke from behind and pile drive him straight into the water while rotating at a ferocious speed. He let go of Sasuke at the last possible second before said teen dropped into the water. The blonde felt a bit of strain in his muscles and slightly dizzy, but other than that he was fine. Hey! Bet Lee would be jealous as hell if he found out I can do the Omet Renge, front lotus without the need to unlock the Hachiman, eight gates, the blonde thought. Suddenly, his opponent jumped out of the water, going through the necessary hand seals before shouting. Kaden! Gokaku no Jutsu, fire release! great fireball technique. Sasuke fired a massive orb of roaring flames straight at his former teammate. The blonde remained calm and did a one-handed seal. Sweden. Suijinheki, water release, water formation wall. Naruto used the technique to create a wall of water to block and dissipate Sasuke's technique. Naruto didn't have an affinity for water techniques, but it didn't mean he couldn't use them. Using different affinities, other than your own, takes up a lot of chakra. Luckily for Naruto, he had nearly endless chakra reserves. The two jutsu collided, creating a blanket of steam. This didn't bother Naruto in the slightest. Thanks to his ability to sense people's energy and emotions, the blonde didn't need to see where his opponent is. The same thing cannot be said about Sasuke. Since he wasn't a sensory type like Naruto, he couldn't see where his opponent was. And, in a battle, that can be a death sentence. Futon. Repusho, wind release. Gale palm. Rather than clapping his hands together, 
Naruto manipulate the hot steam to create a powerful gale. Shit. Sasuke cursed. Knowing he had no chance of evading, he did his best to defend against the attack. The last loyal Uchiha screamed in pain, feeling his skin being burned by the hot air before he was then slammed into the ground. Give it up Sasuke, you stand no chance against me. Sasuke glared at Naruto with anger and hatred in his eyes. The Uchiha hated the fact that this no-name orphan was basically kicking his ass without so much as breaking a sweat. How can he be stronger than me? He's the in-class clown and the dead last. Sasuke wondered. Naruto was the one who failed to graduate three times and was at the bottom of the class. So he shouldn't be dominating this battle, it should be himself. He was an Uchiha, top of his class, a prodigy. He was the heir to the most prestigious clan, he. You must be wondering how I'm dominating you in this fight. Due to his shock Sasuke, could only nod to Naruto's words. One word Sasuke, just one word, the dark-haired teen heard him say. Deception. That single word rang in the mind of Sasuke Uchiha and it confused him to no end, which Naruto saw. I see, even in your pained state, you are confused. Well let me enlighten you, Naruto said. Then, in a blink of an eye, the blonde was standing in front of Sasuke and crouching. He looked into Sasuke's onyx-colored eyes with his cerulean blue eyes. Deception is the bread and butter of a ninja, something that most, if not all, have forgotten. I, on the other hand, used this fact to deceive everyone into believing that I was weak. By becoming the class clown and the dead last, it worked. Not even the third Hokage, the so-called professor, figured out I was wearing a mask and hiding my true skills. So, you see Sasuke, I'm stronger than you and most Jonin. Hell, if I remove certain restriction seals, then I could practically match that snake bastard. Now let's try this again shall we? Naruto stopped for a bit and his gaze turned deadly cold. Would you kindly, give up? Something inside Sasuke snapped. The thought of Naruto being stronger than him did it. Sasuke couldn't accept the mere thought of it. How could he? Sasuke was given everything he asked for to become strong from those in the civilian council. Dark purple chakra suddenly burst out of Sasuke's body, causing Naruto to jump back and away from the Uchiha. So he tapped into the power of the curse seal. This should be interesting. The curse seal, which was created by Orochimaru, the person Sasuke was planning to join to gain more power, was a seal that increased the user's chakra levels and physical capabilities while the seal is active. Once branded, the person had a 1 in 10 chance of survival. If they do survive they would become host bodies for Orochimaru to use when he needed a new one for his ambition of immortality. Orochimaru is able to do this due to the seal containing a part of him to inhabit the host body slowly preparing him, her for the transfer. Naruto could only shudder thinking of that gay pedophile inside of Sasuke. That is just wrong on so many levels. He grimaced at the mere thought of it and, in all honesty, almost hurled. Naruto pushed those thoughts back into the deepest corner of his mind and turned his attention back to the Uchiha, who was slowly standing up. From the looks of it, the black markings were spreading over his entire body. This must be the second level Anko told me about, Naruto thought. Sasuke's skin turned dark gray, his hair grew and turned dark blue. His eyes also turned dark gray with the Sharingan active. Additionally, he grew webbed claw-shaped wings from his back and a dark, star-shaped mark appeared across the bridge of his nose. I'm going to kill you, Sasuke said with a dark demented voice, before he flew straight at Naruto with extraordinary speeds thanks to the curse seal. The blonde simply sighed and met Sasuke halfway matching the Uchiha's speed with his own. The two fought for supremacy. Sasuke would attack the blonde with ferocious strikes, using everything from his hands and legs to those wings of his. The blonde would dodge or block all his attacks like he was predicting Sasuke's every movement, which he actually was. Naruto had the keen ability to predict and anticipate his opponent's movement based on the muscle movement of the body down to the last millisecond. He could then choose to block, dodge, or counter the attack. So this is all the curse seal can do? Naruto taunted, dodging a roundhouse kick and blocking a second kick. He then grabbed Sasuke's leg and tossed him into the large statue depicting Hashirama Senju, founder of Konoha and the first Hokage. Naruto himself jumped on top of Madara Uchiha, founder of the Uchiha clan and Hashirama's greatest rival. The Valley of the End. Hey, 
fitting place since your ambitions are about to come to an end, Naruto said in a calming tone before he saw Sasuke charging up his Chidori. The blonde expected to hear a distinct chirping noise that is normally associated with the 1000 bird technique. Instead, Naruto heard the sound of flapping wings and the color of the Chidori had a rather dark gleam instead of its normally bright blue hue. Naruto took a small breath of air and concentrated on calling out the nine-tailed fox's chakra. Suddenly Crimson Chakra began to dance around Naruto and his features became more feral as the energy began to surround him like a blanket. The blonde Jinchuriki held his right hand up and a swirling ball of pure chakra began to form. Naruto concentrated the fox's chakra into the yellowish blue ball and, slowly, the color shifted to a more purple, orange, and red color. Let's end this dobi. Gladly T.E.M.E. Both shinobi flung themselves into the air at each other, with their attacks colliding. Habitaku Chidori, flapping 1000 birds Shui Rasengan, Vermilion Spiraling Sphere. The energies combined around the two former teammates, creating a large sphere of pure energy around them. Suddenly there was a flash of light and a massive explosion of pure power, and Naruto could be seen standing tall while Sasuke was on the ground unconscious. You should have given up, this wouldn't have happened and you would still have your right ha, URK. Naruto stumbled and felt a familiar sensation of cold steel burrowing into his flesh. The blonde turned around with anger in his eyes. Kakashi Hitaki, Naruto spat with venom in his voice. Removing the knife, Naruto suddenly fell to his knees and felt his insides burning. Hello demon. I can see you're feeling the effects of the quick-acting poison I laced that Kanai with, Naruto's traitorous teacher said with glee. The blonde looked up with fading eyes as the poison was quickly spreading through his body as he struggled to get back up. Damn it, Naruto mentally cursed as he felt his pulse fading away. Try as he might, he couldn't even defend himself as he stumbled to the ground. With hazy vision, Naruto could see Kakashi about to finish him off until something from the shadows suddenly sprang up. It was too fast for his traitorous teacher to react, as it cut Kakashi in half. The last thing he saw was a woman wearing a black hooded cloak, he could distinctively hear her say something, but couldn't make out what since his consciousness was slowly fading. Unknown Pav I decided to visit the elemental nations and check up on my son. My mortal shell was destroyed when it was stabbed by a massive claw, courtesy of the Kyubi, whose power could be equal to that of Typhoon. I felt weak and I had no choice but to recover my power back in my dimension, but in doing so I left my son, Naruto. As a goddess, I can travel from dimension to dimension. I chose the elemental nations, a warring world that had enough conflict to make Ares drool. As a rule in going to different dimensions, I have to take up a mortal body and have my memories sealed, for a time. In those years, I never would have thought that I, well my mortal self, would fall in love with a woman named Kashina Uzumaki. But the intriguing thing about Kashina was that she was a demigod, and to my surprise, the daughter of Hestia. Though I sensed that she wasn't born by natural means, I deduced that she was born similar to how Athena would bear children. But that was only after my mortal body was destroyed. Ah yes Kashina Uzumaki, heiress of the Uzumaki clan, a clan that was considered one of the best sword users and had mastery over seals, whose bloodline gave them incredibly strong life force which can both endure and survive most grievous injuries plus incredible longevity. The clan members are also blessed with great recuperative powers able to quickly recover from extreme exhaustion and mend most injuries in short periods of time. They also value the bonds of friendship and, more importantly, family. This could be why Hestia would have a child with one of them. Another thing I noted is that Kashina was also a legacy of Aphrodite, though I am not surprised by this, considering how beautiful Kashina was. From her long flowing blood red silk like hair, violet eyes, milky white skin, and her luscious curves down to her firm e bust and firm rear. Truly, if I didn't know any better, I would say Kashina was a daughter of the goddess of love, not the hearth. But to be honest, the Uzumakis were a clan of demigods. My mortal body was able to trace back each Uzumaki up to the first Uzumaki, though I wasn't surprised by this fact, it made sense. Such as the swords they use, an Uzumaki sword was known to be the best in the entire elemental nation. The swords were light as a feather able to cut through the toughest metal or cleave a person in half, and extremely durable. Truly Hephaestus would have been proud of such weapons. The Uzumaki clan was also known for their agricultural skills, known to be great farmers. 
considering how small their island was, they were still able to grow an abundance of rice, vegetables, and fruits. The system of law was also advanced compared to the rest of the elemental nations. Demeter would be proud of them. They did well for their trading, though it was hard due to the fact that only an Uzumaki could navigate over the vast whirlpools that surrounded the village. After all, it is called Uzushiogakure, the village hidden by whirling tides, and this is where Poseidon comes into the clan's relations. They were also known to be great hunters. Well, there was a squad of just female hunters, and their anbu was founded by a female. There was equality within their clan for both male and female. A perfect example was their Izukage, who was female and the first container for the Kayubi, Mito Uzumaki. I have doubts that Artemis wouldn't have smiled at that. As far as ninjas go, they were known to be the best retrieval teams in the elemental nations. Able to steal information without anyone knowing about it, and their merchants were all best in the business. This is why their clan was known to be the richest clan, a definite relation to Hermes. Their theaters were known to be the most entertaining, given how talented they were with music and poetry as well as their marvelous works of art. I can see the relation to both Dionysus and Apollo. Oh, I remember the Uzumaki clan was known for their pranks and if you are on the receiving end, well you can say goodbye to your sanity, because an Uzumaki prank was considered a maddening experience and only a lucky few have kept their sanity intact, very few. In battle, the clan was known for their fierce reputation to a point that all ninjas under the clan were all ASS rank. This was because of their abnormal chakra, allowing them to manifest golden chains from their body which they could manipulate to their will in battle. A prime example of this was Kashina, also known as the Akai Chishio no Habanero, red hot blooded habanero due to her fierceness in battle and the last thing her enemies would see was her luscious blood red hair. Kashina was able to control her chakra chains to a degree that they could deflect almost all attacks and she could easily subdue anyone including the biju, which I can compare to the titans, such as the kayubi which, who was regarded as the strongest biju and her former tenant. I am proud to say that her rank was sulfur monosulfide rank with a flea on sight order, meaning do not engage in combat. Yes Ares would have truly been proud of this clan. Now aside from their reputation in battle, the seals they made were all legendary, an example was a storage scroll. This scroll was made to store any and all items by creating a pocket dimension, meaning an Uzumaki can literally create their own dimension using seals. Yes this is where Athena's relation to the clan comes in. Another seal, known for sealing biju, was the Shiki Fujin, dead demon consuming seal, a seal only made possible due to the connection and relation to Hades. A seal that is able to consume an enemy's soul. But it is also a double edged sword, at least for a non Uzumaki, as the seal would also consume the user's soul. Now, when my mortal shell traced the clan to the first Uzumaki, it discovered that she was the wife of the Sage of Six Paths. In the elemental nations, he was considered a god and she was the daughter of both Zeus and Hera. I guessed that, like me and the rest of the gods and goddesses, both of them took a vacation here in the elemental nation and had a child, but since they took up a mortal body, the child was a demi-goddess. My mortal shell couldn't find her name, due to the fact that the Uzumaki clan was wiped out by the combined might of three of the five major villages. I suspected it was due to the fact that those villages grew jealous of the clan's rise to power and they felt threatened by them. These villages were, or the village hidden by clouds, Iwagakura, or the village hidden by rocks, and Kirigakir, more infamously known as the village of the bloody mist. Though I suspected someone in Konoha also had a hand in this, since the seal barrier protecting the village was reportedly destroyed and I know that no one in the clan would ever betray their own, so it had to be someone in Konoha. But since my mortal body was destroyed I wasn't able to find out who was responsible for it. From what Kashina told me, which was told to her by Mito, it nearly cost each of the villages involved all of their shinobi and kunoichi since it took ten squads to eliminate a single Uzumaki and the Izukage was able to wipe out half of the army on her own. The clan fought hard until only the Izukage remained, but in the end, she too fell while Konoha wasn't able to reach them in time, but that was only on paper. In the actual reports my mortal shell found, Konoha didn't know about the attack until after it occurred, which didn't make sense as the clan would have sent a messenger bird. My mortal shell suspected that it was intercepted or it did reach the village but was never delivered to the third Hokage. To my knowledge only Kashina, being in Konoha already, and Mito, since she was married to the first Hokage, were the only two survivors. When she heard this, she was devastated by the news. 
but to my shock and admiration she remained strong, stating that, even if our country is gone and our people wiped out, so long as there is one Uzumaki who carries our beliefs that the bond of family runs deeper than the village itself, then the clan can rebuild. Unlike Konoha, who preach about how you should give your life for the village, the Uzumaki believe that family and its people were what matters, not the village. I remember what she added, our home is where our heart is, it is not just some place, but where our bond is at its strongest. I know there are other Uzumaki still alive and that they are in hiding, because we're too stubborn to die. My admiration for her was beyond what words could ever explain and her strength to persevere was beyond what any hero or immortal could ever know. Truly she was a demi-goddess like no other. As I begin to reminisce the days I spent in my mortal self's memories, I stumbled upon the valley of end and, in the middle of it, was my son in a teen with a duck ass for a head, wait no, hairstyle. I quickly recognized the teen was an Uchiha due to the crest on the back of his shirt, which was torn due to those ugly hand-like wings on his back. I saw my son and the Uchiha clash, the latter was knocked back, I smirked to see how powerful my son has grown. I was about to leave until I saw something that made my blood boil and my wrath skyrocket. Kakashi, my old student, stabbed my son in the back, literally. I quickly made my way to my son and ripped my former student in half. Then I quickly check on my son's condition. Poison, I thought in horror. I pulled out some nectar and gently poured it into my son's mouth while helping him swallow it, since he was unconscious. I could see red energy forming around him. Kayubi, at least the fox was good for something, I thought. It seems the Kayubi was easing my son's pain. I couldn't understand why Kakashi would try to kill my son. Did he not know that Naruto is my and Kashina's son? I decided to peer into my son's memories, it wasn't part of my ability, but it wasn't something I couldn't do either, and what I saw made me want to level my mortal self's former village straight into Tartarus. The only reason why I didn't was because of the people who have helped my son, the people of the Red Light District and the people from Kashina and Naruto's, unsurprisingly, favorite ramen stand, Ichiraku Ramen. This world doesn't deserve my or Kashina's son. I couldn't agree more. I turned around, to my surprise, to see the goddess of the hearth, home, and family. Hestia, I'm surprised to see you here. When did you arrive and did you just agree with me? I asked. I arrived shortly after you did, though I am not surprised to see you here, and the reason I agree with you is because I deduced from your expression and through that mortal's actions, that my grandson had lived an unpleasant life, she said. I shared the memories I saw from Naruto with Hestia and her expression quickly darkened to anger and disgust. Those filthy mortals, she said in rage before turning around to, I assume, level the entire village. I put a stop to that though. Why are you stopping me? she asked. I narrowed my eyes and spoke in a calming tone, did you not see the people who have helped my son and your grandson? Leveling the village would harm them. Naruto here considers them his surrogate family and precious people. I pointed out which calmed her down. The goddess of hearth took a calming breath. Yes, you are correct. I wouldn't want my grandson to hate me for harming what he considers precious to his heart. Instead I shall place a curse to all those who have harmed him or have ill intent against my grandson. Their family shall be torn and their homes ruined and it shall be passed to their children and their children's children until none of them remain, and with a loud boom her curse was placed. With that said, both goddesses, with Naruto, left the elemental nations through a portal that would take them back to their own dimension. The skies over the elemental nations suddenly darkened. Not long after, it started to rain as if the skies were in tears. The world of Shinobi was never going to be the same again. Pav ends the day after Naruto was taken from his world found the blonde Jinchuriki resting on a soft bed. The sounds outside the windows seemed to wake the blonde. Slowly exposing his piercing cerulean blue eyes, Naruto bolted up and looked around. This place was not his apartment in Konoha. Well, to be frank, he camped in the forest of death, filled with ridiculously large animals and other creature. Strangely, they never once bothered the blonde, nor was it the small clinic in the red light district, since the nurses or doctors formed the Konoha hospital would either kick him out and not treat him for his injuries, or try to kill him. Looking around the apartment, which looked very expensive and high-end, he noticed a scroll addressed to him. My little maelstrom, I am sorry for what I did to you all those years ago, yes I am the fourth Hokage, but I am also your father, of sorts. My name as you know was Mina Namikaze, I understand and won't blame you if you hate me but know that I will always love you. 
Now, I and your grandmother have taken you away from Konoha, from the elemental countries even. You are in a nation called the United States, in a place called New York City. Though I am dead as Minato Namikaze, I am still alive, but thanks to a certain law I cannot truly be in your life. Don't worry though, we'll meet in time, that is, if you want to. When the time comes, I will be happy to see you, now, since you are still young, you have to go to school in this world in a school of your choosing. In the seal at the bottom of the scroll, you will find all that you need in this world such as books containing the history and language of the world, if you want to learn all the language and history that is, and also money. Oh, just for a reference for the future, read up on Greek mythology, you will need that info, trust me. Be safe my son and remember both your mother and I love you with all our heart. Mina Namikaze. Naruto was silent for a moment as he finished reading the letter from his technical father, but the blonde strangely didn't find it weird knowing that there is a certain jutsu that is able to recreate a male reproductive organ, he reads sue him, so it wasn't strange to him. For the first time in a long time, tears flowed down from his eyes, they weren't tears of sadness, but happiness. I do have a family, Naruto thought. The thought of it was a fantasy for him, to know that your parents didn't abandon you, that they were out there, and that they care. The feeling was too profound to explain, at least to him. Naruto took in some air to relax and calmed himself down. Well Kit, looks like you do have a family, but let's do away with that for now. Right now you have a lot of things to do in this new world. A deep voice inside his mind said. Naruto smirked. I know Kiyubi, first things first, get all this information into my head, and thanks to my cage bunch and jutsu I can work on that fast. I will also need to find a way to obtain more money, hopefully there are jobs for someone who can take on an army, he thought. And we'll be with you all the way Naruto-sama, a melodic feminine voice, also in his head, said. My sister is correct my lord, though I do hope this world is ready for someone like you, a demonic and bloodthirsty voice said in his head. Naruto smiled and began to laugh in glee. Well, Ma would not have brought me here if she didn't think it wasn't. I will miss my precious people in the leaf but this place is my new home now and I actually have a parent and relatives out here. It will take time but I can get used to this place, he said to the voices in his head. Naruto then walked out to the balcony of his new apartment and took in his surroundings and smiled. He then puffed out his chest and took in a deep breath before he said, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze has arrived a h a h a h a h a He shouted and laughed happily. In an undisclosed location, somewhere in a South American shipment port. Fox. This is Eagle Eye Confirm Radio Connection. Vixen This is Fox Radio Connection is Confirm, a voice belonging to one Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, who was currently wearing a black stealth nanofiber suite, designed for tactical stealth mission. Good, now I don't need to remind you how important this mission is, considering who our clients are. A feminine voice said over the earpiece radio. I know. As long as the intel they gave us is good. Then you have nothing to worry about, Naruto responded. He summoned three shadow clones and mentally ordered them to arm up. Naruto's weapon of choice was two silenced 5-7 pistols, a silenced ballista PSR with Nida dual band scope, some grenades, and a bow he affectionately named the Predator Bow. This bow has enough kinetic energy to stop a rhino dead with 20 regular carbon impact arrows. 10 electro shock arrow, when shot at an enemy, electrocutes, stuns them. 10 super thermite arrows, when shot at an enemy or wall or anything for that matter, stick and explode with some splash damage and 10 airburst fragmentation arrows that will explode upon impact and cause splash damage over a relatively large area. Are you guys prep and ready? Naruto asks his clones. All his clones nodded, all of them using the same weapon. A silenced Chikom CQB, 3 round burst, bullpup SMG, grenades, and a silenced TAC-45 pistol and wearing the same cloths the original was currently wearing, aside from the masks they wore. Good, get on the boat and let's move out, Naruto ordered. A and I like Call of Duty for its zombie mode and Crisis 3 for, well, the suite, who doesn't want to wear that nano suite, and multiplayer Xbox and P's player here. I still think it should have been the two of us working on this assignment, not that I don't enjoy a little group action, but I prefer if it is just the two of us. Naruto's partner complained. The blonde could practically see the pout on her face. Well, who better to entertain our guest than you? After all, 
who's best at handling and working crowds around her fingers like puppets? Naruto heard a scoff, then a hum. You're referring to our last mission in Baltimore. What was it again? Ah, the underground fight arena, yes. Well, what can I say? The crowd loves me, she said with a giggle, letting out a contented sigh at the end. Recalling the mission in Baltimore, Naruto rolled his eyes at her comment. It was to infiltrate the underground fight arena and search for an illegal drug smuggler known for orchestrating illegal underground fights, where kidnapped people are forced to fight for their lives in a fight to the death. Naruto posed as a fighter while his partner was the new announcer, since the last one had a tragic accident. The crowd loved her sunny personality. Well, more like sadistic personality. His partner was known in the business as a bloody sadist, whose reputation earned her titles like the Bloody Lady, Red Queen or the mad Vicento name a few. Remember Naruto, all personnel at the shipment port are to be treated as hostiles and confirm the cargo manifest as indeed illegal weapons. So basically, they don't know what is in the container only that it is valuable. Is this going to be another mission 32? Naruto asked, recalling one of their contracted missions, which sounded the same. The contents of the package was nothing more than diamonds, not smuggled weapons, the later it became their payment after their employer tried to kill them both. No, this won't be like that mission. The intel report says the cargo of value is to be bought on the market. It could be weapons, the air surveillance photo we got showed how much manpower they have protecting the cargo, was Naruto's partner's response, making the blonde sigh in slight frustration. Fine, but that secondary squad better not be late once the party starts. As good as I am, I can't handle all of the party guests. It's not that Naruto couldn't handle them on his own, but he was not about to underestimate these people. First rule of warfare and combat. Never underestimate your enemy, doing so could lead to your death. He's strong, that's for sure, but he wasn't dumb. He's smart and he is cautious, taking into account any and all possible scenarios in the mission. Don't worry Fox, the second squad is on standby and is ready to assist, in case things go to hell. Besides, I personally know from experience that you don't disappoint, was her reply. She added a bit of huskiness to her voice, but Naruto knew she was just teasing. Well, your confidence in me, helps me relieve some stress, Naruto shot back, eliciting a giggle of amusement from his partner, before turning his attention to his clones just as they arrived at the south end of the port. Alright, I'll provide watch on top of that crane, while three of you split up in three different directions. The cargo is marked on our hub, and remember, all personnel are to be considered hostile. Naruto stated getting a nod from his clones. Good, let's move out. Naruto quickly climbed, well, more like walked up to the top of the crane and used his chakra to balance himself on top, as to not fall to the ground. He wasn't concerned about falling, Naruto just didn't want to be distracted when aiming. It allowed him to have steady aim on a high and ridged position. NC1 you have two hostiles coming your way, observing, hold position, Naruto said through the mental link he and his clones shared. Naruto watched, through the night enhanced scope, two hostiles packing a Scorpion Evo SMG. Looks like the two of them are separating. Pick your target and I'll take out the other. Naruto watched as his clone went for the second hostile wearing a red jacket, which left him with the first hostile wearing a black jacket. Naruto steadied his breathing and controlled his heart rate. Compensating for gravity and taking into account the wind speed, Naruto fired, hitting the hostile right in the head and his clone took the second guy out by snapping his neck. North Carolina 1, you're close to two of the target containers, confirm cargo, Naruto ordered. The Naruto clone found a cargo container and broke the lock. Boss, looks like the intel is spot on. I found a UAV attack drone. Checking the second container now, the clone said. Vixen. This is Fox, the first container contains a UAV attack drone, checking the second container. There was a bit of silence for a few seconds. Acknowledged, keep me updated. See, told you there was nothing to worry about. Naruto was about to respond until, boss second cargo contains the drone's missile ordnance. The blonde stopped and frowned. Vixen, the second contains the UVA's missiles, placing a tag. I placed the tag have the secondary team ready so they can. Sorry my foxy friend but no, that area has been designated a dead zone, destroy the weapons, meaning feel free to blow it all up, his partner said with glee in her voice, cutting him off. NC1, 
place the explosion tags on both the UAV and the missiles. The clone did so and planted the explosion seal tags on both weapons. Naruto then turned his attention back to his other clones. Boss, I'm inside the warehouse shipment office and I found several backlisted shipment orders, advise, his second clone said. Hum, the warehouse is near the primary cargo. North Carolina too you have permission, but make it quick, Naruto said before turning to the last clone, who took out another hostel with his gun. The blonde saw three hostels heading towards his third clone. North Carolina 3, three hostels are heading your way, hide the body and prepare to take them. The clone hid the body while the original lined up his shot. Naruto followed one of the guards. From what he observed, it looked like the guy was about to take a piss. Last one you'll ever take, the blonde thought when he fired. The two guards heard the thud and turned around. Their shocked state was all that the clone needed to kill them. North Carolina 3, check the cargo now while you're still clear. As Naruto said that, another hostel turned up around a corner. Shit. Naruto cursed and had no other choice but to fire, missing the target. The bullet hit one of the cargo containers, alerting the clone. The clone turned around and quickly fired. That was close boss. Naruto agreed and shook his head. The blonde didn't like using guns and preferred to use his blades or his bow. Though his partner would beg to differ, but Naruto's argument with her is you don't need to reload and give your enemy time to kill you or delay yourself in battle, and you couldn't reuse bullets and you worry about how many magazines you have left. Naruto's partner would be stubborn about it and the blonde dropped it. Arguing with the opposite sex was far too troublesome and a headache, though he could see the logic and the use of using guns, though it wasn't his cup of tea. North Carolina 3, report on your findings. Naruto didn't receive a response. There was a moment of pause, making the blonde narrow his eyes at the lack of a response. North Carolina 3, report, Naruto pressed. NC3 Pav the boss gave the signal to move out, and we split in three other directions while boss took the elevated position to provide cover fire. I took to the right side while my fellow clone, NC1, took to the left and NC2 took to the middle, heading towards the warehouse. This wasn't the first time the boss made use of his clones, usually it was him and her his handler and partner for missions or contracts. During the first three weeks the boss stayed in New York, he was trying to find a job. He found some here and there but it didn't sweet his lifestyle or his profession, it felt like another endless d rank mission. Though there was one mission he didn't complain about, it was when the boss took a job as a delivery boy. The boss made use of his skills, in this word it is called parkour, to deliver packages or, on occasion, food. One delivery I recall was in this high-class looking apartment to a woman the boss felt lost for words for. She had long black hair with silver tips, brilliant green eyes, and a smile that gives the word radiant meaning. But what the boss noted most of all was her warm, comforting personality and her wise traits that the boss had never seen or felt before. Another thing the boss noted was her motherly aura, something the boss yearned for and it simply made him feel like a child who looked lost and wanted his mother to hold him along with a sense of familiarity towards her. And it seems the woman sensed this in the boss. She invited him in and had a talk with the boss, the next thing the boss knew he was telling her about his past, how he was kicked out of the orphanage, how the people would hurt him, but he didn't tell her about him being a shinobi since he didn't want her to think he was crazy. The walls he built around himself simply crumbled beneath her warm aura. The next thing the boss knew he was being hugged and words of comfort were being whispered into his ear. It felt so alien to him, being hugged like this, and it made the boss think. Was this what it is like to have a mother? Was this the warmth only a mother could provide? He didn't know because he was in tears as she told him to let those built up emotions go. Since then, every now and then, the blonde would visit the kind woman, Rhea, and the boss would honestly drop the mask he wore and be himself, or rather, be someone he didn't think he could. Someone normal, someone who didn't have to worry about the world around him. He could be childish, smile a true smile and laugh happily. Currently there are only two people in this world that Naruto would not wear his mask around and simply relaxed with, Rhea and his partner. Ah yes, the boss's partner. She had some weird energy in her. Almost like Chakra, though at the same time it wasn't. The boss first met her while he was looking for something more suited for his skills as a trained soldier or a living weapon he had been getting restless. It wasn't until he overheard some people arguing. What caught boss's attention was that the guys were complaining about how difficult the mission was that the woman had picked for them. Long story short, 
the guys quit and the boss had a talk with his new handler and partner. The best way to describe their line of work was that both she and the boss are mercenaries. But, unlike mercenaries, they aren't hired. No, they take missions, called contracts, from a guild. The boss could easily compare the contracts to the missions of Konoha. Unlike Konoha, they choose the contracts and, at most, the boss's partner would pick the high-level missions. If, say, there was a way of comparing the level of difficulty of the mission, it could be compared to the levels of missions back in the elemental nations. S rank being the highest and D rank being the lowest. The missions the boss's partner would pick are A rank or close to S rank. It was eight months into the job when a certain incident forced Naruto to reveal his abilities, mission 32. Again, long story short, she wanted to know just how and what could cause a massive wall to suddenly shoot up out of the ground and block a hail of bullets, then how could said wall create spears to impale their former employer. The boss admitted it, since by now he had come to trust her. This was also the first time the boss used any sort of jutsu in this dimension. Boss didn't see the need to use any jutsu against people of this dimension or on missions. That and he didn't want to attract unwanted attention. Besides, he could still use his other skills or the ones he had learned to accomplish missions without the need to use jutsu or chakra. After that event, the boss's partner took up more and more dangerous missions. Currently, the mission was search and destroy. As I mused on that, I saw two guards taking a smoke break. I quickly disposed of the two guards and quickly made my way to one of the cargo containers where another guard was sitting down reading a porn magazine. Well, I hope he liked what he saw, because it was the last thing he'll ever see before I put him down. I then heard the boss say three guards were heading my way and ordered me to hide the body. I quickly did so and waited. I didn't have to wait long as one of the guards separated from the other two. Not long after that there was a subtle thud, alerting the two guards. I capitalized on their shock and quickly fired, killing off both guards. I got out of my hiding spot when all of a sudden, I heard a metal clang behind me. I turned around to see another guard and fired, hitting the guy in the chest area. I joked with the boss on how close the encounter was. I heard him grumble, agreeing with my statement. He then ordered me to check the cargo container. I found said cargo and opened it up and what I found almost made me dispel from disgust. Normal Pav, boss. Oh damn it, the clone sounded disgusted, understandable since his clones would sometimes develop their own emotions or personalities. Most of the time it was his masks that would be usual personas. Boss, this cargo container, it doesn't have weapons but, the clone paused yet again. What is it then? Bodies, dead female bodies. Their organs have been removed and they have been raped, judging from the fluids coming out of their vaginal areas but I don't know if it's before their organs were removed or after, boss. Naruto was silent. His eyes were overshadowed by his bangs. Memories of a certain mission back in the elemental nations came flooding back to his mind and the blonde had to bite down on his lips, drawing blood, to calm himself down. Vixen, this is Fox. The third container does not contain weapons, but the remains of unknown females. All their organs harvested and raped. From what my subordinate told me, He's not sure if it's before or after their organs were harvested. Naruto said, his voice sounding a bit on edge. Wah, what, Naruto's partner sounded dumbfounded at what she had heard. You heard me. Ask our employer if they knew about it, Naruto all but shouted. He quickly realized his emotions were rising up. The blonde took in some air and pushed those memories of that particular event back, he couldn't afford to let his emotions go wild now. Fox. Our employer didn't have prior knowledge of this, but they suspected those bodies belonged to a number of women who have gone missing over the past month. Place a tag on the cargo. A retrieval team is being prepared to retrieve the bodies. At least the families of these unfortunate women would have some closure. North Carolina 3, place a marker on the cargo containing bodies and any others you can find. NC2, report on your findings. Naruto ordered his third clone before turning his attention to his second clone. NC2 Pav Once I was separated from the boss and my fellow clones, I headed straight for the warehouse. I treaded carefully and avoided the cameras. At least they have some sort of security. I got on top of one of the containers and saw two guards patrolling the area and another two guarding the entrance. I observed and timed their movements, awaiting the perfect time to make my move. 20 seconds, that was my time frame. I quickly threw a screw to attract one of the guards' attention, but to my slight surprise and delight, 
Both of them decided to check what the noise was. Once they were behind the container I fired, killing them both. I saw the two patrolling guards making their way back to the warehouse entrance. I could see both of them looking around, trying to figure out where the other two had gone. Once they stared back at each other I dropped the first guy and then used the momentary shock to kill the last guy before entering the warehouse. I could sense there was only a single guard in the warehouse, making me think how lax the security is. It must have been because they were confident that no one knew about their operation and so forth. But if there is something true about this life it's that secrets have a way of revealing themselves. One way or another you can't keep a secret forever and if you could, congrats, but it would always cost something to keep such a secret, well, secret. Silently, I made my way to the office, mindful to avoid any cameras or other sensors and I soon reached my destination. I saw the guard looking over some sheets of paper extensively. Curious, I slowly crept up behind him and snapped his neck. I checked to see the contents of the paper and found delivery orders that were blacklisted and were to be sent to a private owner. I informed the boss and asked if I should check on the contents of the cargo, there was a bit of silence before I received permission, so long as I make it quick. I checked the first and closest blacklisted cargo's contents. I was shocked and about to call the boss, but he called in and sounded very agitated. Normal Pav, boss I was about to contact you. The cargo that was blacklisted, there are women in here. From what they told me, the women they capture are to be sold off in auctions and the unlucky few, their organs are to be harvested. Boss, some of these women are traumatized and some if not all of them were raped, the clone said. Naruto sighed in a bit of relief. At least there were some who are still alive. Vixen, my subordinate found those other missing women and they are alive. Have our employer prepare a medical team, Naruto said. Fox, a medical team is being prepared, now continue, wait. Incoming reports from the second team say a chopper is coming in. Indeed Naruto could hear the sounds of a helicopter heading for the west side of the port. The blonde then unsealed a camera designed to take long-range shots. The helicopter landed and a man stepped out along with five bodyguards. The man had tan skin, black eyes and brown hair and was wearing a dark blue shirt and cargo pants. Over it was mesh body armor. Taking photos now, sending, Naruto said taking the photos of the man before he sent it back to his partner for profiling. Fox, the person's name is Alexander Amir. Wanted on multiple accounts of trafficking, extortion, selling illegal weapons, and is known to have connections to a known terrorist organization. The mission objective has changed. Capture Amir for interrogation, use any means to capture the target. Disclaimer anyone with this name, this is purely coincidental. Naruto stood up and lowered the level of the restriction seals he placed around his body. He did this for two reasons. One was for training and the second, he knew he could rely too much on his chakra and become too dependent on it. His eyes were closed and he had already conveyed a mental order to his clones. Naruto switched from his sniper rifle to his bow and jumped down, channeling his chakra to the lower part of his body. He used this often back in Konoha when he stood on the Hokage Monument, which could be compared to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, which Naruto guessed was about the same height as the Hokage Monument. The blonde Jinchuriki opened his eyes, revealing not his piercing cerulean blue eyes, but a pair of cold crimson red slitted eyes. He wore an unreadable expression, almost void of any emotion, almost. The only emotion spotted was that of pure bloodlust, anger, and pain. The two former emotions were understandable. But the latter was something from his past, something that still pained him to no end. It was a pain that couldn't be healed or even ignored. I hate that memory. But I can't dwell on the past now. Right now, it's time to hunt, the blonde thought before ninja running towards his prey. Naruto leapt from one cargo container to the other, while his bow was at the ready. There. The former elemental nation's shinobi spotted one guard and fired an arrow with the medium drawn weight. The guard turned around just in time to be impaled in the head by the arrow. The blonde retrieved the arrow and maneuvered from one container to another. He spotted two guards near the fence. Jumping down, he took down the first guy, before kneeing the second guy in the face, causing the back of his head to hit the metal fence. NC1, is the trap set? Naruto asked as he leapt over the fence, making his way towards his target. The blonde Jinchuriki counted at least 30 enemies, including the designated target and his bodyguards. The trap is set boss, me and NC3 are waiting on you, the clone answered. 
Vixen, tell the second team that the party is about to start. Make sure they have their party suites on. They are all set and ready, waiting on you Fox. Oh, and give them hell for me will you, love? Naruto allowed a smirk, albeit a sadistic smirk, to grace his lips. Sure. Naruto saw one of his clones. He handed the clone the sniper rifle, while he made his way to the target. The blonde gave the clone the signal and, not a second later, a loud explosion was heard, followed by another, even louder, explosion, sending a shockwave. Normally this would dispel Naruto's clone had the blonde shinobi not reinforced them with a lot more chakra. The second team entered from the front gate and Naruto's clones provided some cover fire. A firefight was raging on and the blonde was using the fight as a distraction to slip past the enemy line to capture the target. Naruto stopped when he saw Alexander making his way to the chopper. Oh no you don't you. Naruto switched his normal arrow to an airburst fragmentation arrow and shot the pilot. The helicopter exploded, not a Hollywood movie explosion, but an explosion nonetheless. Alexander was thrown back slightly and shouted to get him out of there. He got in a black Hummer SUV that he probably got from one of the cargo containers and drove off. Naruto sprinted to cut him off before Alexander could escape. Jumping from platform to platform, container to container, Naruto's movements never wavered. He moved with such grace and speed that you would only see a yellow blur. Alexander saw a blonde with a bow standing between him and his freedom and ordered his guards to run him down, like that deer he killed. Naruto drew back his bow with a strong drawn weight for high damage and long range, though the downside was its drawing time. The arrow pierced the air as it flew towards its target, and the unlucky individual was the driver. The car swerved out of control, causing it to flip over. Naruto simply side-stepped and the SUV crashed. The blonde switched to his pistol and fired at the guards who were attempting to get out of the downed SUV. Seeing Alexander limping away, Naruto fired at his legs, causing the man to scream out in pain. It's over Alexander, time for you to answer for your crimes. That was the lasting thing Alexander heard before he felt something hit the side of his head, knocking him out. Naruto carried Alexander's body over his left shoulder and made his way back to the waiting soldiers. One of the soldiers saw a blonde with a body over his shoulder and alerted the others. That must be him, the one the CIA hired, one of them said. They stood in attention and flinched when they saw Naruto's cold, expressionless face. Here's your trash, the blonde said in a monotone voice, before he harshly dropped the body of Alexander. Boss, these women, they need medical attention quickly, one of his clones called out. Instantly, Naruto softened his gaze and turned around to the group of women who looked scared, hurt, and traumatized. Naruto slowly walked towards them and noticed them flinch in fear. He knew why. It's all right, we are not going to hurt any of you. A medical team is on its way to treat your injuries and ailment. Afterwards, we are going to return you to your loved ones, he said with a soothing voice, which seemed to work. Naruto heard a choir of sighs and saw them smile. For them, the nightmare is over. Naruto arrived at the hotel he and his partner were staying in for the evening, before heading back to New York City. The time was around midnight and the moon was at its fullest, normally this would lighten Naruto's mood as it always did in the past. But this was not the case, having been reminded of that particular day, his mood was especially sour. He hated remembering that day, or rather that mission back in the elemental nations, though it did give him a chance to meet someone who he later fell in love with. Surprising since the blonde-haired teen's outlook on love is severely lacking. He didn't know what love is, so he could only describe the feelings as an intense feeling that arose from the sea of his being. It was something unknown to him and it would always plague him, till he read a book regarding love. So he could say he was in love, but at the same time he couldn't say he was only in love with just her. There was another person that held a string to his heart, someone who suffered similar to his past treatment, in his mind, and according to the book he read, he could love more than one person and could be in a relationship with them. But it was to be their choice, not his, and if he were to add then they would have to approve. Oh and the book was on polygamy. Naruto truly cared about both of them, beyond the similarities of their past experience of being alone and hated for something beyond their control. It was their attitude, their character, and simply being themselves that attracted Naruto to these two women. He felt strong connections to them, though as not two anymore. He also felt lingering feelings for his partner and, unbeknownst to him, his partner had similar feelings, if not much stronger. Again, 
Naruto lived a life full of hate and grew up with prostitutes, criminals, and people who, like him, were undesirable by society, so his outlook and denseness came with good reason. Walking up to the room Naruto, unlocked the door with his key and stepped inside, he was greeted by a sight that would make any pervert or crude male blush with a nosebleed from the sheer sexiness of it all. Welcome back, my cute little fox, spoke a woman, sounding as seductive as ever. This was none other than Naruto's partner, who just got out of the shower. Water dripping down her creamy white skin with only a small towel covering her lower body and another towel simply draped over her rather large F cup. Her teal green eyes held a glint of mischief as she slowly turned around, showing Naruto her round plump posterior while she dried her dark brown hair. If Naruto was any lesser man, then he would have jumped her right then and there, but his partner knew that. Naruto would never press on something unless she allowed it, which was why she was comfortable being around him naked. Well, maybe it was the fact that he grew up in a brothel, he wasn't unfamiliar with seeing naked women. He didn't feel anything about seeing a naked, sexy, and beautiful woman in all her glory. At first she felt dejected, as she thought Naruto thought of her in the norm. It wasn't until she caught Naruto looking at her one time. The brown-haired beauty noticed that it was less lustful and more appreciative, like she was a piece of fine art. She later found that her partner appreciated her, not just because of her beauty. He liked her simply for being her and because she wouldn't change to the wants or expectations of society. Moxie, good evening, Naruto greeted with a tiredly with a slight emotional edge, which Moxie caught. The blonde removed his clothing, leaving him in only his boxers and laid down on the bed that he and Moxie shared. Madeline Mox, or Mad Moxie, could be summed up with a few words, sadistic, alluring, dangerous, and lustful. Well, only towards a certain blonde. She enjoys violence and combat, being skilled with hand-to-hand -hand combat and weaponry. She taught Naruto how to handle and use a gun after all. Modesty has little to nothing do with Moxie, but she is very refined with her tastes, mannerisms and attitude. Despite her violent tastes, she is also friendly and rather compassionate when fighting is not involved, though only Naruto has ever seen this caring side of her. Most people only see the bloody queen people associate her with. Naruto, tell me, what's wrong? Naruto had to blink once to make sure he wasn't seeing things. Moxie was surprisingly on top of him and he hadn't even noticed her move. Sighing slightly, Naruto arched into a sitting position, leaning on the headboard. The mission just brought up some, unpleasant memories from my old world, he said, dropping his psychological mask. Not many people get to see Naruto without his mask, it was either the goofy, energetic, brash, and spontaneous mask or it was his cold, tactical, calm, and overall emotionless mask. Since coming to this world, Naruto normally wore the latter. Naruto made these masks to cope with the harsh treatment in Konoha. He hid his damaged emotional state as well as the despair he felt growing up. For all his strength, all his power, Naruto was still that scared, miserable, and pained child who just wanted to be accepted as someone other than a plague, an abomination, a monster. Moxie wrapped her arms around Naruto's neck and laid his head on her, in a warm and comforting embrace. She knew about her partner's past and she saw the scars around his, otherwise, flawless body. Moxie couldn't fathom the sheer stupidity or her disgust of the people from her Naruto's former village. She would have loved nothing more than to butcher, maim, torture, and kill those people in the most heinous ways possible. This was also the reason why Moxie greatly admired Naruto. The things he endured would have driven anyone insane and made them hateful towards the world. But he pushed through it, coming out as this strong, kind, and caring individual that Moxie had come to know and care for but she knew he was still damaged and the wounds were still there, the quote, time heals all wounds, could not be associated with Naruto's, and the scars only prove that. Moxie felt a familiar warm, wet droplet of tears going down on her, causing her to bring him closer to her, whispering comforting words to him. It was a minute in when she noticed Naruto had stopped crying, now asleep. Sleep well, my little fox, she thought as she lay next to him. Inside Naruto Mindscape Naruto opened his eyes and found himself in a familiar place, his Mindscape. In front of him were large golden bars and red crimson eyes staring back at him. Kayubi, Naruto greeted as he slowly stood up and looked to his surroundings, as if he was looking for something, or rather someone. Come out you two, he said, ordered. Out from the shadows of his Mindscape, two individuals came out. 
The first was a beautiful woman, with long braided blonde hair with a blue bow, pale white skin, and a white cloth covering her DD cup under a semi transparent sheet. She also wore a semi transparent miniskirt over her white panties, a white cloth over her feet, a cloth on her left arm, and a gold bracelet on her right wrist. On her head, she wore gold and a glass helmet with a four wing design and a diamond. She also had two long sparkling wings on her back. The second individual was a living inferno of a being with metallic feet, shin guards, armor, gauntlets, and metallic skull heads. Unlike the woman, who radiated warmth and love, this being was pure malice incarnate, simply screaming, bloodlust personified. Elysium, Inferno. Naruto greeted the two sentient spirits, who kneeled in response, making the blonde slightly groan at their habit. He had told them there was no need for them to do such formal things, him hating formal things like kneeling or referring to him as Sama or Lord being an example though, by now, Naruto had gotten used to them doing such things. Naruto Sama, we have sensed your emotional distress. What can we do to help? Elysium asked, ever faithful as the day Naruto found both their sword forms. It's nothing, Elysium. The mission brought up unwanted memories from my past, but let us do away with that. Right now, I need to further progress with my training, especially for that, Naruto said. The three beings inside his head perked up at this. So, you have yet to master that, yet you want to add mastering my chakra into the mix. Not that I care what happens to you, but if you die, I die, and I don't want to reform in this place, Kayubi said. Naruto turned around to address the nine tailed beast. I know Kurumi, and would you turn to your human or semi human form, Naruto said. In an instant, the Kayubi vanished and was replaced with a woman with long flowing red orange hair reaching down to her perky butt, G size, caramel skin, a perfect hourglass figure, three defined whiskers on both sides of her face red slitted eyes, fox ears, and nine flowing tails. She wore a blood red form fitted kimono with a black flowering design, modified to reach down to her upper knees and loose, giving a view of her, and a neck choker with the kanji, seal, around her neck. My, my so much stress Naru-kun, should I assume you requested me to change to my human form to relive it? Then by all means, come inside my cage and let me do so, Kayubi purred. But then she found herself bound in chains wrapping around her body in the most erotic way possible. I have no time for such games, Kayubi. I am already angered as it is, I don't need, nor want, your antics to further such. Naruto emphasized by tightening the chains around Kurumi's body, making her grunt in slight pain and pleasure. With a snap of the fingers, the chains vanished. So aggressive, though I do love aggression, Cuckoo, Kayubi said, giggling at the last part but stopped when she heard a growl of annoyance from her jinchuriki. Fine, fine change this place so we may begin. With another snap, Naruto's mindscape changed from the deceptive sewer to the luscious forest of training ground 44, otherwise known as the forest of death, Naruto's regular training place and where he spent the vast majority of his life in. The forest of death is considered in Konoha to be a danger zone because of the large creatures, such as animals, insect, and monstrosities that call this place their home. That is why it was sealed off from the population, even during the Chunin exams, where this place was used to hold the second part of the exam. A section of the forest was used for this particular event. Naruto on the other hand called this place his actual home, his second home being Lilith's main brothel house. None of the residents of the forest ever bothered him and the blonde assumed it was because of Kurumi or something else, either way it made a great place to train in secret. Now, let us begin, shall we? Naruto said, summoning two dual connecting sides, while both Elysium and Inferno summoned their sword forms. Inferno's sword was crystalline in structure with a crimson hue, but with a trace of black and, from what Naruto could tell, flesh in the interior. The blade itself was small and slim, a wing shaped handguard and a skill like form in the middle with an eye situated just above it. Elysium's sword was sleek in appearance with a crystalline, ice like design. A handguard that resembled a feminine face with a blue crystal, situated just above it, and as slim as the inferno's blade. From what Naruto could see from the blade itself, it had some kind of symbols that he couldn't distinguish or even read. Inferno was first to charge in. Naruto, anticipating this, jumped back. Both sentient spirits had a rather unique ability to them. Inferno's ability grants its user incredible strength to give an edge, in some cases, it can penetrate through defenses as well. 
shipping away health. The only drawback is the parasitic ability that drains the user's health, which was why the user would have to adapt to an almost offensive style. But with Elysium, whose ability can regenerate her user's health at the same rate as Inferno's ability to drain health along with boosting a grand amount of physical strength, meaning the user's stamina. While she may not be as powerful in terms of attack power, she is still as effective as her brother, since the two balance each other for their wielder. That is why Naruto distanced himself from Inferno. Naruto could not afford to clash with him at close range, opting for long range. Channeling his chakra into both his sides, Naruto sent several, dark blue, crescent shapewaves, which Inferno blocked with his sword, before getting kicked back by his wielder. Naruto then quickly dodged an attack from Elysium. The blonde knew any attack against Elysium would all be ineffective because of her defensive capability and Naruto had to clash with her with more powerful attacks, which was contradicting to his normal style, but he had learned to adapt. Connecting his scythes together, the blonde clashed blades with his fellow blonde, causing her to grunt a bit at the force of the attack. She jumped backwards when she noticed her wielder disconnecting his sides. That was the advantage of dual connecting sides. Even if the opponent blocked the first one, the second was sure to follow and her wielder had mastered how to use this weapon to its full potential, she wasn't surprised when both her and her brother's sword forms were changed to fit his combat style. Both their appearances are similar to each other save the color, Inferno's being crimson red and Elysium's crystal blue their respective facial appearance on the guard or heel of the side and their distinct features. Naruto dodged as a crimson wave came seconds from harming him. The blonde blocked Inferno's next attack. His left eye twitched when he felt his strength being drained. Using the force of the attack, Naruto leaned back, changing his center of gravity, then side-stepped to the left, causing Inferno to lose his footing and stumble forward. Inferno felt the cold unforgiving steel of his lord's side signaling that he had already lost. The blonde was slightly surprised when he saw Elysium. Time slowed down. Seeing her blade descend, Naruto reversed his grip on his side and struck Elysium's sword hard at its guard, causing her to lose her grip on the sword, which flew into the air. She too felt her wielder's blade on her neck, signaling that she had lost. It seems we have lost brother, it would seem so sister. They both said as Naruto removed his scythe from their neck, by slicing their heads off, in one motion Naruto spun around with his scythe close to their necks, Elysium's head fell to the ground, while Inferno's blood gushed out from his neck. Their bodies fell down with a thud and their blood flowed like a river. Naruto panted before ordering, reform. There was a bright light and the two sentient beings were back, healthy and alive. Both of them won't die or fade away since they're not part of the natural order of things. Harsh as ever, my lord. Inferno commented with a bloodthirsty grin. It's combat, if I gave my opponent a chance to surrender they would have a chance to kill me, he said logically. Inferno boomed in laughter. Only in combat, only in the battlefield will he ever see such a harsh side of his master. I suppose so my lord, he said. Naruto sent an apologetic look to Elysium, who raised a hand. I understand my lord and it matters not to me. So no need to apologize, though I appreciate the gesture, she said, seeing the kind part of her master. That was very entertaining Naru-kun, Kayubi said with an amused voice and a smile that clearly said she was turned on by Naruto's display. How long till you regain your yin side, Naruto asked, referring to the yin side that his technical father sealed within her body, which Naruto retrieved from the corpse. It shouldn't be long now before my yin side is fully restored and we can finally start with you mastering my chakra. Give it a month or so, she informed. Naruto nodded and sat down. You know, I could still help you relieve stress, Kurumi said seductively, wrapping her arms around Naruto's neck, her nine tails around his body, with her soft yet firm pushing up against his back. It wouldn't be the first time and I don't need to mess with your emotions to do so, she said as she turned his head to face her and kissed him passionately. Naruto and Kurumi have a strange kind of relationship. They would have sex, but they weren't a couple or even friends. It was either him or Kayubi that initiated, Kurumi more so than Naruto. So Naruto was confused, or rather he was dense. Kurumi had developed feelings for the blonde as he grew up. At first, she denied or shot down such thoughts, him being her jailer and all. But as time passed she slowly came to realize that her feelings for Naruto and knew she couldn't deny it. Her instincts roared at her, telling her that he is her destined mate. 
she desired all of it his darkness his warmth his coldness that ever-present determination and that sheer aura of dominance everything screamed perfect mate in her opinion or rather her instincts like a moth to fire kurumi felt drawn towards him and knew she couldn't get away kurumi could go on and on about what she loved about naruto like his determination his strength that unwavering will to push forward even when everything around him wants him dead naruto didn't stop and pushed through with perseverance without souping to his darkness on the contrary he accepted it and used it to fuel his want to become strong and the result was the person she was currently kissing oh naruto if you weren't so dense you would know how much i love you like that partner of yours or even those two women you came to care for after all who knows you better than i do she thought she when she felt naruto's hand caressing one of her tails it should also be noted that naruto didn't blame her for the death of his parents even when he knew who the cause of it was he still didn't blame her the phrase he used could be similar to you don't blame the gun for the person who fired it but now he is in this world naruto was forced to let go of revenge which was difficult since it was part of the reason he trained to the point of death now he is looking for a new goal and kayubi hoped he would find one behind the two elysium glared at kayubi for such provocation and perverse actions inferno on the other hand was watching with popcorn and soda that he found somewhere this should be good what was the current record ah 16 hours of non-stop rutting like bunnies in heat and that was the first round he thought naruto broke off the kiss much to kayubi and inferno's disappointment with the latter much more vocal getting a smack from his sister and the former inwardly groaning in displeasure i'm too tired kurumi mentally and spiritually some other time i promise he said giving her a reassuring smile one of the things lilith taught him aside from how to please a woman was that a gentleman doesn't leave a woman displeased or unsatisfied, but Naruto was too tired and his emotions had yet to calm down. Fine, next time I expect you to be an animal, Kayubi said with a slight huff, though she understood why. Naruto felt his consciousness leaving his mindscape. Knowing he was about to leave, he gave Kurumi a breathless kiss, making her shudder in delight. Before she could return the gesture, Naruto vanished. You know, there are other ways for cheering someone up. Kayubi, Elysium said still maintaining her cold glare. The nine-tailed fox merely waved her off with her right hand in a shooing motion. I know, you virgin prude, but it would be less pleasurable and more boring. Besides, do you honestly expect me to know how to deal with human emotion, well half-human, but that is beside the point, and can you really blame me? After all I am a yukai, or am I an inari, and by the species that the sage made me from, I am a lustful being, she said with no shame though she knew other ways of cheering Naruto up, she knew and would argue that sex would be much more effective. Inferno sighed as he tried to cover his ears as the two women began to argue and hoped that they would stop soon, which he knew they wouldn't. Women are troublesome that way in his opinion. Outside of Naruto's mindscape Naruto woke up and expected weight on his chest. Instead, he found himself looking up at the ceiling of his apartment in New York. My clone must have summoned me. Better email Moxie, Naruto thought before proceeding to do just that. The seal Naruto developed was based off of the summoning scroll and intensive research on summoning in general while he was back in the elemental nations. After countless experiments, some ending in failure and causing extensive damage to the test subject he used, which were either his clone or fruit, he was finally able to recreate the way to summon similar to summoning an animal from a summoning scroll. He cleaned himself up since today was his school's field trip to a museum. As he went into the bathroom, his phone rang. Sighing a bit, Naruto answered the phone, knowing full well who was at the other line. Morning Naruto. I got your message, though I'm slightly irked that my morning pillow and the warmth it provides was missing. I'll let it slide as soon as you use that technique, the mistress of blood said, referring to his jutsu. Can I do it after I shower? Oh, that's even better. Hurry up and use that technique of yours so I can join you. Sighing again, Naruto didn't have the energy or the will to argue with her. Left with no other option, Naruto reverse summoned his partner. Hopefully she remembered to bring her bags this time, the blonde thought, recalling the first time he used this technique with her. There was a familiar poof sound and the smoke cleared, revealing Moxie, naked as the day she was born with her numerous luggage behind her. Well, shall we? my cute little fox she chirped 
grabbing Naruto by the wrist and dragging him to the bathroom. Moxie, no sex, and don't give me that look. I have a trip to go on. Again, don't give me that look. We'll have sex later, okay? Naruto's voice echoed through the room. Moxie, that is not my back. Well, your log doesn't seem to mind. Ugh, why do I put up with you again? Many reasons, my cute little fox. One of them is sex. Second is that I'm your handler, and third, well, sex. Your honesty soothes my heart. I'm getting in the tub. Oh, it's warm. Just the way I like it. Inside the bathroom, both Naruto and Moxie relaxed in the bathtub, with Moxie on top of Naruto and said blonde's arms around her in private area. Now ain't this relaxing, though I digress, we could do a more effective form of stress relief, she said, while shaking her hips slightly on Naruto's tool. The blonde chuckled slightly and shook his head. His partner was annoying sometimes but he knew she meant well. Yeah that would be nice, but my mood is still sour mox, he said, looking up with a rather solemn look. I took note of the mission and noticed that there is a similarity between this mission and one of the missions you told me from your world. I'm guessing it is that mission that involved her correct. Moxie's answer came with an affirmative nod from her blonde partner and love interest. The brown-haired beauty knew how much it stung the blonde and how painful it was for him. Moxie turned her body around and wrapped her arms around Naruto's neck and brought him close into a hug. It wasn't your fault Naruto and you know she wouldn't want you to grieve like this. She would have wanted you to move on, she said softly. Naruto nodded into her. Yeah you're right. She's that kind of person. I just wish I could have done more. No, I know I could, but I was too. No I can't even say that Sai thank you Moxie, he simply said, though Naruto's companion knew he was still hurting and it would take time for him to get over his funk. Until then, she would remain by his side. Anytime love, anytime. After a while, the two got out of the bathroom and got dressed. Naruto was wearing a black long-sleeved polo, jeans, and converse shoes. Moxie wore a black corset overlapped by a leather jacket, leather jeans and thigh-high boots, which were modified with a hidden blade. You sure you want to go with me, it might get boring, Naruto said, since visiting a museum wasn't what Moxie would normally like to do or even consider doing. Moxie responded by playfully poking Naruto's forehead. I am, besides, like you, I have this curiosity about Greek history, she said wrapping her arms around Naruto's right arm as they left the building and got in Naruto's Bentley GTC convertible. It's a good thing that there is no traffic today, cause traffic in New York, damn. So tell me about this school of yours. Not much to tell really, Yancey Academy is a simple private boarding school teaching subjects such as pre-algebra, English, and Latin. Most of the students are troubled kids, like this one kid I know, Perkins, no Wade Peter, no him, ah Percy. Yes that's his name. It seems he has the same symptoms that we have. You mean dyslexic and ADHD? Yes, though I do feel some weird energy similar to yours but very different in his friend, um Gordon, no Gabby maybe, Grover that's his name, though he smells of goat and Percy smells like the ocean. Oh and what do I smell like? Fresh rosemary and honey. How accurate, two lust foods, fufu. Naruto chuckled. It's true though. From what the blonde knew about food, those two were considered part of the twelve lust foods and he found it odd that his partner has this scent on her. Well anyways, not all students are troubled kids. Some students are from well-off, rich families, meaning most of them are spoiled brats, he said turning the next corner and seeing the school bus. The students and the two teachers stopped whatever they were doing and saw the school's student council president and head disciplinary committee car park. All the female population blushed at the sight of Naruto and the males also blushed when they saw Moxie, especially the cloths she wore. Naruto scanned his surroundings and his eyes landed on a certain wheelchaired teacher. Hmm, a concealment technique, Naruto thought, recalling how suspiciously Mr. Brunner came to be employed at the school. An old crow named Mrs. Dodds, had the same concealment technique around her making them both targets until proven otherwise. Hmm. Mr. Brunner smells of a horse's ass and Mrs. Dodds smells of decay. If they do prove to be hostiles, then I'll have to eliminate them, the blonde thought before hooking his arm around Moxie, making the people think they were both a couple. Many of the students quickly quieted down and remained where they were, lest they want to suffer the blonde's wrath and severe punishment. But unfortunately, some students have yet to notice the blonde. 
Naruto saw some food being thrown at a crippled kid who the former Leaf Shinobi identified as Grover Underwood. I'm not in the mood for this, he thought and, in a blink of an eye, Naruto pulled Grover back, avoiding the wads of peanut butter and jelly. Naruto turned his gaze to who both threw and wasted perfectly good food. His cold, piercing eyes landed on one Nancy Bobofit and her friends who froze under the blonde's gaze and started sweating bullets, knowing how screwed they were. Picking up the food from the ground, Naruto made his way towards the school bully and her lackeys, while channeling a bit of ki, killing intent, and concentrating it towards the annoying girl. Once he was in front of them, Nancy and her friends felt like death was staring down on them. Eat it, he said in a cold tone that would freeze the underworld over. Bibi but, she stuttered and shrunk beneath Naruto's gaze. Eat it or else, he said and suddenly a demonic mask materialized behind the blonde. Blood was flowing out from its mouth and eyes, while red glowing eyes were looking down on them as if begging them not to, so it could devour them. Out of fear Nancy shoved the food, which was on the grass, down in one go. Good, next time don't waste food or else, he said with a sickening sweet smile that promised pain. Naruto walked back towards Grover and Percy, both petrified in fear. Underwood, be more mindful of your surrounding and Jackson be more attentive, would you kindly, he said still wearing that sickeningly sweet smile. It didn't help that the demonic mask was still behind him, both teens nodded. Good. And just like that, the mask disappeared as Naruto turned around to leave, until. Um, Naruto. Could I ask you a question, Percy said, mustering enough bravery to do so. Naruto turned his head sideways and nodded. Um, what was that? I mean that demonic mask that was behind you, the sea green eyed teen asked nervously. The blonde gave him an innocent look that looked all to fake, and tilted his head a bit. You must be seeing things, Percy. Is the heat getting to you? Do you feel dizzy? Did you not take your morning grains? Because I do not know what you are talking about, Naruto answered in a fake innocent tone. Bullshit, both teens thought. Well, in any event, you are allowed to eat during the tour, so long as you remember to throw your trash in the proper recycling bin. Now hurry along the tour is about to start. With that said, the enigmatic blonde rejoined his partner. Common Percy, Grover said while shaking his head. Yeah was Percy's response since he wasn't sure if Naruto meant it or not. Naruto hooked his arms around Moxie, who gave him a bloodthirsty and lustful grin. My, you were so dominant there my cute little fox, she whispered in a husky tone while pressing her impressive bust on his arms. Making me feel hot under the weather, you better take responsibility for this later, she said. The blonde shook his head and wonder how he puts up with her quirks, but he guessed that that's what he likes about her. It was her quality and her honest personality along with her attitude that he truly liked and her beauty and sexiness was just a bonus to him. He got used to Moxie's quirks and accepted it, besides, he wouldn't and won't have her change who she is for anything. Ha ha, maybe. Who knows, he said simply. From the corner of his eyes, Naruto spotted an eight-year-old girl with mousy brown hair. Her eyes held an amount of warmth and care that the blonde had never seen before. A gust of wind caused him to blink and when he reopened them, the girl was suddenly gone. Odd, he thought before turning his attention to the wheelchaired Latin teacher. Looking around the many statues depicting the Greek gods and goddesses of Olympus, Naruto, for some odd reason, felt a familiar feeling of connection that he only felt with the people who he viewed as his family. He especially felt drawn to one that depicted the goddess, Hestia. Just by looking at the statue, Naruto felt a sense of calm wash over him and felt his growing negative emotions slowly receding, much to his confusion and delight. A smile graced his face, a smile that would normally be seen when he's around his precious people. Who knows, maybe I'm maybe related to them. Shaking his head at the thought, Naruto listened in to the Latin teacher and noticed the class was starting to become noisier. Naruto was about to reprimand them when a comment from a certain annoying girl caused a sea green eyed teen to snap and practically yell at Nancy to shut up. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Brunner called out. Said teen looked towards the wheelchaired man. Did you have a comment? He asked. The teen replied with a no, feeling embarrassed by his outburst. Mr. Brunner, it wasn't Jackson's fault. Bobo fit along with some of the class were being noisy, Naruto said in defense of the dark haired teen. Albeit stoically, this got a nod from Mr. Brunner and a thankful look from Percy. 
But Jackson, leave the reprimanding to me and mind your words. Also any more inappropriate noise and violator will receive two weeks detention and three days community service. He lectured Percy first then warned the class. This, of course, got a fearful nod from all the students. Now let us continue. Mr. Jackson, can you tell me about this picture? Mr. Brunner asked, pointing to one of the pictures on the steel. The picture seemed to incite an emotional sadness from Mr. Brunner when he looked at the female, which Naruto caught. Hmm. The blonde tugged on his partner's shirt and Moxie knew what he wanted to do. The brown-haired beauty caught onto the flickering emotion from the Latin teacher too. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Percy answered. Yes, Mr. Brunner said, not looking that satisfied, and can you tell me why? Naruto nodded to Moxie to intervene and to get a response from Mr. Brunner. He ate his kids because of a prophecy telling him that his kids were going to kick him down from his pedestal, Moxie explained getting a sigh of relief from Percy. Hey, if the so-called Titan Lord wasn't a paranoid schizophrenic and didn't get his panties in a bunch, then he wouldn't have eaten his kids, causing the prophecy thus signing his own death warrant. He screwed himself over because his wife hid her last born, Zeus, and gave the Titan a rock to eat. But I guess he wanted something hard to swallow. She said the last part saucily, implying a double meaning to the last part, getting a lot of people to laugh, including Mr. Brunner. Anyway, when Zeus was all grown up, he tricked his dear old daddy into drinking and barfing up his brothers and sisters, ew by the way. The female group agreed with her. Of course being immortals and all, they survived and were fully grown, surviving in the titan's stomach all those years. Hmm, I imagine them saying, hey little brother what took you, do you know how boring and how it smelled in there, bah, doesn't matter give us a hug, Moxie joked, making everyone snicker and chuckle. They waged war against their tyrannical father and his cronies, with the help from some cyclops and hecatonchires, or hundred arms for those who don't know. Zeus managed to convince a cyclops by the name of Brontes to forge him and his siblings powerful weapons, such as Zeus's magic glowing stick, Poseidon's massive fork, and a forehead protector for Hades. Now that comment got Mr. Brunner to stiffen with an extremely worried look, but it was quickly gone. Naruto smirked, seeing as he got what he needed, but he only needed one more thing to further prove his theory. Long story short, after 11 years, the Olympians won, with help of course, and Zeus took his dear old daddy's scythe and sliced Kronos into pieces, before casting him and his followers into Tartarus, with the exception of Atlas, who was forced to hold the sky, Moxie finished and inwardly grinned as she saw Naruto's smirk meaning she accomplished her task. Like we're going to use this in real life, like it's going to say on our job application, Please explain why Kronos ate his kids, Nancy mumbled. It was still loud enough for Mr. Brunner to hear. And why, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Uzumaki, to paraphrase Miss Bobofit's question, does this matter in real life, he said, asked the two teens, with the former glaring at the annoying girl, while the latter had an unreadable expression on his face. Busted, Grover said with a slight smirk. Shut up, Nancy snapped, barked at Grover while blushing as red as her hair because of the embarrassment she felt. Naruto decided to speak first to save Percy from embarrassment. Since both Greek and Roman culture have significant impact in modern civilization and society, such as art, science, philosophy, laws, and warfare to name a few, he answered, not really caring as his mind was racing for a plan to get the teacher alone. Percy sighed as Naruto's answer not only shut Nancy up but, more importantly, saved him, since he wasn't able to think of an answer. Soon, everyone was outside eating their lunch. But, for some odd reason, the weather outside was starting to storm. Another odd thing, aside from Naruto, Moxie, Grover and Percy, no one seemed to notice. This feels like a genjutsu, but on a much higher scale, Naruto thought. Then, all of the sudden, the blonde felt a fluctuation of power, making him turn towards where he felt the fluctuation and saw the water from the fountain rise up and push Nancy on her behind. His eyes widened slightly at that and turned to his partner who nodded confirmation. Percy pushed me, Nancy whined as Mrs. Dodds came right up to the sea green eyed teen. The blonde's instincts told him to follow the two. He followed them to a secluded part of the museum, and he could hear a small argument between Mrs. Dodds and Percy. Peering through the door, the blonde saw Mrs. Dodds transform into some weird bat-like creature. Before she could attack Percy, Naruto decided to make his presence known. The two were alerted as the doors opened, revealing Naruto. 
And Naruto, what, run? Percy shouted, but the blonde ignored the teen as his attention was on the humanoid bat that was once Miss Dodds, who looked visibly pale for some odd reason. The blonde saw she was about to escape, but he would have none of that. Blue threads shot out from the blonde's right hand fingertips and wrapped around the monster. Percy, keep this between the two of us, got it, Naruto said, staring into Percy's sea green eyes with his piercing cerulean blue ones. The teen nodded and, with a single tug of the threads, the bat like creature was sliced into multiple bits, leaving a pool of blood before it vanished into light particles. Percy felt like vomiting, but was able to hold it back. Just then, Nancy walked in. I hope Mrs. Dodds whipped you, but she shut up when she saw Naruto glaring at her. Jackson, I will talk to you later, but for now, both you and Bobofit regroup with the class, now, he said with a cold and commanding tone. The two teens nodded and promptly ran. You can come out now Mr. Brunner, I can sense your horses behind from a mile away, he said. Said Latin teacher wheeled in. Who are you, he asked. That is what I should be asking you. Why are you covered in an illusion, specifically your lower area, he said, while channeling visible key and manifesting his Hanyu mask, with black ichor and large centipedes crawling out of its eyes. Mr. Brunner went white at seeing such a horrific sight, but calmed himself down. How did you know, he asked albeit still frightened. I'm not originally from this dimension, since my father and grandmother brought me here from my dimension, he said. He must be a demigod then, Mr. Brunner thought, since only gods and goddesses could possibly go into different dimension. He decided to tell Naruto his identity and the reason why he was here among other things. So, let me get this straight. Your name is Chiron, a centaur, the trainer of heroes and one of the directors the other being a god, of Camp Half-Blood. You are able to hide yourself under the mist, which hides the appearance of any supernatural event from mortals, and the reason you are here is to watch over Percy Jackson, who you suspected to be a demigod child of the Big Three, Naruto summarized. Yes, you summarized it perfectly Mr. Uzumaki. Sai Moxie, his story checks out. Don't kill him. Chiron turned around and saw the brunette was about to stab him with a kanai. Shame. I really wanted to test this new metal we found Naruto, she said. Taking a closer look, Chiron's eyes widened as he recognized that particular metal. Moxie raised a single brow at the shocked look on the centaur. You recognize this metal, she asked. Chiron nodded. Yes, it's called Imperial Gold. A metal that is fatal to immortals and half-blood mortals. How did you acquire it, he asked since, even during ancient times, the metal was very closely guarded. It was a gift, actually. From when I was brought here to this world, Naruto answered. It was true. After Naruto read his mom and grandmother's letter, he found several scrolls containing several weapons that were in his world's likeness. But since he already had his own weapon, the blonde decided to give them to Moxie. Chiron, we'll watch over Jackson for now, since I owe the kid a bit of an explanation from what happened earlier. I know you saw what I did and I'll explain further in the future. But for now, let us rejoin the class to avoid suspicion. Chiron nodded at Naruto's words and left. By we, you mean you, right, because I'm not about to babysit a kid. Hell, the only missions I don't join are escort and guard missions, Moxie said with a tone that left no room for argument. Naruto rolled his eyes at this but otherwise nodded. Fine, but maintain radio connection, in case something happens. Got it? She nodded. I love you, my maelstrom. A soft angelic voice whispered into Naruto's ear. She captured his lips in a passionate kiss as she lay on top of him. She pulled back slightly, and I forever will, she continued before recapturing his lips. This woman had long black hair, pale skin that seemed illuminated under the sun's rays. Her bright brown eyes held warmth and love in them for him, her slender frame, and that smile on her face, which was blocked slightly by sun's rays and her bangs. To Naruto this person on top of him is perfect and he swore that he'll never let her go and this angelic beauty's name was. The sound of horns woke Naruto up from his pleasant dream and he cursed whoever that was. Whoever that was is dead, he muttered, sitting upright on his seat. You're awake. Did you have a nice nap? Naruto gazed to his left to see his partner driving and it suddenly came back to him. He looked back to confirm it and, indeed, in the back of his car was Percy Jackson, who was deep in thought. Earlier, after the school trip ended, 
Naruto asked Percy to go with him and Moxie, stating that he'll explain what he saw and drive him to his apartment. The drive was interesting, somewhat. Percy couldn't believe that the blonde was from another world and asked Naruto to prove it, which Naruto did by summoning a shadow clone next to Percy and forming his signature jutsu or Sengon. Needless to say, Percy's mind was blown and made him think that Naruto was some kind of superhero in disguise, like he read in his comic books, which Naruto denied saying, heroes doesn't exist in real life only people doing their jobs that make them out to be. After that, Naruto took a small nap since there was slight traffic, that was an hour ago. I did before that annoying horn woke me up, Naruto said in an annoyed tone, though he covered the emotion he felt. He felt a pang of sadness in his heart as he recalled that evening. It seems like a lifetime ago for the blonde, yet it felt like yesterday when he held her in his arms and he heard those words, those simple words that held so much meaning for him. But it would seem his partner noticed as Moxie squeezed Naruto's hand softly to let the blonde feel that she knows and is comforting him. He smiled slightly and nodded to her, thanking her for, once again, being there for him. Taking in some air, Naruto calmed himself down before looking back at Percy. Jackson, this is your stop, I'll see you tomorrow okay, he said. Percy nodded and got out of the car. Thanks for the help Naruto, oh and just call me Percy since I'm calling you by your first name, Percy said with a slight smile. Naruto nodded. Sure thing, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh and don't ask about anything regarding Mrs. Dodds okay, better that you forget about her. With that, Naruto left, though not before leaving a shadow clone to watch over Percy. You think he'll be alright, Moxie asked, taking a left turn. Hmm, hard to say. With what happened to him today, he's trying to hide it, but he's shaken. All we can do is watch over him for now and see what happens, Naruto stated calmly looking towards the setting sun. The sky was giving off a menacing color of red-orange and, to Naruto, it was foreboding. Why'd I get the feeling that things are going to change? Whatever that feeling was, one thing is certain in Naruto's mind. He's ready for anything. By the way, why did you admit to Chiron that the medal was a gift? Moxie asked, wondering why her blonde partner, love interest admitted it. It wouldn't matter if you got the information out of him. Based on his reaction, that kind of metal ore is something of a rare commodity that is not easily found, so no making bullets out of imperial gold, the blonde replied, getting a cute pout from Moxie. A shame I couldn't get a new toy. A short drive, later the car stopped at a certain apartment. Do say hello for me, Moxie said, knowing that her secret love interest was visiting someone who he viewed as a maternal figure. You sure you don't want to join us, I'm sure Oba-chan won't mind, Naruto said though he still didn't know why she would ask him to call her grandmother, considering how young and beautiful she looked. But, then again, her glare and that sweet smile of hers, which Naruto learned to use, said otherwise. I'm sure. Besides, someone has to manage your clones who, need I remind you, are out on a mission, Moxie said before driving off. Making sure he was proper and clean, Naruto rang the doorbell. Instantly, he heard the sound of footsteps getting louder and louder getting closer to the door. The door swung open, revealing a radiant woman with brilliant and gentle green eyes. Good afternoon Ria Oba Chan, Naruto greeted his somewhat grandmother, who smiled brightly enough to put the sun to shame. Ah, Naru Chan. Good afternoon, I was beginning to think you had forgotten, she said with her motherly tone that seemed to hold no equal. Naruto scratched the back of his head, a bit embarrassed at being late. Sorry, but me and my companion got caught in traffic he replied to the kind and radiant women in front of him. The blonde blinked for a bit when he saw Rhea studying him as if trying to discover something. Hmm, did something happen to you Naru-chan, she asked, her voice laced with worry. Naruto inwardly sighed and knew he could never lie to her, not counting times he withheld certain information about himself, since he didn't want to lose this bond they shared. Unbeknownst to the blonde, Rhea already knew he wasn't originally from this world having talked with both his mother and her daughter and was fine with him withholding such information till he deemed it necessary to share those facts with her. She herself has hadn't told him that she is, in fact, his actual grandmother. But after the time they spent together, it became apparent that Naruto already saw her as a maternal figure. Naruto nodded, letting his masks drop for the only person, aside from Moxie, that he trusts. The former blonde shinobi felt a comforting hand on his shoulder. Let's talk inside and you can tell your Oba-chan all about it. Naruto nodded, 
unable to refuse her request, like he ever could. The blonde Jinchuriki sat down on the living room couch while Rhea prepared some tea and snacks. Naruto took note of the decor of the living room. It was a bit reminiscent of the decoration that of Greek houses. How Naruto knew that, while reading and watching some TV special about it. It was lavishing, to say the least. Simple, yet elegant with that homey feel to it. Naruto felt that feeling of safety and security that only a true home could bring. The smell of cookies caught Naruto's senses and it smelled heavenly. The blonde looked up to see Rhea with a batch of cookies and tea. He also took notice of the red dress she wore which seemed to highlight her curves and her natural beauty. Naruto buried certain thoughts back to the deepest and darkest corner of his mind and looked down with a red blush on his face. Of course Rhea saw this and smirked slightly. I still got it, she thought, amused that she could bring out such a reaction from her grandbaby, who mind you, had grown up with beautiful mortal women and is currently living with a demigoddess who she is certain is related to a certain goddess she knows. Is something the matter Naru Chan? The titaness of motherhood asked innocently, placing the tray down on the wooden table, that looked very expensive, and moving closer to the blonde, making said blonde shift a bit uncomfortably at the close proximity. You seem flustered, do you have a fever? She said, placing her forehead on his, checking his temperature. This only served to deepen Naruto's blush as he stumbled backwards and stuttered incoherent words. Mo, you don't seem to have any sort of fever unless, oh my, she said suddenly, gaining Naruto's attention. Both of her hands were on her cheeks, with a mild blush, and looking away from him. It seems Naru Chan is having illicit thoughts about this widowed woman. Should I be concerned that my Naru Chan would ravish me to satisfy his beastly urges? She said, sending Naruto's brain straight into the gutter as he tried to recompose himself and keep his mind clean, so much so that he overloaded his brain, causing him to pass out. Hmm, I might have gone too far, she thought, tilting her head slightly while placing her index finger just below her lips. Sometime later, Naruto awoke and found that his head was currently on Rei's lap, making the former blonde shinobi jump. Era, is something the matter, Naru chan? she asked innocently. Said blonde shook his head and took a seat, are you sure that you are all right, you seem jumpy today Naru chan Naruto didn't know if his grandmother figure was doing this on purpose or not since he couldn't tell with that innocent look of hers, and he's an expert at reading facial expressions. But it seems he couldn't determine whether or not Ray's expression was real or fake. Taking a second to calm down, since his mind was still a bit rattled, the blonde spoke. Yes, Ria Oba chan I'm fine. It could be because of the ride or the fact that I skipped both breakfast and lunch. Naruto forgot to eat his morning meal, which consists of a good, healthy bowl of cereal or bacon and eggs and other morning meals. He even forgot to buy or bring lunch with him. The blonde Jinchuriki flinched at the sight of his grandmother figure's stern glare. You should really learn to take better care of yourself Naru chan she scolded, making him bow his head in embarrassment. I know. I just had a lot of things on my mind, Naruto answered weakly. That's still not an excuse to neglect your health, Rhea lectured, still maintaining that glare of hers. I'm sorry, the blonde apologized, feeling like child being scolded by his mother. It was like when Lilith would scold him for doing something reckless when he was a kid, now Rhea was doing the same thing. Different circumstances, same situation with him neglecting his health in favor of his brooding. I forgive you, now eat up. I would hate for these to go to waste. She gestured to her homemade cookies, which the blonde found very addictive. Same with his ramen addiction and a bit of a cereal addiction. So, are you going to tell me? What has caused my Naru Chan such emotional distress? She asked before taking a sip of herbal tea. The Titaness saw Naruto flinch ever so slight and she instantly knew it had something to do with his past. Something very painful. It was further backed up by the fact that he scratched his left side where his heart is. Come something must have happened to someone close to his heart to stir such emotions from my grandson, she thought. If someone were to ask how she knew this, the answer that someone would get is that it's Ray's motherly instincts. Something just made me remember a painful part of my past, it involved someone I loved, he said in a lamentable tone. He felt a familiar, painful knot around his heart. It was almost a year since her death, though the exact date was different from his world to this. He still knew when, how could he not? It was, after all, the death of someone he loved and still does. That day has been etched into his very soul, it is something no one could easily forget. 
explaining it would be too painful. Even if I recall our time together, any of those memories would only be washed away as I remember her dying in my arms as she said those three words before she died. I couldn't say those words back. Sometime while speaking, his tears began to flow down his cheeks. He would not let anyone see him like this, aside from those who he trusted the most. Heck, even back then he didn't shed a single tear, bottling up his sadness, since he didn't trust his former teammates. Naruto felt a pair of arms wrap around his form and a hand rub his back in a comforting manner. Let it out Naruto, just let it all out, bottling it up will only make it worse, Rhea whispered gently, letting her aura wash over her grandson. Not even a second later, the blonde finally let the dam loose and started to cry, letting out years of pent-up sadness in one go. That's it, don't worry Naruto, I'm here. At the moment, Rhea didn't see the strong blonde warrior that her grandson had become but the emotionally damaged child who had been wronged throughout most of his life. Soon, the tears died down and Rhea heard light snoring coming from her grandson. Oh Naru-chan, my poor grandson. Those mortals really did a number on you, she thought, feeling her anger rising and as well as resentment towards the mortals who harmed her grandson, which was only equal to her hatred towards a certain titan. She would like to smite Konoha for their transgressions towards her grandson, but in doing so, she would also be harming those he considered family as well as the few good mortals who showed him kindness. Let's do away with those thoughts for another time, right now I need to put Naru-chan to bed, she thought and used her power to teleport to the nearest room and laid Naruto down. Hypnos, I do hope my grandson sleeps easily in Morpheus, you better make sure his dreams are wonderful or else, she said, threateningly, using her omnipresence to send a clear message to the god of sleep and the god of dreams. Both heard it and shivered in fear while proceeding to do just that. They didn't want to suffer the Titanus's wrath. Time skip, one week it has been well over one week since the incident at the museum. For a certain dark-haired teen, it was hectic. Everyone around him acted like Mrs. Dodds didn't exist and was on their merry way, oblivious to everything. The only person he could talk to about this was one blonde shinobi, as Naruto called himself. Naruto understood his reason for being jumpy and helped Percy so he wouldn't lose his mind, or at the least feel out of place, so to speak. The blonde noticed that Grover had been acting strange as well. It was as if something was on the verge of jumping him or he was expecting something bad to happen at any moment. Seriously, Naruto thought that goat-smelling kid was on drugs or was high on medication due to the boy's jitteriness. It wasn't until he asked Chiron about Grover's questionable acting that he got an answer. The trainer of heroes admitted that Grover was Percy's assigned guardian and a satyr, half man half goat, which explains the goat smell. And the reason why Grover was acting so nervous was because of the incident with Mrs. Dodds and the fear that other creatures may know of Percy. But Naruto was not satisfied and felt Chiron was holding back on him, but the centaur's look pleaded that he not press the issue. So he let the matter drop, for now anyways. Naruto hated not knowing anything about the situations he was in even during his time with Moxie. Before the two would pick a contract, the blonde would gather as much information as he possibly could. Of the people he and Moxie would work for to the mission itself, such as the place, the people, and, in most cases, the opposition they were up against. The blonde would go into every tiny detail and make sure no stone went unturned. After all, knowledge is power and, in the right hands, it could become a tool of salvation or utter destruction. An example of this was in the battlefield. Lack of information is fatal in the field. It is a recipe for disaster and utter failure. You're basically going into unknown territory blind, not knowing how many people are going to kill you. There is that old saying, blind a soldier for a second and he or she is dead, or ignorance can and will get you killed. Percy still felt out of place, more so than usual, making the blonde sigh as he looked over some paperwork. Percy, Stop jittering like a bug and just relax, the blonde said in a calming tone before stamping down on one of the files. Currently, Percy was in Naruto's office, or rather, the student council office and the disciplinary committee since he just couldn't stand the atmosphere of the people around him, aside from his friend Grover and Chiron, or, as he still knows him, Mr. Brunner. I know you feel out of place at the moment, but try your best to ignore it. Besides, Mrs. Dodds, from what I gather, wasn't your favorite teacher. So this shouldn't be affecting you this much, he said not taking his eyes off his paperwork. It would be much easier to use his shadow clones, but he didn't want to be too dependent on them. 
It's just frustrating and weird to see everyone act so, so casual, like that old coot never existed in the first place, Percy said, frustrated. He was about to curse, but remembered that the blonde hated people cursing in his presence. Anyone caught talking in such a vulgar manner would be strictly punished for it. It's as if she was just a figment of my imagination or something and I feel so, ah, I can't even explain it. Percy sighed in frustration and slumped down in the leather couch he was sitting in. He truly did feel out of place for the past week and couldn't concentrate on anything, which was bad, since they have a test tomorrow and, with his grades, let just say he was sure he wasn't going to come back to this school next year. The blonde sighed softly, finally finished with the last stack of paperwork. Whoever invented this, may they suffer in the afterlife. The blonde cursed whoever made the term, paperwork, and introduced it to the world. Truly the being is of pure, pure evil. Now turning his attention to the stressed teen, maybe that semester his clone took in psychology at Harvard University could come in handy. Nah, in this kind of situation he doubted it. There are just some things that can't be explained or even reasoned out. Percy, it's better if you push those thoughts away in favor of tomorrow's upcoming test. If you need assistance, then I will help you, he reasoned, trying to get the sea green eyed teen's mind off the former math teacher and onto something more important and, probably, stressful. Meh, it's the lesser of two evils. At least with this, he won't act like someone who's about to go insane, or something close to it. He'll probably blow a gasket. Yeah, that's it, the blonde thought. For some reason, he imagined Percy doing just that, but in an anime-like or possibly cartoonish way. Percy nodded, almost as soon as Naruto finished his last sentence. Why? Well, Naruto is considered the number one student in school, despite their similar condition. When he had asked the blonde how he managed that, he just answered, I just learned how to read backwards. He said it as if it was the simplest thing in the world. It is true though, Naruto found a way around his condition. It started when he was a kid. He found out that when he was trying to read, the words would somehow turn backwards, as if some omnipotent and possibly omnipresent entity was messing with him. Later in Naruto's life, he called it Murphy, after he heard about Murphy's Law. Okay, let's head to your apartment, but what about your, um, girlfriend? Would she be fine with it? Oh, don't worry about Moxie. She's working on something that requires her full attention. Percy nodded and thanked his blonde friend. At least he thinks they're friends. Well we have been hanging out for the past week, but maybe I should ask him, he thought. Hey, um, Naruto, Percy called out. Yeah, what it is, Naruto responded while filing the finished paperwork. Are we friends? Percy saw the blonde stop and with a thoughtful look on his face before nodding. We are. By the way, what is taking Grover so long, he wondered out loud. Well, I did tell him not to eat the bean burrito. Percy said while scratching the back of his head followed up by a sigh. And they had chili in them too, he added. Seriously, what kind of burrito did the food truck come up with? Go get him. I have something to finish here first, he said to Percy. Naruto sat down and opened the top part of his desk. Inside were mission reports that his clones had successfully finished and need to be filed accordingly. Hey, just because he's in school doesn't mean he neglects his mission contracts, that his and Moxie's permanent clients handed to them, that being government agencies and other organizations that cannot be named. Ah, the wonders of shadow clones. An overpowered technique in the hands of Naruto, and probably any other Jinchuriki or Uzumaki, since his clan was the one who made this forbidden technique. It was forbidden because of the required amount of chakra. The jutsu would take away a lot of chakra just to make one and only people with at least cage level chakra reserves and control could make, at best, four. The jutsu would kill if used by a novice with low chakra. But for someone like him, an Uzumaki and a Jinchuriki, it wasn't a bother. Well maybe the slight intake of sudden information that gave him a headache, but that was just mildly annoying. Okay, let's review today's mission report. The blonde began to speed read through the reports analyzing each detail, checking if for things that could have been done so the mission could have ended quicker and more efficiently than it already had, and if there were any faults in each of them. His mind, once again, drifted back to his maternal figure, who he visited after classes, except if there were exams or a very important mission involved, and during his free time. Naruto still recalled waking up in her guest room followed by sharing a wonderful breakfast with her and so forth. Basically, he spent the entire day with her, 
helping her with the house, assisting her in buying the groceries and just simply chatting with her. The blonde truly enjoyed his time with her and was angry with himself for still keeping secrets from her. But his fear of losing her always held him back from telling her. I really hate having to keep secrets from Rhea Obaa Chan, he thought while leaning back in his chair. The blonde doesn't keep secrets from those he considers precious to him, which consisted of Lilith, his motherly figure back in the elemental nations, the girls who work in the brothel, his older sister figures, everyone in the red light district, who saw him not as an abomination that needed to be killed but simply as him, as Naruto, Anko, who knew the same pain of loneliness and hatred as him. Another person he loved was his Tenshi Haim, who knew the same burden as him and Anko, also the one he loves. Rhea, his grandmother, motherly figure and Moxie, his partner and really, really close friend, who he also has strong feelings for. Naruto is still oblivious to her feelings but is not without reason. There are also his two sentient partners and Kayubi, who he also came to care and develop feelings for but, like Moxie, he didn't know if she holds the same feelings as he does, again dense as adamantium. Speaking of the brunette and the red-orange-haired vixen, the day after Naruto left Rei's home and returned to his apartment, Moxie suddenly jumped him and dragged him to the bedroom. Five hours later, a content and satisfied Moxie was sleeping soundly on Naruto, using his chiseled chest as a pillow. The same could not be said about the blonde. The moment he fell asleep, Kayubi pulled him into his mindscape and they proceeded to rut like rabbits in heat till morning, when he felt his consciousness returning. Any other man would have killed to be in Naruto's position. For the blonde, he was just happy that he could make them happy. It was what his adopted mother taught him after all. Never leave a girl unhappy and unsatisfied. It was a gentleman's job after all. At least, that's what Lilith and his older sister figures told him. Among those teachings were. Always treat the female gender with respect, view them as equals, and treat them with kindness, with the exception of fangirls, unsavory women who his sisters described as total bitches, and those who make any woman look weak or pathetic. He cared for each and every one of them. He would gladly give his life if it meant protecting them. This could be his biggest flaw as well as his most endearing quality. But, it is who he is and it is what drives him to become strong enough to protect those he cares for and loves. I won't let it happen again. I won't lose anyone again, he thought while closing his eyes. Please hold on. I'll save you, Naruto choked out trying to fight the tears as he was trying to heal the person he loved, trying to heal the large gash on her left side just above her heart. He promised himself that he wouldn't lose her and is currently failing. P please, hold on, Naruto croaked out, his emotion clear as day, fear, dismay, and denial. The blonde felt her almost cold hands caressing his cheeks, as she would do since their first date. Her eyes locked with his and she mustered all her remaining strength into saying one last thing to him. Na Naru to Kunai, love, you. Her hand fell making the blonde's eyes widen in shock as he heard her last words before he felt her heart stop. No, no, no. He cried out in anguish, denying the sight before him, his Tenshiheim, dead in his arms. Naruto jerked up harshly, panting heavily, tears flowing down his face as he recalled the day he lost a piece of himself and the person he loved, but he couldn't mope around since he felt two familiar presences. He quickly took out some eye drops and some paperwork just before Percy and Grover came in. Naruto, I got Grover here so we could, wait, are you crying? That earned Percy a slap on the head by Grover, who pointed to the eye drops and the stack of papers. No Percy, I wasn't crying. My eyes just felt dry so I had to use some eye drops and sorry if my voice sounds off, my throat feels dry too, the blonde lied smoothly. So Grover, will you be joining us in a late night cram, Naruto continued while putting away the eye drops and papers, the teen shook his head. I would, but Mr. Brunner asked me to help him with something. Don't worry, I've studied beforehand, the satyr replied. He could tell that Naruto was studying him with those piercing cerulean blue eyes. It was as if he was trying to determine something before nodded. Then we'll see you tomorrow Grover, oh and just call me Naruto. Got it, the Caucasian teen nodded. Scene change Percy's dormitory and time skip evening. So, did you get all of that Percy? Naruto asked as he was currently tutoring the teen, who looked like he just went three rounds of boxing and lost. He nodded in response. Okay then, I'll ask you a question, the blonde started. Tell me the difference between Chiron and Karen. Um, oh, 
one has an I and the other has an A in their name. And, ah, Chiron, that's with an I, has a horse behind and is known as the trainer of heroes. Karen, the one with the A, is the ferryman of the dead and really greedy, due to his obsession with Olympian money. Naruto smiled and nodded. Good, now, why can't you be this attentive in class and why did you have me read to you? Percy sheepishly scratched the back of his head and chuckled slightly. Well, dyslexia gets in the way and you don't seem to have a problem with that so, the dark-haired teen trailed off from here. The Jinchuriki sighed. Percy, you still need to learn this stuff on your own. I know it may be tough for people like us, but we have to make do, he lectured the teen, who nodded and began to read on his own. A few minutes later and the blonde saw Percy was getting more and more agitated before he finally snapped and threw his book, absently cursing. Halting in his agitated state, he forgot the person who was with him. I'll let that word slide since you were agitated, but try to use less unsavory words Percy. Percy nodded quickly under Naruto's heated glare. Maybe I should go see Mr. Brunner, he might have a way that is good for me, no offense to your method Naruto but I won't be able to just magically learn how to read backwards. Naruto nodded, understanding the teen's reason and deciding to join him, since he had some questions for the trainer of heroes. Like, why the weather was getting worse and more and more rampant earthquakes. Yeah, those kinds of questions. Both teens made their way downstairs to the faculty office, which was dark and empty aside from Mr. Brunner's office. They were only a few steps from the door handle when they heard voices inside the Latin's teacher office. Worried about Percy and Naruto, sir, Grover's voice rang out. Naruto raised an eyebrow at the his name being mentioned, but shrugged it off thinking that either Grover must have sensed he's a demigod or Chiron told the Caucasian teen that he is. Alone this summer. I mean, a kindly one in the school. Now that we know for sure, and they know too. We would only make matters worse if we rush the boy, and no, I am not worried about Naruto. I did tell you what happened to Mrs. Dodds, correct? Mr. Brunner said, cutting Grover off. Why yeah. Grover's voice sounded shaken. Probably because of the details on how Naruto killed the furry. But sir, the summer solstice deadline. Grover was cut off again by Chiron. Will have to be resolved without Percy, Grover. Let him enjoy his time while he still can, he said gently, though it sounded like Percy was going to die or something. And Naruto, what about him? Grover asked. Mr. Uzumaki is a different case. I'm sure you have sensed the power he's holding back and expertly hiding, correct? Yes, I still can't believe a demigod has that much power and could keep it in check and, more importantly, hidden. But we're getting off topic sir, I comma I can't fail my duties again. Grover's voice was very familiar to a certain blonde and said blonde wondered what Grover could have meant by that. You haven't failed Grover, Mr. Brunner said kindly. I should have seen her for what she was. Now, let's just worry about keeping Percy alive until next. Percy accidentally dropped his textbook making an audible thud. He was paying such close attention to the conversation that he did not realize the book was beginning to slip from his grasp. Naruto acted quickly and grabbed Percy's arms and the textbook before Shunshin, body flicker, back to Percy's dorm. Said teen nearly hurled as he felt very dizzy. Sorry about that Percy. Don't worry. The dizziness should subside after a few seconds, Naruto said, getting the teen a glass of water. We'll talk with Grover tomorrow, since it'll be easier because he's a bad liar. For now, try to get some sleep since we have an exam tomorrow, Naruto said before vanishing in a swirl of black and white feathers. To Percy, that exit was the coolest thing he'd ever seen. The next afternoon, they finally got out of their three hour Latin exam. Naruto got out much earlier thanks to his photographic memory which was both a blessing and curse, and waited for his dark-haired friend, who was currently talking with Chiron. Well, that doesn't look good, Naruto thought sensing Percy's emotions, mostly frustration and anger. Percy rushed out of the classroom and made his way towards his dorm. Let me guess, you tried the pep talk and it didn't end well, Naruto said. Chiron nodded and explained what happened. Don't blame yourself Chiron. You were distracted and stressed. I can see it clearly in your eyes. It happens to us from time to time, so don't beat yourself up, okay, Naruto said kindly, trying to lift the man's spirit. Thank you for your words Naruto, but it still doesn't excuse the fact that I made Percy feel worse. 
the trainer of the heroes felt like kicking himself for his poor choice of words to the dark-haired teen and it was only made worse, since it was in front of the class. With another sigh, he said, I'll be leaving for the camp. I assume that both you and Moxie are joining. He received a nod from the blonde before he left, presumably to catch up with Percy. The blonde sighed. When he finally caught up with Percy, he was already packing his things. The whiskered teen could see the negative emotions rolling off the sea green eyed teen and placed a comforting hand on his shoulder to calm him down. Hey, Percy, don't worry. There are other schools out there, not just this one. Who knows, they may have something for our condition, he told Percy gently. Percy blinked. What do you mean, are, are you not staying here for another semester, he asked. Dude, we're friends right? Getting a nod, Naruto continued. What you should know is that I never leave a friend alone. Besides, this place is too stuck up with rich brats and boring classes. Now come on, Moxie's waiting for me and I don't want to keep a lady waiting. It's rude, like most kids in this school. That got a chuckle from the dark-haired boy as he followed his blonde friend. Both teens spotted Moxie and Grover, who looked very jumpy, waiting for them at the bus terminal. Hey Percy, she greeted before walking up beside Naruto and locking his left arm around her, pushing it between her bosom, and leaning her head onto his shoulder. How was the exam Grover, Naruto asked. F fine, he stuttered out as the four of them got on the bus. During the whole ride, Grover kept glancing down the aisle nervously watching the other passengers and looking out the window, as if he was expecting to be jumped by something or someone. I guess it's as perfect a time as any. Naruto sent Percy a nod. The teen knew what it meant. Why so spooked Grover, Naruto asked innocently, getting said teen's attention. The disguised satyr was waving his hands frantically in dismissal. Yeah Grover. Not getting it lately, Moxie continued, giggling and getting a blush from Grover. He didn't know how to answer her. Yeah, you've been looking around. What, looking for kindly ones, Percy said, going in for the kill, so to speak. The Caucasian teen's eyes widened and he nearly jumped out of his seat and looked like he was having a heart attack. Wah, what do you mean, he asked, lying and trying to play innocent, which he failed at. Underwood, you might as well tell us the truth. Both Percy and I overheard you and Mr. Brunner talking last night, Naruto said in a dead serious tone. Those who heard it shivered in fear and shook their heads in pity for the boy. It was only made worse for Grover since Naruto was blasting him with his key. The satyr began to think that the blonde was enjoying this or something. Oh, and Grover, know that I do not like imposing my will and intimidating others, especially my friends, but if need be, I will, he said, seemingly reading Grover's mind. Grover sighed and took out a card from his pocket and handed it over to them. So this is your summer camp or something? Moxie asked. Though she already knew what Camp Half Blood is, she acted ignorant for a certain dark haired teen. The satyr nodded. Yeah, well, that's just so you guys can contact me if you need my help, he said. Why? Percy asked curiously. What exactly are you not telling us? However, before Grover could answer, the bus suddenly stopped and black smoke began to pour out from the dashboard, filling the bus with the disgusting smell of rotten food. Another reason to add on to why I don't like using public transportation, the blonde muttered as they got off the bus in the middle of nowhere. Taking a look around, Naruto, at the least, took a bit of comfort in seeing nature and the quiet countryside. Why is there a fruit stand here? Percy pointed over to the other side of the road where, indeed, an old fruit stand that had various fruits, giving it a colorful image of the tropics, was standing. Next to the fruit stand were three. Ancient looking ladies sitting on racking chairs, swaying back and forth. They were sewing one humongous sock. Weird, the blonde thought before glancing towards his companions. Percy and Moxie had that curious look on their faces while Grover, well, Grover looked like he just took a huge dump in his pants and looked sickly pale. What got into him? Glancing back towards the three old ladies, he noticed that they were looking at Percy for some odd reason. Tell me they're not looking at Percy. They are, aren't they? Grover's voice was laced with terror and worry. Yeah, weird right? But do you think those socks would fit anyone and who is it for? Percy said, asked. His tone sounded both disbelieving and curious. This got a shrug from Naruto's partner. I don't know, maybe for Bigfoot or someone with abnormally large feet. Either that or they just have a lot of free time in their old lives, Moxie replied, 
still keeping her eyes on the three very, very old women. This isn't the time for jokes. Come and let's get back on the, Naruto. What are you doing? Grover shouted at the blonde, who was making his way towards the three old ladies. Excuse me, Naruto called out, trying to get their attention. Yes dear, all three of them said in perfect unison. Naruto took out a black jacket from his bag. Could you please sew this for me? I will pay you, he asked kindly and loud enough for a certain satyr to hear, getting a disbelieving look from and making him shout out again. Naruto what are you do? But he was cut off by Naruto's glare. Grover, you are making a scene, he said, pointing to the people who were looking at the Caucasian teen. And, if you must know, I am asking them if they could sew the hole in my jacket, to which I will pay them, he said, turning his attention back to the three old ladies. Sorry about my friend, he's a bit jumped today. By the way, my name is Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto apologized and bowed his head. It's fine, dear. The youth these days are different from our time. Oh, and my name is Atropos, the old lady holding a pair of scissors said. And to answer your question, dear, yes, we would gladly fix that nasty hole on your jacket, and please call me Lachesis, the old lady holding two metal rods said. You don't need to pay us, but maybe you could buy some of our fruits. We work tirelessly for those, and please call me Clotho, the old lady with the big ball of yarn said. Naruto nodded happily and handed his jacket to the three old ladies. While they were busy fixing his jacket, the blonde took some time to buy some fruits such as grapes, strawberries, green and red apples, and peaches, which surprised Naruto since that kind of fruit is not normally found in this area of America. Once he got what he needed from the fruit stand, Naruto paid for everything. Thank you dear and here is your jacket. Atropos handed his jacket back. Naruto bowed his head in thanks and made his way back to his group. Such a good boy he turned out to be, Clotho said while pulling out a single thread from the ball of yarn. Yes, considering how he was treated by his people, though they will meet their ends very soon, Lachesis added with a bit of venom in her voice as she grasped the thread with her rod. Once the blonde was with his friends, he saw that Grover was about to faint, he looked back to see Atropos was about to cut a thread making him wonder why Grover was so interested in it. That's it we are getting out of here, the Caucasian teen said, grabbing both Percy and Moxie's arms. Hey, watch it, they both said, with Moxie removing Grover's grip from her arm. Only Naruto can touch me, she hissed, making both teens blush at the double meaning in her words, as she swung her arms around Naruto's left arm. An audible snip could be heard. They looked to see the thread of yarn that Lachesis had in her hand was now cut by Atropos' scissors. No, 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 Grover kept repeating like a mantra before he scuffled to the front of the bus. He kicked it as hard as he could, making a dent in it. Surprisingly enough, the bus shuddered back to life with the engine roaring. The passengers cheered, since they finally get to leave and the driver patted Grover on the back. Good thinking kid. Now everyone, back on board, he said. Naruto was about to get on board when he suddenly stopped, alerting his three companions. He suddenly moved away from the bus and started hailing a taxi. Naruto, what's wrong? Percy asked, feeling quite nervous. He blamed it on his Caucasian friend for acting like they were about to be jumped by something. Percy is there anyone important to you here? Naruto asked without even looking at the team. My mom, why? Naruto's tone of voice suddenly filled the sea green eyed teen with dread the same kind he felt before Mrs. Dodds transformed into a monster and was about to kill him. Before Naruto answered the teen, a taxi finally stopped. I'll tell you on the way, now get in, the blonde ordered. Once inside, Naruto placed the driver under a genjutsu that would make him think that they were having a pleasant chat about summer plans or about school. A clone that I left in school suddenly vanished. Naruto stopped himself after seeing the confused look on both Percy and Grover, making him sigh. Good thing the taxi was a hybrid or what Naruto was going to do next would be awkward, he made a cross sign. Suddenly, a poof sound was heard from the back and both teens' eyes widened when they saw another Naruto. This is one of my abilities, and the reason why I can finish any and all of my paperwork so fast. I can make a clone of myself and when they dispel, anything they learn passes back to me. From the memory of my clone, our school was burned down. The last part made both Percy and Grover nearly faint the latter was very close. Grover, no more lies. 
The creature that burned our school down and killed all mortals who were still there was a large lizard-like creature with black scales. Grover's skin went pale and he had to place a hand over his chest to try and calm himself down from having a heart attack. A dragon, Percy muttered in disbelief. Naruto nodded. Percy, since that creature came to our school, I'm assuming it is either looking for you or all of us, so we need to leave. We can only take those you consider precious with us. My mom. All right, when we get there, act casual. We don't want to give your mother a heart attack, like the one what Grover almost experienced. Moxie, check on him please. Moxie slapped the Caucasian teen, snapping him from his fear-induced trance. He's fine, she said casually, though inside she was in panicking and fear. It wasn't until she looked at Naruto's calm and worryless face that her own nerves and fear subsided. If anything, she was berating herself for forget just who she was with. She knew Naruto had already formulated a plan to get them somewhere safe and possibly deal with the dragon, if it comes to that. Good. Grover focus, Naruto said while snapping his fingers, getting his friend's attention. Does Percy's mom know about you? Grover took a breath and nodded. Good, then this will make things less complicated. Wait, what do you mean by that? The blonde turned to the black-haired teen. It means that she knew certain things. Things she kept secret to protect you, I assume. This makes it easier to explain to her why we need to leave and go someplace safe. The cab stopped in front of Naruto and Moxie's apartment. Once inside, Naruto conjured up several clones and ordered them to pack cloths, supplies, weapons, passports, money, etc. Once everything was in place, they quickly went to the garage and got in Naruto's car. Percy, point me to your address. The dark haired teen nodded and told Naruto the location of his house. Scene change Jackson residence, Sally Jackson, mother to one Percy Jackson was a beautiful woman with blue eyes that sparkled and changed color in the light. She had long brown hair with a few streaks of gray in it. She was a wonderful person with a kind, understanding, and passionate personality. She was also currently on the floor holding her reddening cheeks, courtesy of her foul-mouthed and abusive husband, Gabe Ugliano, hitting her like he always does when he is in a bad mood, drunk, or just felt like it. Normally, she would have reported such abuse but knew it wouldn't end well for two reasons. One was because she couldn't back up her claims, since Gabe's poker buddies would back him up, one of them was even a police officer. The other reason, if she does succeed then monsters would pick up on her son's scent. This was the reason she married Gabe, to protect her son, since Gabe had a smell so horrible that it could mask any demigod, goddess scent from any monster. The reason was because Gabe smacked her like some whore, which he thought she was. There was an announcement about the school being bombed by a deranged lunatic with a picture of the smoldering remains of Yancey Academy. A feeling of dread filled Sally as she hoped that her son was not on the list of victims who died in the explosion. Before the news reporter even mentioned a single name, Gabe changed the channel, not really caring about some brats. Sally quickly grabbed the remote and changed the channel back and to her relief her son was among the students and staff who were safe since they left the school. This action, of course, pissed Gabe off and he promptly smacked her in the face. You bitch! He snapped. In his fit of rage, Gabe grabbed Sally's shirt and quickly ripped it. You need to learn your place you ing whore. The guys and I will make sure of that. He was about to remove her pants but was cut off by something piercing his chest and heart. Gabe's poker buddies looked up only to drop dead the second they did. The last thing they saw was a blonde-haired teen with a silenced 5-7. Mom! Percy quickly rushed towards his mother's side and Naruto pulled out his jacket, placing it around her to hide her modesty, P. Percy. Finally out of her shocked state, tears welled up in her eyes. Percy brought his mother into a comforting hug, trying his best to comfort her. Behind them, Naruto signaled to give the mother and son some privacy. He summoned three shadow clones and ordered them to dispose of the bodies, either dumping them in some undisclosed area or burning them while he took care of the security footage. To his luck, all the security cameras were under maintenance and the building had an incinerator, making it easy to dispose the bodies. Naruto then took out his phone and called several people who owed him a lot of favors. He decided to use one of them. Yeah, it's me, yes, I'm calling for a favor you owe me, it's quite simple really. I need you to remove four people from the system, it is. Just tell them it is me who is making the request, why you ask? Well. I killed four people who were about to rape this poor innocent woman. 
Need I remind you of the favor you owe me? Good, yes, goodbye. Naruto received the memories of his clones throwing the body into the incinerator before returning his attention to the mother and son, the former finally calming down after a minute of crying. The former blonde shinobi then asked, Miss Jackson, first, allow me to introduce myself and my companion. I am Naruto Uzumaki, but call me Naruto. He then gestured to his partner. My name's Madeline Mox. But please call me Moxie, she said. Thank you for saving me Naruto and, please, just call me Sally as well. No need to thank me Sally. I was only doing what was right by helping my friend's mom. Thanks for that Naruto, Percy said, sending his blonde friend a grateful look. Again, no need. Now Sally, I assume you know Grover, or more specifically what he is. Percy's mom nodded, confusing her son in the processes. Mom, Percy called. Percy, the time for questions is not now. Right now, we need to leave. You can ask her once we are in a safe and secure place, Naruto said sternly. He knew the teen had many things on his mind, but right now, safety is their number one priority. If his assumption as to why Sally even thought about staying with that filth he just killed was correct, then they have a small window of opportunity to get to safety. Is there any place we could hold down for a while Sally, at least until I can make some arrangements? Yes, Naruto. Montauk, we have a cabin there. Percy and I would occasionally stay there on vacation. Now, Naruto knew they needed to get as far away from New York as they could, but the location was close to the camp Chiron told him. Good, grab your things and let's go. A minute later, Percy and Sally finished packing and the group left in a hurry. Naruto and Moxie decided to listen to some music on their individual iPods, letting the mother and son talk leisurely. The duo guessed that they wanted to talk more and discuss everything Percy had been doing in the last couple of months. Every now and then, Naruto would glance back to check on them both to see how they were holding up. So far we haven't encountered any obstacles on our way, the blonde thought as his senses had yet to pick up on any potential danger. But it didn't mean he would let his guard down and relax. The blonde Jinchuriki had changed, and not just physically, he felt a bit more at peace in this world than back in the elemental nations. So much so that he dropped his mask of ignorance, allowing him to be his true self which he had only done in the presence of Lilith and her girls and anyone who he considered precious to him. But then again he didn't have people hunting him down, calling out for his death, and glaring at him with hate and disgust. Naruto could only imagine the surprised looks from anyone who didn't know about his masks, his personas. Heck, they would probably think he's an imposter and ask what he did with the real Naruto they all knew. All he would tell them was that Naruto did not exist in the first place and all of it was an act of his, conjured up to fool anyone, to make them think that he was weak so they would drop their guard. Deception is, after all, the bread and butter of every shinobi in Kunoichi, not flashy jutsu and moves. Something that seems to have been lost on the current generation of his back in the elemental nations as more and more shinobi and kunoichi favored flashy. Perhaps the only person that agreed with Naruto was her. She understood the value of deception, the value of fooling your opponent, the value of using key strategies to finishing a mission or an opponent off, not just brute strength. Which is another reason the blonde fell in love her, aside from her bonus traits, such as her simple yet elegant beauty. There is beauty in simplicity and she made it natural and, at the same time, difficult to obtain. It was something that first captivated Naruto. So much so that he thought she was an angel of sorts, hence his nickname for her, Tenshihan, when he first met her under the mist-filled morning. Her face and gentle smile made his heart stop for just a second, making him think he died and she was here to take though him he was glad it wasn't his time. When he first heard her speak, it was soft, innocent, and melodic. Something that most women he knew couldn't pull off, but she made it easy. It was like second nature to her. One of my fondest memories of her, he thought, both in joy and sadness. He felt sadness because he couldn't see her and could hear her voice only in his bitter dreams. Sally, we are nearing Montauk, point me to where the cabin is, Naruto said. Percy's mom nodded and directed Naruto to a wooden cabin that was located right on the beach. The cabin looked a little old but seemed to be in decent condition. The beach itself was very beautiful, from its white sands to clear blue ocean, and that sense of serenity. Naruto and Moxie could understand why Percy and Sally loved the place so much. Sally, I'll have my clone carry the bags. Why don't you and Percy go and enjoy yourselves for a little while, Naruto said, 
knowing that this peace and quiet wouldn't last for very long. He wanted both of them to enjoy themselves before things go downhill. I insist and I'll pay for the expenses, Naruto pressed as Sally was about to protest. Drop it Sally. Naruto is one of the most stubborn people I know, though his stubbornness is a trait all men seem to carry, even more so than us females, Moxie said with a small teasing smile on her face as Naruto simply rolled his eyes. Besides I and, I'm sure, Grover here, want to explore this place, so would you kindly show me around? Sally nodded and handed the key to the cabin to Naruto and gave a tour to Moxie and Grover. You sense it my lord? Elysium's voice rang out from their connection. The blonde mentally nodded, feeling the lingering energy that surrounded the place. Yes, it would seem that this is the place where both Sally and Percy's father met, and if my hunch is correct then my sea green eyed friend is going to be involved in a lot of trouble. Naruto read up everything in regards to the Greeks, such as the gods and goddesses, the titans, and the beings before them, all to find out who his mother is. Did you guess who Percy's father is, my lord? Inferno asked with a smirk on his flaming face. Both him and his sister know how sharp their master is and how easily he could perceive things. This just made their blonde master much more dangerous, since he could easily figure out any plans against him or if people are trying to deceive him. Yes, from what I gathered from observing Sally Jackson, this place holds more significance to her than just Percy. This place is where she met Percy's father and the lingering energy we felt surfaced from the water. The energy itself is similar to Percy. Naruto's mind was putting all the small puzzle pieces together, completing that mystery of who Percy's father was. His piercing cerulean blue eyes stared at his green-eyed friend. Percy's father is Poseidon, god of the sea, storms, earthquakes, droughts, floods and horses, he finished. The blonde's mind raced at the possible enemies they'll encounter, places they could use as safe houses, and how much danger they're in. The only place that would be safe is the camp that Chiron told me about. The question is, would we make it? No, I'm positive we will. I'll make sure of it, Naruto swore. And we'll be here to help with that, my lord. Both sentient spirits said dutifully, loyalty burning in their voices. It seems things are finally moving forward. The nine tailed demoness thought, she could only imagine the battles her container would face. Oh, just imagining the blood that Naruto kun would spill is making me horny. Hum, I wonder though, would he use that? Kurumi hummed in thought of seeing that technique of her destined mate, making her shudder in anticipation. It was one of the techniques Naruto developed during his training with Inferno, Elysium, and herself back in the elemental nations. It was a combination of the three energy her yoki, Elysium, and Inferno's energy, combined with his own unique chakra. But he has yet to fully master said technique. It wasn't because Naruto wasn't training and mastering that technique. There are several factors preventing him from doing so. One of those factors is the energy. Kurumi's yin yoki or chakra has yet to be fully restored, creating an imbalance between the three energies since the technique requires a level of balance between his and their energy. Though he could use the technique, he can't use it to its full potential making it incomplete from the desired result. And in addition to that problem, he wants to master using my yoki. Sai I love him, I really do. But sometimes he can be annoying, surprising considering how level-headed and calm he is. That was the other reason. Due to his condition, ADHD, her blonde would not take time to master just one technique. No, he prefers mastering almost all the techniques at his disposal. Sure he has shadow clones, but he would sometimes forget the value in the term one step at a time. Yet it hasn't become a problem for him, considering how perceptive he is to every little detail, such as in the bedroom. The nine-tailed muse recalled her many activities with him, causing her to drool slightly. In a way this was good, not the sex part, but his perception. It helps him in mastering multiple things at once, and this allows him to see or check every detail about the technique he's trying to master, such as its weaknesses, strengths, effectiveness, damage, advantages, disadvantages, ups, and its downs. An example was when he developed one of his strongest jutsu, the Fudin, Resenshuriken, Wind Release, Spiraling Shuriken, a devastating technique that damages anyone who is unfortunate enough to get caught in it. The technique creates countless microscopic wind blades that severely damage the body on a cellular level. The wind blades sever all nerve channels in the body, leaving the target unable to move after being struck. 
the damage cannot be repaired by any form of healing technique whatsoever. The technique is an all-range technique, after Naruto trained with it, making it a devastating technique on the battlefield as it covers all ranges, hard to dodge since it can expand rapidly ensuring the target does not escape. The technique can also be used with his other elemental affinity for multiple usage and combos. But the disadvantage of the technique it required a great deal of chakra to perform, and the limit in performing the technique, using his own chakra, can leave Naruto extremely fatigued. It requires a good deal more chakra to both create and then throw it and the technique damages his arm. So the technique is one of the main technique is trying to fully master and remove any sort of drawbacks, well if can master that then maybe he can remove some of its drawback and it could help him master my Yoki, Kurumi thought before closing her eyes for a beauty nap. Hey she knows she's drop dead gorgeous and sexy, but there is a lot of difficulty in maintaining such appearance, so a nap here and there helps a lot. After Naruto pay for the use of the cabin he observed as Moxie and Sally were chatting, while Percy was on the offside and seems to be in deep thought, that's not good, he thought before walking towards his friend. Penny for your thought, Naruto asked from behind, surprising the sea green eyed teen. Don't do that, he said a little annoyed and peeved. Sorry, but I couldn't help but notice you were in deep thought, what is it? What's bothering you, Percy Jackson? Of course, Naruto knew what it could be, but he wanted Percy to tell him himself, since this would tell if he trust him or not. You know what's bothering me, don't act that you don't know. The black haired teen snap at the bond haired Jinchuriki, who remained calm as always. It's impossible, you of all people, what am I saying? Percy suddenly let out a hollowed chuckle. You're Naruto Uzumaki, someone who isn't bothered by everything. Naruto could see the stress that Percy built up over the month is finally surfacing itself, and he noticed how the water is reacting to his emotional distress. The guy that everyone respected and feared, the guy who everyone looked up to and envied. Why I thought you would be bothered or even feel slightly frustrated, scared, or even stress is beyond me. Percy added bitterly. He considered the blonde his friend, but back then when he didn't know anything about Naruto or even interacted with him. Percy, like everyone else, was jealous of Naruto. Everything seemed to come easy for him, from his grades to his standing with the staff and students of the school. Heck everyone even made a pedestal of Naruto to compare on how they measured up to him which sadly no one could even come close to half. Naruto posses what everyone wanted. Money, adoration, respect, smarts, looks, and a gorgeous and loving girlfriend. And he made it out like it was nothing or it was insignificant to him, like it was expected or something. Of course the blonde didn't know or maybe he did and didn't bother to care about that fact. It was as if some sadistic being sent the blonde just to mock them about their statues or lack thereof and Percy hated him for that, but after getting to know the blonde he knew he couldn't, how could he? When Naruto wasn't even from their world, this was any other day for a shinobi dealing with life and death situation or even dealing with something simple as school and a social life. Percy don't sell yourself short or even thing of comparing yourself to me. You're you and I am me, everyone is unique in their own way and comparing yourself to anyone is showing how weak and pathetic you are, Naruto started calmly. He didn't need to have mind reading powers to know what Percy was saying, he knew how the sea green eye felt about him, him and everyone else at school. Take for example those people who follow the trend of today, those people who try to change their appearance to be accepted or even acknowledged, to make themselves beautiful or handsome as society deems it, for me they are all pathetic or simple low. For me beauty is what is inside you and who you are, if you can't accept yourself then you can never be beautiful or handsome. To find something that fits perfectly for society, when you can't even fit in yourselves is a shallow notion. So Percy don't try to compare yourself to me, you're you and I am me, we are both different and unique. You may have qualities that I don't unique to only you and same goes for me, no matter how small or large it is still something that you have and only will have, he finished. That what do I have that you don't? Percy asks confused on what does he has that the blonde doesn't have, because it seems he has everything that everyone wanted. A mother, a true mother, Percy I never knew my mother only the nightmare of the memory when I saw both, her and my father, of them killed when I was an infant a newborn. Percy was shocked by that statement. Naruto smiled sadly. Yes, my first memory of my parent was them being impaled and their loving words as they slowly die. At first I thought it was some kind of genjutsu or even a nightmare, but the longer I thought about it, how could anyone conjure up something like that? Or how could I imagine something like that? 
Hey, it wasn't after and even that I found out that it wasn't a nightmare or even a genjutsu as I hoped, but a memory of when I was an infant. This is why I consider my photographic memory both a blessing and a curse as it records everything, even things I wish to forget, he said, his facial expression and voice sounded emotionless, hollowed, and dejected. I'm sorry, Percy said looking down in shame for his insensitivity. Naruto shook his head, don't apologies, when you didn't know, two I stated the facts, and three it was my choice to tell you, he simply said. Now Percy, list to what I have to say okay said teen nodded i know you feel stress everything that has happened within just a few months been a hell of a ride first with miss dodds second finding out about my ability third is being chased down by something unknown it's all stressful and any sane person would be stress but i need you to calm down percy and be strong not for me or for you but for your mother i know that you think she's isn't all bothered by this in truth she's just putting on a brave face for you she is scared out of her mind and i can sense that so take in some air, calm your raging heart, and give your mom a reassuring hug got it, Percy nodded and did as instructed, inhaling and exhaling the black haired teen felt himself calming down, especially this close to the water he felt a peach and the raging storm inside of him calm down. Percy promptly stood up and made his way towards his mother, once he reached her the sea green eyed teen pulled his mother into a hug. Naruto smiled and saw his partner walk up to him, so you talk to him or something, she asks knowing the answer already. I assume you did too, after all when it comes to people you're the best at handling them Mox. He said as Moxie sat beside him and lay her head on his shoulder. Well I figure she needed help with everything that has happened to her in the last few hours, she said revealing in her secret love's warmth. Like Naruto, she too had a moment, as she put it, with Sally Jackson who kept up a brave face which honestly impresses the brown-haired sadist since most women this days were some of the reason why men looks down upon her gender one example fangirls, so Moxie decided to help the mother out by talking with Brunette. So where is Grover, Naruto asked curious to where the Percy's guardian satyr. Probably being a hippie and dry humping a three or something, is her reply, which translates to he's taking a look around the forest for a possible escape route or make sure we weren't followed. This was Moxie's way of making sure anyone who would try to eavesdrop confuse in her own code's language or cipher and the only Naruto could translate and understand her coded messages or words, since she taught him. Naruto didn't understand how or even why she considers it a form of coded message or a cipher, but he didn't question her thought processes, if he tried he would gain a monumental headache. Women are confusing like that and will forever be an eternal mystery. I'll have some shadow clones place an alarm seal and a trap seal and have them call Grover back since it's almost night time and dinner approaches I'll prepare our meal. Moxie lick her lip, not in lust, but in anticipation of Naruto's cooking, which is surprising considering most guys don't cook, only a few that did not have ulterior motives as to why they learn how to cook in the first place. While Naruto was preparing dinner, Sally and Percy were enjoying a long overdue mother and son bonding time. Moxie relaxing wearing a red one-piece bikini with a rather revealing cleavage hole and Grover was taking a nap leaning on a large tree, well at least they aren't tense, the blonde thought. Being tense in the battlefield or on a mission would spell disaster, as it would hinder the thought process. Sure it puts you on guard, but a calm mind can easily weather down any storms and it helps to think straight during life and death situation, so for Naruto being tense was something he is against and would rather have his allies be relaxed, but not too relaxed and ready. Naruto's mind began to drift off a bit, something that has been recurring for the past week, to a specific even during his first three months in this new world. The blonde brush it off as a failed experiment of a jutsu he was working on, believing that it was a dream, considering how tired he was after training, with his stamina that is saying something. The jutsu was simple he tried to separate his subconscious from his body, it is similar to the Yamanaka clan Shintenshin no jutsu, mind-body switch technique. A jutsu was that original use for intelligence gathering. This would allow the user to spy on the target's mind allowing him or her to learn everything the target knows and control their body for a short period of time, but the downside is that it would leave their body defenseless and open for attack. Luckily for Naruto he didn't have to worry about his mind and body from being taken over or jack, since his inside companion wouldn't allow it, especially Elysium since she is very protective of the bond wielder. The jutsu would allow Naruto in the even he is somehow captured and lead a search team, most likely Moxie to find his body using the connection to his mind. It came as an inspiration he has on a movie he watch, 
Sad part is he couldn't recall if it was a movie or the title of it. He tried to but instead he got this weird dream, well maybe it wasn't weird considering the dream had its pleasant moments, but it was weird that his mind could conjure up such events and people. But now he wonder if it was more than just a dream, if it is not a dream and I somehow managed to pull off something impossible then I hope they are alive, especially the young one, he hoped. Naruto was rather fond of the little one, going so far as considering her as his little sister in all but blood, and was the only one who saw his now true form, which happened after he regained the other half of Kurumi's yoki chakra. Kurumi said it was a side effect from her yoki entering his body. The blonde was first felt weird, but quickly shook it off considering the benefits. Increased strength, reflexes, chakra, and stamina. Plus it made you much more desirable, hot, and sexy. Kayubi's voice suddenly rang out. I thought I cut the connection off, Naruto mentally questioned. You did but I decided to link it, now back to the topic of your true form, before it could go any further Naruto decided to cut the link as he knew where this was heading, since on that day when he gained his new, well, body it was the day his lost his virginity, well mentally anyways. Kusumi has manipulated his emotions since he wasn't used to his new body, which lead him to pounce her and ravage her senseless, Ah, oh, good times, good time and that was rude of you to cut me off Naruto-kun. The nine tails whined with a cute, sexy pout on her face, how he knew, cause he could easily see her doing that. Also it wasn't like you didn't enjoy it you beast, she purred out in a sultry tone, recalling that event when both of them rutted like bunnies in the heat. Heck she didn't have to give Naruto any sort of pointers as his instincts seemed to guide him every step of the way. How you run through me so thoroughly, like you've been doing it for years. Must be because you were in raise in the brothel and by the owner herself Fufu. She giggled on the last part and really did wonder if Lilith gave Naruto some tip and advice on how to properly pleasure a woman. At the blonde's silence Kurumi began to laugh out loud. So she did, didn't she haha? Well if we ever get the chance to meet her again and when I'm out of the seal I'll thank her for making you such an expert, she said. It was when his adopted mother, Lilith, decided to give him the talk, which is one of the most dreaded experience of his young life and followed by her lesson on seduction and pleasure. Such as how to resist and how to seduce, the pleasure points in the human body specifically women, and the reason why it is important for him to learn that topic. One so he could resist being seduced into being captured, since almost all information gathering or assassination involved seducing your target to lower their guard which majority of those targets were males. Second so he could turn it around on his would-be seductress and make her putty in his hand while getting information out of her and third so he could satisfy his girlfriends or wife, wives. Such as the life of a ninja and how their world was, it wasn't a much of a hot topic for Kunoichi since they still have their pride as woman, but a mission is mission and they are duty bound to do so. But Naruto would never take advantage of any woman, enemy or not, he would just have them flustered enough to be distracted and knock them out. Well that aside, it could be a possibility that you may have done just that. You do realize what you're implying correct? plus I don't know if it was an actuality or something that my mind came up with. It is not a question if it was real or not Naruto-kun, it is a question on how much you recall, and be honest Naruto-kun do you really think something weird as that is not possible considering your luck it could be real and you did manage to pull off something no one in your original world has ever done. Point, and admittedly bits and pieces only, considering the memory time lapse. Yes, considering how far your subconscious went, it would be surprising if you managed to retain all of it, but my theory is that it is the same with dreams, you can't recall how a dream starts you just starts and all the details of the dream. It's possible, though why'd I recall her, the little one, more? Simple she's the most important part of the memory same with dreams, since the only part of the dream anyone can recall or remember is the important parts of the dream itself, and from your memories the two of you did bond. On another note at least you managed to get the hang in using your yin release yin release or darkness release, a jutsu that governs the imagination and illusion. I hope so, was all Naruto said before dismissing her in favor of cooking grilled steak, basil oregano t-bone steaks, squash and barley salad with balsamic vinaigrette for Grover, since Naruto could tell the Caucasian teen is a vegetarian. Taking the necessary ingredients from his food storage scroll, Naruto expertly work on both dishes, all the while keeping his sense sharp and his guard up just in case. The traps should give us enough time to make an escape, he thought. The smell of Naruto's cooking quickly attracted their attention instantly. That smell great foxy? 
Moxie complimented while putting on some black skinny jeans and a jacket. The other nodded in agreement with the brown-haired beauty making the blonde slightly chuckle. Which was the first for both Grover and Percy knowing how serious the blonde is all the time. So they were surprised when they heard him chuckle much less see a small smile on his otherwise serious, calculative, and intimidating face. Why thank you Moxie, here a basil oregano tea bone steak for the three of you and a squash and barely salad with balsamic vinaigrette for Grover enjoy, Naruto said handing them out their meal, while he finish up in cooking some fries and his favorite meal ramen. Let it be known that before any other meal ramen always comes first and those who wonder why the blonde has an obsession and addiction to ramen being his first real actual and non-poisoned food. Naruto summon another set of clones to act as guards and patrol the area ordering them to dispel at the first sign of trouble, and set up a few more traps around strategic location he anticipate the enemy, no matter how dumb, would enter. All the while securing a quick exit route that would get them enough time to make some distance towards the camp. Planning for any kind of scenario no matter how small or distance it is should always be planned down to a T and ahead of time. It's good to anticipate your opponent's movements or the moves they make that's a sound plan, but, predicting your opponent's moves or movements before they even make it now that's a plan. It is the reason why Naruto hasn't lost a single fight, sure learning from your losses is a good thing, depending on who you ask, but in life and death situation there can be no room for error. Heck dropping your guard for just a second could and can be fatal, the blonde learned that when he trusted someone, before he meet Lilith, and got branded with a brandying iron. Naruto considered that a loss since he allowed himself to be fooled and it cost him another birthday and another part of his psyche, heck if it wasn't for him meeting Lilith he sure he would have gone insane and ripped the seal off, or planted enough explosive around the village to fully level the place, he didn't know where he got his murderous tendencies from. This place is quite nice, Naruto started before slurping down on some of his ramen while sitting down in front of a warm campfire that the blonde made. Sally nodded to this. Yes it quite is, she said fondly with a reminiscing smile. I'm guessing this is where you meet Percy's dad, the blonde continued and Sally nodded, flashes of memories of the time when she first meet her son's father causing her smile to grow and a hint of pink to appear on her cheeks, though Percy had a distant look on his face and the blonde could tell what he was thinking of, aside from that i can see why you two like coming here the beach area a nice view of the ocean a warm and relaxing breeze perfect for warming up some marshmallows over a campfire sounds perfect if you ask me naruto added pointing out the things that made this place wonderful for the two jacksons both mother and son smiled at naruto's words yeah this place has that certain effect better than most places we hunker down naruto moxie said before taking a bite of her food her partner nodded with a slight chuckle. If I can ask, what do the two of you do exactly? Sally asks. We're mercenaries, in a sense, but unlike your typical mercenaries we take up mission called contracts ranging from espionage, assassination, support, escort, retrieval, rescue, etc. Our clients or contractors are people from the government, foreign or state, and anyone with enough money to set up a contract. The team is made up of five members not counting the handler which is yours truly, with specific set of skills called specialists such as medic, combat, strategist, range, and engineering, but Foxy here is a jack of all trade and myself included making up a two-member team, Moxie explained in the most simplest of terms so they could understand. But ain't that dangerous with just the two of you, Sally said with genuine concern for the two. It was frustrating at times, well was being the word, until I discovered Naruto here is every girl's wet dream come true I. E he can make solid clones of himself, like the one standing guard and patrolling the area right now. Moxie pointed to one of the nearby tree and the branch of said tree was a Naruto clone standing guard. The three, Sally Grover, and Percy, blush at Moxie's implication more so with Sally having read a certain orange book that she would never admit that she has or that it was tucked away in her bag. Ah my very own one man harem fufu. Moxie giggled out with a slight droll going down her lip before wiping it away. Naruto shook his head at his partner's antics, it was on one particular mission that I had to reveal my ability to Moxie. You see our contractor decided to pull a fast one on us and tried to kill us for some rare diamonds, he said nonchalantly. The blonde didn't want to go into details about his professional life or work, I won't go into details about the mission. It was supposed to be a simple supply retrieval mission of illegal drugs and the company did check out clean, but the guy who hired us wasn't. 
Long story short we found the supposed drugs which turns out to be diamonds that would catch a hefty price at the black market. Our client tried to kill us with a haze of bullets, me using Indoden Jutsu or Earth Release technique to block all the bullets, and use said Jutsu to create Earth Spears impale our former client and his goons to the wall. He finished and finished another set of ramen. Sally, Percy, and Grover blink and even check their eyes to make sure they weren't seeing things, since there were ten empty bowls. H. How? Percy asks in disbelief. How what, Percy? How could you finish ten bowls of ramen while you were talking? There must be something wrong with your eyes, since I've already finished my twelve bowl of ramen. Indeed, there were an additional two empty bowls. It seems at the time when all three of them blink and cleared their eyes the blonde somehow finished his ramen making them wonder just what kind of stomach does the blonde have? I suggest you three stop thinking about it before you have a massive headache, just file this on the many odd things Naruto here does, Moxie said deciding to save them the trouble and the headache. She should know it happened to her when she decided to treat her blonde partner to his favorite meal. Let's just say her purse suffered greatly because of that and even with the security cams weren't able to capture just how Naruto finished three bowls of ramen in a blink of an eye literally in a blink of an eye. Ah the ramen trick never gets old, the nine-tailed demoness voice rang out. Trick? Kurumi I have no idea what you're talking about, I would never desecrate the sacredness of ramen which such childish things Naruto shoot back vehemently. Forgive me Naru-kun for my words against your sacred food, she said masking the sarcasm in her voice, though if Naruto could look into his mindscape he would have seen an amused smile on her face. You are forgiven then, just make sure it does not happen again he said before cutting their mental link. What people didn't know is Naruto discreetly placed a genjutsu that would disorient a person's sense of time, from the time a person's blink to the time they reopen their eyelids. This also works even if people would stare at him the genjutsu would cause them to blink, for what appeared to be a second, is actually a minute. The blonde was inspired to create this genjutsu from a movie he watched titled Inception. Inside Naruto Mindscape Kurumi has a smirk on her face. Cuckoo deceitful as a fox good Naru-kun, very good, she said with an evil glint in her eyes before noticing the glare being sent her way by Elysium. Before you say anything you virgin prude, deceiving and misdirecting your opponent is a vital component in making any competent plans and in the battlefield, she smirked as her statement shut the blonde up. Inferno sighs relive that he didn't have to go through another argument between the two ladies. Seriously you would think they were twins or something with how much the two argued on a daily basis. It would always involve their master and he would always try to break them up, the word try, the two would either blast him or flat out ignore him, I wonder if there are two people who argues as much as these two, somewhere in raven black, sometimes auburn, haired woman with silver eyes and a blonde with bright blue eyes sneeze causing the lateral to spill his drink on a black-haired beauty wearing a strapless dress causing her to slap him before storming out and the former to miss her target. Someone must be talking about me, they thought in, oblivious, unison. Must be some hot babe talking about me he, the blonde thought with a grin on his face. Must be my idiot brother, which reminds me I never did get him back from almost seducing one of my hunters, turning him into a pincushion should be an appropriate punishment staring with his jewel area, the silvered eyed woman thought. Back with Naruto and the group, the blonde has his eyes slightly narrow at his black haired friend when he asks about his father, it had to happen sooner or later, both Moxie and Naruto thought. Moxie being an accomplished psychologist and Naruto being able to sense emotion and could read people like an open book, they've anticipated something like this to happen. He was kind, tall, handsome, and powerful, but he very gentle and humble too. You have his beautiful green eyes and his hair along with some of his traits I really wish he could have seen you I'm sure he would be so proud. She answered fondly recalling her godly, literally, lover with a loving smile on her face. How old was I, when he left? Percy asked pushing for more answers. He wanted, no, he needed to know when his father left him. Sally bite down on her lips and her expression turned to one of sadness, he was only with me for one summer Percy. It was right here when we spent our time together, something that I will always cherish, she said this time with a sad smile. But he knew me as a baby right? He asks in a hopeful tone. Sally sadly shook her head, no, honey, he knew I was expecting a baby, but he never saw you. He had to leave before you were born.
Percy was about to ask what was so important for him to abruptly leave like that or he would have resorted in saying his father just didn't want to take responsibility for knocking up his mom, but a calming feeling wash over him like a tidal wave and a hand was on his shoulder. The sea green eyed teen turned his head to his right side and saw Naruto. Percy it could be very well be what you were thinking of. That he didn't want to take responsibility, or there could have been a reason for him to leave, but don't dwell on that wise and remember you have a very loving mother, who went the extra mile to protect you and shield you from monsters by marrying A.S., beside it's his lost for missing out on getting to know a good person like you my friend. Percy nodded feeling his anger and hatred vanish under the calming feeling he felt and by his blonde friend's words. Sally smiled and silently thanks the bond for being her son's friend, how about you Naruto, what was your parents like? she asks wanting to know more about her son's friend. I never knew my parents since I was an orphan, he said, his voice void of any sort of emotion. Was meaning someone adopted you, right? Yes and no. His answer left the three of them, since they didn't know about his past, confused. Yes in a sense I was adopted, no since I wasn't properly adopted considering the caretaker kicked me out when I was five years old, he said in a cold icy tone making them shiver. I'm sorry for bringing up such bad memories. Naruto shook his head. It's fine you didn't know and I know you wanted to know more about your friend's son. He said in a soft tone. Still, and I'll say it again it's fine, beside it just made me recall the time when I met my adopted mother Lilith. He said while tending to the flame, making Grover think back on how similar it was to a young girl stoking next to the camp's own hearth and tending to it he saw that one time. She taught me how to read, write, proper etiquette, and educate me. To other people they would be surprised considering her profession, he said. Which is? Percy asks in curiosity. She's the owner of a well-known brothel, strip clubs, and other business around the red light district where I grew up. Naruto further explained Lilith's personality and his interaction with her girls and the people of the red light. It seems you can't really judge a book by its cover, Sally, Percy, and Grover thought, oblivious that the other was thinking of the same thing. Well I'm for one am glad that you were surrounded by such pleasant people, despite their profession, Sally said with a nod of approval. Percy nodded as well, he wasn't really the overly judging type, preferring to judge a person by their action and personality instead of their appearance or what other people thinks of them, I'm happy for you Naruto, he said along with Grover, the two look at each other before laughing slightly both happy that their friend lived a good life. Naruto smiled a bit but it masked the pained memory that he recalled prior before meeting Lilith, no I do not want to trouble them with my past, he thought firmly. How about you Moxie? Sally asks her fellow brunette. Well nothing much, grew up in the southern farmland. My dad was the town mayor and he was too busy with his work to even notice me. Hell the only time he did is when I did something illegal, shows what he knows, Moxie said mumbling at the last part with venom. Naruto who knew about her past, place his arm around her brining her close to him. Thanks sugar, she said while snuggling close to him. As I was saying, my dad wasn't what you called an honest man. His operation and dealings you can compare it to the mafia, if he can't get you with his looks or money, he'll get you in another way, you can imagine just how he got to be a mayor. So when I did something that would put him in a bad light or would somehow expose his illegal operation, he would either hit me or lock me in my room. I grew tired of it and when the opportunity came for me to escape I ran with little money he gave me or what I've stolen. She started losing a bit of control over her emotion as she visibly clenched her fist to a point that her nails nearly dug into her skin. Nearly if it wasn't for her blonde crush, I arrive here at New York City and I was almost out of cash, so I got a gig being an announcer for an underground fight club here in New York and on occasion got my hands a little dirty, but hey you got to do whatever it takes to survive. Though I was never without help as crazy as it sounds I would hear this faint voice in my head guiding me to certain people who would be useful for my survival. Harsh as it sounds you don't survive or live another day without getting your hands dirty. She stopped to see their reaction. When she saw they weren't negatively judging her she continued. I got involved with certain man who knew their way around, did something that I wasn't proud of but I won't deny I did it to survive or at least live to see the sun rise. They helped me or rather thought me the tools of the trade, so to speak, I've learned certain skills that would otherwise been deemed illegal by today's standards, but I also learned some legal skills. Such as mechanics, computer programming, psychology, yes being able to read a person is a very useful skill and I did actually graduated top of my class in fact at Harvard University, and law same school. But as I went on I got bored, 
I mean all this skill and no fun way to apply it. It wasn't until I overheard some random group talk about the contract, it caught my interest, so I tracked down to where this contract mission are being hand out and grab an associate of mine and accepted a D-grade job. At first it was fun but it soon turned boring and my party, ex-partner, was against taking high risk mission and storm out on me, I was stumped until Sugar here walk in on me and overheard about our discussion, he showed me a bit of his skills and long story short he and I been partners ever since. Moxie finished, the left some parts out since she has yet to trust the three of them unlike how she trusts Naruto. I won't judge my son's friend since I would have done the same if it would ensure that my son would live and you help me Moxie so if you need a female friend, then I'm here for you. Sally said, Moxie smiled and nodded towards her fellow brunette. Same with me and Grover, that's right if you need a friend we're here for you. Thanks, she said to her, well her two new friends. They made chatted until it was night time and at the end of it. Percy asked if Sally what are they were going to do about school since Percy would need to find a new school. Naruto, Moxie, and Grover silently excused themselves to give the two privacy knowing this is between the mother and son. Me and Moxie will take first watch and even if either or both of us doze off, somehow, my clones would only need to dispel to alert me at the first sign of trouble. Grover you stay close to Percy and his mom, since it is your job. Grover nodded following the blonde's orders. Naruto leaned up against a tree and felt himself at peace underneath the moon's gaze and the darkness around him. Most people would choose to remain in the light, to bask under the sun's rays and the warmth it provide, but not for me. I prefer the moon over the sun, I prefer the cool, relaxing, and tranquility it provides me under the cover of darkness. The darkness, it is where I thrive in, it is where I'm at my most dangerous. Beside you can't stare at the sun without losing your eyesight as opposed to the modesty of the moon. You can truly admire the simple yet elegance of the moon's beauty, he thought to himself. It may have been strange to others, but not for Naruto. For him the darkness was like his blanket that provided him warmth and comfort while the moon was his guardian, lighting a path for him in his time of need. Let's say a mob was after him, he couldn't hide or escape during the day since they would easily spot him. Unlike when it was at night when the moon would provide little to no light at all Naruto can use the moon as a guide to find a hiding spot and the darkness would obscure where he was hiding. That and the fact that shinobis and kunoichi operate within the shadows and in darkness to accomplish their missions such as espionage, stealth, or assassination. Not that he disliked the sun or anything like that, he just found it somewhat annoying at times is all. What are you thinking about Naruto? Hearing his partner's voice snaps him out of his thought and turn to meet her gaze. Nothing, just admiring the moon and relaxing under the blanket of the night, he simply said getting a giggle from the brown-haired beauty. I should have known, knowing you, if I hadn't snapped you out of it you would have stared at the moon till it sets, she said teases. He, maybe but clones would snap me out, Naruto replied. A moment of silence befall the couple before Moxie broke the silence, what do you think our chances are, she asks. Worried? Moxie snorted at that. Me? Worried? Hardly, I'm just asking our chances. We have two civilians and a goat boy, I don't know how well they perform under pressure, she said with a subtle innuendo. Naruto sighed. I won't say anything, since I don't know what we are dealing with. I can only plan with what little, or lack thereof, information. But if my assumption is correct on just who Percy's godly parent is, then the traps I set should buy us enough time to escape and make it to camp, hopefully, he said. Not so sure Mr. Strategist, there is always a chance no matter how small that something wrong could happen, I'm not a fool to think that everything will go accordingly. Yeah all we can do is hope for the best, time skip midnight. You don't have to do this, you can still come with me, you and Zabuza both. I can talk to the old man to give the both of you a place in Konoha. Naruto cried out to a mask individual in front of him, this mask person being the person he loves and pained him for having to fight her. Sadly she shook her head, I'm sorry Naruto, you know the reason why I, we can't accept the offer, she said holding up several senbon between her fingertips. It doesn't have to be this way, please I don't want to fight you h. Naruto's eyes snap open as one of his traps was triggered and cause a large explosion, we must have doze off, Moxie said also being woken up by the sound of Naruto's trap. The blonde stumbled back for a bit as he was assaulted by the memory of his clones, undead soldiers. I don't have time to wonder about that, 
he thought and quickly told Moxie to go fetch their other companion. Several other explosion can be heard as it was triggered by who or whatever forces were against them. Naruto what's going on? Sally asks frantically. I've placed several traps around this location in case anyone or anything would try to ambush us, and looks like I'm correct. Now get in, he ordered before turning to his partner. Moxie stay at the back and cover our six. Moxie nodded and got into the back of Naruto's car. Everyone hold on this is going to be a bumpy ride, Naruto warned before driving off like a madman. Taking the path the blonde assumed would get them a good amount of distance away from Montauk, he drove past several trees and into the main road, disregarding the speed limit he stomped his foot on the gas pedal and drove. What's happening Naruto, who is after us? Percy asks. Some undead soldiers with gun, which sound like a cheesy 80s or 70s horror film but yeah, and large bull is leading them, Grover do you know anything about this? He said before asking the satyr, who turned ashen at the mention of what was after them. Wait a large bull you mean a? Uh? Before Percy could finish his mother cut him off, don't mention its name Percy, names hold power. She chastised. Normally Percy would have questioned it for being a myth, but after seeing what his blonde friend can do and his interaction with Miss Dodds, the sea green eyed teen knew this was real and Pacifi's son was really after them. Moxie is anyone one following us? Naruto asks out. No, yes, they're behind us, Moxie said as she started firing with her special sniper rifle Naruto made called Share Amy. Naruto made this rifle for her as a gift on her birthday with the medal that was given to him by his father a few months ago, and she showed her appreciation by. Well let just say the things she did to show her appreciation were beyond anything the porn industry could possibly think of. Crap, keep your head down, Naruto ordered as he swerved to the left avoiding a round from a rocket launcher. Um, not to alarm anyone but there is a black cloud after us as well, Moxie said, switching to a different rounds of ammo as the normal round she used weren't effective. Like her sniper rifle. Naruto made use of the special metal he had to make this particular 50 cal ammo that no normal weapon could possibly handle. Hellhounds. Oh gods why, Grover cried out in fear. Just peachy, Naruto muttered under his breath. Sally I need you to take the wheel and drive us to that camp. Percy's mom nodded and carefully took the wheel. Now Sally was in the driver's seat and Naruto was on the passenger seat. Summoning his bow. Naruto rolled the widows down and moved half of his body outside of the car. Don't worry about keeping it steady, just drive, he reassured the brunette. Lining up his chute, Naruto pulled back on a strong draw weight, for high damage and a long range, and since him and Moxie were dealing with mythical or supernatural creature, the blonde decided to use his chakra arrow. The chakra arrow like his Rasengan is pure chakra manipulation and like his Rasengan, Naruto mastered it to a point that he could instantly form it. And unlike normal arrows, he didn't need to take into account how gravity or the wind would hinder his shoot, since it's basically weightless and could cut through even a category F5 tornado on medium draw weight. That and he doesn't need to worry about running out of arrows, unless if he's fully drained that is. Keeping his breath light and steady, to Naruto everything around him had gone into silence and was focused solely on his target. He exhaled slowly before letting his arrow slice through the very air itself. If anyone could see it, they would have thought someone fired off a laser gun like in those sci-fi movies they've watched. Naruto's chakra arrow hit its mark in between the eyes of a hellhound, killing it in an instant. Nice shoot sugar. Moxie complimented before firing another round, killing another two undead soldier and lighting them up on fire. Naruto placed two special seals when he made Moxie's favorite toy, as she calls it, the first is a seal that would imbue the rifle with an elemental affinity, in this case fire, and the second seal was a chakra generator that stored his potent chakra. The second seal would allow the first seal to activate and coat the bullet with the fire affinity upon leaving the chamber of the gun. Moxie had questioned the potential of seals with Naruto, stating that it could outpace or outmatch modern technology or anything else for that matter. Naruto simply replied that seal are limitless depending on the person's imagination which was why his clan was both feared and envied, to a point that three of the five major nations would band together to eradicate his clan. The blonde Jinchuriki pay her no mind his focus was solely on his target, killing said target, and make sure his friends are safe. The blonde fired off three chakra arrow in quick succession, hitting its specific target with deadly consistency of headshots. One undead managed to fire another rocket, before Moxie killed it, shit, 
she mentally cursed as she ran out of ammo and pulled out her sidearm, pistol, and fired. The force of the explosion caused Sally to swerve violently to the left side, causing Naruto to be thrown out of the car. Naruto! They shouted, aside from Moxie. The blonde did a mid-air flip before landing a ninja dash back towards the car, using the other cars on the road to close the distance between him and his car. Sorry about that. Moxie said knowing full well Naruto would be fine and could easily catch up with them. Naruto nodded and stayed on the roof of the car and glued himself on top with his chakra, before resuming and killing his targets. Naruto and Moxie continue proving cover fire, for what seems like hours until they drove past a large strawberry farm that had a large wooden that looked darkened and had a large picket sign that said pick your own strawberries. We are nearly there, they heard Sally and Grover say. WW where AA are we going? Percy managed to ask in his panic and adrenaline edge state. The summer camp one told you about, Sally choke out trying to fight back the tears. The place you said you didn't want me to go, Percy said making Moxie almost smack the kind on the head knowing that was just going to make Sally feel bad, but couldn't since she was busy with covering their asses. Please, dear this is hard enough. Try to understand. You, Moxie, and Naruto are in danger, his mother begged. Yes, especially since the thread was cut, Grover added ominously. Why? What does a thread some old lady cut has to do with anything? Percy asked. Moxie sighed. Didn't you pay attention to your, never mind, she started not taking her eyes of her target. If we go about everything we know now, such as the hellhounds, the undead soldier, the large bull, and Grover being a goat boy then we can associate this with Greek mythology. And those three old ladies are what you called the fates. To make it short when they cut the yarn, that means someone is going to die and that somebody is possibly either of us. Moxie explained before taking out another undead soldier. Exactly. Grover said confirming Moxie's words. The fact they appeared in front of you, I mean someone, then that means someone is going to die, he finished. Whoa, you said you? Percy said freaking out even more. No I didn't, I said someone, Grover argued back. Ladies stop bickering before I decide to slap your faces, Moxie hissed out. Sally pulled the wheel hard to the right narrowly missing a large figure that suddenly appeared. But this action caused Moxie to miss her target and said target fired a missile, hitting the left side of the road. Sally lost control of the car making it flip over, Naruto jump off the roof of the car as it spun in mid-air before landing. Everyone get out of the car now. Naruto bark out firing of multiple chakra arrows to give them time to get out of the downed car. Naruto, Grover is unconscious. Percy shouted. Great, Naruto groaned and summoned a shadow clone to carry the unconscious satyr, who mumbled something about food. We need to reach that giant tree on top of the hill. Sally said point at a large pine tree that towered over all the other trees. Head straight for it and don't stop. Get over the hill and you'll see a big farmhouse down in the valley. Just run and don't look back. Yell for help. Don't stop until you reach the door. Guys go on ahead, all them back. Naruto said shocking the group and saw they were about to protest until Naruto shot a rocket round with his arrow. We don't have time to argue, I'll be fine just go, Naruto shouted at the last part firmly. Common, Moxie said with a bit of reluctance but knew Naruto can handle himself, you better come back to me, I mean us, she said before leaving. Inferno, Elysium it's time, Naruto mentally said, yes Naruto-sama. There was a brief flash of light before it dissipates leaving his two main weapon, Soul Edge on his right and Soul Calibre on his left both in their scythe forms. Just as a pack of hellhounds and undead soldiers surrounded him. It was a standstill, no one seemed to move a single muscle or even twitch, until a roar from a hellhound as it charged towards the blonde, who stood his ground and simply sidestep at the last minute before slicing the hound in two. Next, he said his expression unreadable and his eyes were overshadowed by his bangs, but if looked closely once could see his eyes were half-lid as if he was bored. Several undead soldier fired at the blonde and three threw their grenades at him, the blonde simply dodged out of the way and managed to deflect on grenade back towards the group, the grenade exploded killing the group of undead, though some managed to survive, but not before Naruto was suddenly in front of them and sliced them in a horizontal slash. Naruto-sama remember you have to finish them off quickly, Elysium reminded as her master dodge a volley of bullets and decapitate two hellhound before rushing a group of undead soldiers as they reloaded, 
Slicing their heads off, I know, he said before connecting his dual scythe together and slice two undead soldiers and thrust Soul Edge forwards, piercing the head of the third undead soldier. He quickly unhinged his two scythes and used it to black two hellhound and push them back, while the two were in mid-air Naruto quickly attacked the two hellhound and sliced them with both his scythes. He then dodges several rockets aim at him and quickly threw both his scythes at the undead soldiers killing them before they could reload and as quickly as he threw his weapon both weapons returned to him like a boomerang. The rest of the undead soldiers fired another valley of bullets, but what happened next surprised them. The blonde had connected his scythes together with both ends pointing forwards and started to deflect all the bullets that were fired at him, swinging his scythes at nearly impossibly speeds becoming almost a blur, good thing I've studied the Hyuga's variation of Kaden, Revolving Heaven, he thought. Terapoto no Surashu, teleportation slash, in an instant Naruto was in front of several undead soldiers taking cover behind several three, he killed the first one before he spun his scythe around in a full circular arch finishing off the rest of the undead soldiers. The blonde turned to a charging hellhound and horizontally slicing it in half and continued to brutally kill the rest till none remain. Inside his mindscape Kurumi had a lewd smile at the carnage her destined maid displayed in front of her. Such brutal efficiency fitting for a demon like yourself Koi, she gleefully said. It was only in the battlefield where she would see Naruto's darker side. An artist at the art of killing and execution, an example is when Naruto had stabbed one undead soldier in the neck with both his scythe before he flips over brutally removing its head in a gory decapitation. Another is when he stab another undead soldier but instead of removing its head, he jumps behind the undead solitaire, flips the body over and used it to hammer a hellhound into the ground. After this I'm definitely going to drag him into his mindscape and ride him until we both feel our hips break fufu, she said in her battle lust induced state, which was only reserved for Naruto and Naruto alone. Back with Naruto, the blonde finished of the last wave of undead soldier and hellhound. Not feeling a bit tired or fatigued that he fought a small army thanks to Soul Edge's special ability. Now that's done time to, his train of thought was cut off as the memory of his clone came into mind nearly making him curse as he dashed towards his friends, hold on, he mentally prayed. With the other moments after leaving Naruto, Moxie, are sure it was right for us to just leave Naruto behind? Percy questioned, worried for his blonde friend along with his mother. Don't worry about the boss Percy. The clone said with a reassuring smile. Yeah, you've seen him in action when he killed that bad of a teacher correct? Percy nodded to this and Moxie continue. Then you don't have to worry about, she was cut off when she felt a bullet graze her cheeks. The group quickly took cover, Moxie peered out and saw several undead soldiers. Shit they must have waited to ambush us. Or some of them might have gone ahead to cut us off, Moxie said before taking aim and fired at one of the undead soldier who peered its head up blowing the top part of its head before it lit on fire, and it seems that undead soldier was carrying some grenades because as soon as it caught on fire the undead soldier exploded taking the rest of the undead soldier with him. Thank you Taish, Moxie mentally thanks the goddess of luck. We're close, Sally said, but suddenly a monstrous creature bull like monster covered in brown fur with large horns on its skull face was blocking their way, and in its right hand was a large rock, the minotaur threw the rock aiming it directly at Percy and Sally. The clone saw this and quickly dropped Grover on the ground, causing him to wake up and screamed out when he saw Pacific's son. The clone pushed both mother and son away, saving them from being crushed. Grover that was a clone now get your ass moving. Moxie said snapping Grover out of his shock state as he thought his friend got killed. If acts like any other bull then when it charges we wait for the last second, and then jump out of the way directly sideways. He can't change direction very well once he's charging. Moxie suggested. She's right, both Grover and Sally said in unison. How do you know all this and why don't you just kill it? Percy asked. I and Naruto had a mission at Mexico to assassinate a corrupt official while he was attending a bullfighting show. I've noted how the matador would sidestep at the last possible second just before the bull could hit him, and to answer your question, I've ran out of ammo, she said. Moxie turned her head and saw the Minotaur charge at them. Jump out of the way now she shouted at the last possible second. They did as instructed and jump out of the way. The bull went straight past them and ended up slamming into a tree. That should buy us some time, she thought. Reaching the hill with the tree, they saw that a valley was below them and it had a farmhouse that had yellow lights glowing in the window. 
Moxie take Percy and go. I can't go any farther. Sally cried out. Before her son or Moxie could respond they froze in fear and shock as the Minotaur came rushing up to them and it was clearly heading towards Sally. She tried to get out of the way like last time but the bull had learned its lesson last time. The bull-like man-arms shoot forward and grab Sally with his large hands. She struggled to free herself. Percy watched in horror as his mother looked at him for one last time before the monster squeezed, but before it could crush her, the bull scream out in pain as a yellow blur slice its arm off. Naruto. Percy heard Moxie called out in relief and saw his blonde friend kick the monster several feet away. Grover call for help and hurry. Moxie check on Sally's condition, and I'll handle that bull-headed freak. Naruto ordered and remembered about the special barrier. The satyr nodded and quickly ran to call for help, and both Moxie and Percy rushed to Sally's side. Mom, Naruto's here we're safe, Mom? Percy asks and saw his mother struggling for breath. I I'm, gg glad, tt2, ha ha have, a, ss son, ll like. Y y u. A and, r r remember, I love you was the last thing she said before her eyes close. Mom! Percy cried out in anguish, making Naruto look back with eyes widen. Once again he failed to protect someone. Once again he failed his friend. Once again he failed in keeping his promise. Memories of his first failure at protecting the one he loved flashed before his eyes, as both Percy and Sally, who was in her son's arms, was replaced with his image and her image. No! He muttered in denial. No! No, no. Naruto shouted in range and turned his attention to the one responsible, missing the crow that arrived behind him. You, Naruto said in a demonic voice at seeing the bullheaded man, I'll kill you ROAAA, he said and shouted as dark violet colored energy shoot out from his body and he began leaking massive amounts of killing intents. The potency caused the surrounding area around the blonde to slowly wither and die. Be grateful, freak, you are but the second person to see this form. With that the dark violet aura enveloped Naruto's body and with a massive wave they saw not Naruto but death himself. There hovering in front of them was a large figure whose face is completely hidden in the shadows of a cowl. A large robe envelopes the rest of the body, on its back were skeletal wings, and wielding a massive scythe with many skulls engraved into the flat of the blade. With just a blink of an eye, the massive figure was in front of the minotaur and slice off its remaining appendages before dark violet chains shoot up from the ground and embedded itself into where the minotaur's arms and legs once was. Scream for me, and Pacifi's son scream in pain. You feel don't you? The corrosive chakra entering your body haha, don't worry it gets worse. Naruto said in a demented voice as he stabbed the bull-like creature chest with his bone-like hands. All it could do was scream out in pain as the corrosive substance slowly melted its body. W what happened to him? The sea green eyed teen asks in fear and awe. That is Naruto's reaper form, the brunette said and visibly shivered. I've only seen it once and I wish I hadn't asks him too. This is one of his strongest technique and his most frightening. I mean, you saw those brief flashes of your death in the most brutal way possible, correct? The black haired teen and the people behind him nodded. That is one of its effects is to instill all those affected by his killing intent aura with the dread of death with flashes of images of your own death in the most brutal way. I don't know the full extent of the technique since he cancelled just when I was about to kill myself to escape that dreaded feeling, she finished and shivered again in fear. Be thankful I shall give you the sweet relief of death, Naruto said before he swung his massive scythe in once quick blurry motion slicing the minotaur into pieces. In Olympus the gods and goddess were discussing, yes discussing not arguing since their time in the elemental nation seemed to mellow them down and reminded them of the bonds of family on who would steal both Zeus' lightning bolt, Poseidon's trident, and Hades' helm of darkness, but then the Olympian felt a massive killing intent aura near the camp, which prompted Zeus to summon Irish and ordered her to bring a live video feed of the camp. They were surprised to see a blonde-haired teen surrounded by a mass of dark violet energy. Once goddess instantly recognized the teen, Naruto, the goddess mumbled. Hestia, sister, do you know this child? Demeter question having heard her sister mumbled out a name. Hestia nodded and was about to tell just who Naruto is, but a voice answered for her. He is the legacy of you Olympian and my son. They instantly turned to the source of the voice and they were surprised at who it was. Nix. Zeus muttered in a bit of fear and disbelief at seeing the primordial goddess of the night and the daughter of chaos. 
Hello Olympians, she greeted giving a court bow, manners and all, to the gods and goddess of the Olympus. You've sense it as well Nix, Hestia said to the primordial being. Yes and I knew that the rest of you gods and goddess would wonder just who my son and your legacy is, she said brining the topic to light. Wait your son and aunt Hestia's legacy, how asks a disbelief Hermes. Well if none of you interrupt me then I can properly explain, Taking their silence as an indication she decided to explain everything about Naruto, his relation to herself and Hestia, and finally his lineage with the rest of the Olympian. So let me get this straight, Athena, the goddess of wisdom started, Naruto is your son from your mortal shell Mina Namikaze and your wife Kashina Uzumaki, the daughter of Aunt Hestia's mortal shell and a legacy of the rest of us dating back to my father and Lady Hera's daughter. Nix nodded. You simplified it perfectly. Now to the reason why I and Hestia took him from the elemental nation. She snaps her finger and images of Naruto dark past flash before their eyes. Not soon after they exploded in a fit of rage and cursed out loudly at the mortals who dared harm their legacy, surprising Hestia allowed them to curse in every language they knew as she herself had the same reaction. So it wasn't much of a surprise that they promptly stood up with the full intention of smite Konoha and all its inhabitants, which Hestia stopped by standing in their way. Sister please move aside, we have some mortals to punish, Zeus ordered, close to turn into his true godly form. Yes Aunt Hestia, those mortals have a lot to answer for, not only did they dare harm a defenseless child and tortured him, but they dare harm our legacy, those insect will know the feeling of being hunted down, Artemis said vehemently, already contemplating on what kind of animal would she turn those filthy mortals into. The other nodded as well, wanting to show rightful vengeance for their legacy. Believe me nothing more would please me then to see them brought to Tartarus to be tortured for their transgression, Hestia said. Then why are you stopping a sister, Hera asks, losing her patience at the eldest Olympian. All of you did see the people of the red light correct, she reminded and they nodded, then you would know from Naruto's memory that he considers them their family and precious people. By harming Konoha you would be harming them as well, including others who he considers precious to his heart. They gave out a remorse sigh. Oh that won't be a problem, I'll be sure to avoid them as I hack down those errs, Ares said, his eyes burning with hot rage and like his father he was also close into turning into his godly form. At the warmonger statement their eyes relit up and nodded in agreement, they could easily avoid harming their legacy's precious people. You would still harm them since by killing a majority of the people in Konoha you would leave the survivors, Naruto's precious people vulnerable to attack from other nation looking to capitalize on Konoha's weakened state and have all of you forgotten the law, we are not allowed to interfere with the mortals. The goddess of the night said, as much as she want those mortals to suffer she couldn't risk harming his son's precious people. Ares roared out in rage and punched one of the columns breaking it in half, then what do you suggest we do? Need I remind you this is also an insult not only to us but to you as well primordial, he asks. My daughters, the fates, have already informed me that their end, those who dare harm their little brother, Nix informed. They relent at hearing the primordial's words, indeed if the fates decree it then it would happen soon, and it seems my son has transformed back into his original state, all heads turn back to the screen. Back with Naruto, the bond transformed back to his original self, damn it not yet used to it, the reaper form was the combined power of Kurumi's corrosive yoki. Inferno's and Elysium's special abilities combine. All held together by his unique chakra. The Reaper form is one of his strongest techniques, but it was very taxing on the body as it absorbs a lot of his chakra and he could only maintain in for a maximum of 3 minutes, even if he masters it Kurumi speculated he could only maintain the form for a maximum of 5-6 minutes, at best 7. So this jutsu was only reserved as his final trump card if he is pushed to the point of defeat. Naruto walked back towards his friend. Percy I'm sorry, he said dropping down on his knees in regret. CC can't you do anything Naruto, I mean you have these awesome powers, can't you do something please? The sea green eyed teen begged. Naruto was about to reply but Elysium stopped him. Master I can sense a bit of her life force remaining, but it is incredibly faint, she informed. Is there a way yo save her, the blonde asks, there is. But, the process would change her, I don't know to what extent, but it will change her nonetheless, her voice sounded very hesitant about the idea and the complication it might bring. Elysium, are you suggesting that he transferred his chakra into that human's body? Kurumi said, 
figuring Elysium's plan. Yes. Are you insane? Both Inferno and Kurumi snap at the blonde spirit. Is there a chance, Naruto asks putting a stop to their argument before it even begins. Yes, but it would require you to also transfer a bit of your own coils and assimilate it with her own, since the humans of this world are unlike the humans of the elemental nation who can expand their coils even if they are civilian. By doing so you can save her life, but the downside is your power level would drop to Jonin level and expose your true form. Elysium finished. Don't forget the change that could happen to Jackson San's body, we don't know the possible negative side effect that could happen to her body, heck her body could implode or mutate her, and Naruto would be responsible for either both. Kurumi reminded and glared at the blonde spirit for her softness and risk of her destined mate. But there is also a chance that it won't happen, that it would save Sally Jackson and spare a child from losing his mother, Elysium argued back. The two started to argue until Inferno had enough, enough. He roared out, this choice is ultimately Naruto-sama's decision, so let him decide it. The three entities turned to the blonde who had a contemplated look on his face, weigh the chances of success and failure, as well as the backlash and consequence of such action. Like Newton's third law, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, I choose. Before Naruto could finish, Kurumi interjected. Remember, you are risking yourself Naruto-kun, by transferring your coils and chakra into Jackson San, you are weakening yourself, and for what? For friendship, please Koi don't kid yourself. That boy was like all those other worthless humans, jealous, petty, weak, and resentful. If it weren't for that incident with that weird bad creature then I highly doubt the boy's opinion of you would have changed, she pointed out while glaring at Elysium for even suggesting that her destined mate helps such a lowly creature by doing something that would put months upon months of training down the gutter by weakening him. Besides, why should Naruto even considering helping that boy? He was like everyone else in that human school. They hated Naruto for the status he held as the student council president and student disciplinary committee. It was human nature to hate those who are more powerful or higher in a position and a school full of rich snobs and spoiled brats only cemented that fact. As the head of the student council and disciplinary committee, Naruto held more sway within the student body than any other students of the school. Something they tried to change with the money and connection their parents had, but any and all attempts would always end up in failure because Naruto held more connection and new people in high places. This fact was quickly made known and soon a lot of people would try to befriend the blonde for their own purposes, be it students or faculty members with the exception to Chiron and Miss Dodds for obvious reasons. Again, this is the pettiness if humans, to try and leech off those superior to them, something that disgusts Kurumi and made her view humanity as unintelligent mongrels, worms, and leeches hell-bent on self-destruction just to satisfy their own needs, her destined mate being the only exception. Kiyubi's hatred was from her experiences growing up, she, like her siblings, were hunted down and sealed to be used as tools, weapons for their own selfish need for power. The people of the elemental nations saw them as mindless creatures that should bend to their will, to be used like common whores. This is where her hatred for humanity came from and where Naruto differed. When she met the blonde, he was but a child, he showed no fear, no hatred, or even desire for power. Naruto only asked why she attacked the village. This shocked her and she decided to take a look at his memories. Her shock only grew, along with her hatred for humanity. She told the boy what really happened, how she was controlled by an Uchiha and the truth about his parents. Then she asked him if he wanted power to take revenge on those people who harmed him. But to her growing surprise he refused and what he said only cemented the fact that he wasn't like most humans. It's your power, not mine. Why would I want someone else's power? Power and strength should not be given it should be earned, and I will earn mine. Not for revenge, but for my sake and those who are precious to me. Oh, and I don't blame you Kiyubi. Even if you killed my parents, I don't care. Why should I? I don't even know them. If I blame you for something out of your control then I would be like the villagers, ignorant and opinionated. It's because of him that I'm hated. It's because of him that my parents are dead. All of it Isha's fault. It washes jutsu that made you rampage and attack the village. You don't go blaming the weapon. You blame the one who used it. After that Kurumi observed Naruto for an entire month before deciding to lend her aid by helping him train, and giving him permission to use her power. And then came the day he met these two, Kurumi thought, glancing at the two sentient spirits. 
how the blonde met the two was a story for another time. There is no guarantee that she would even survive after the transfer. Her body is not properly conditioned to handle chakra, especially your potent chakra, she said. I have to agree with Kurumi's sister, though it would be interesting to see how a human body melts from the inside out. I've only seen a person melt from the outside, Inferno said, gaining a curious look at the last part. He recalled the many foes he melted with his control over fire, but he never did melt someone's inside and it actually intrigued him on what it would look like but not so much that he would risk his master. But the two of you have sensed it correct, that lingering energy around her is most likely the energy left by Percy's father, she shot back. Oh, you're hoping whatever energy that still lingered within Jackson San's body would somehow help? Don't make me laugh Elysium. It wouldn't work. It's too small and different to meld with Naruto, it would be like trying to mix oil and water. They won't. So your opinion is moot and mine still stands that Naruto-kun should not help her and leave her to her fate, Kurumi retorted back with a sneer. Besides, he's known them how long, a day with Jackson-san and a week with the boy, not much bonding there to make him risk himself. Even if the process succeeds she'll die eventually, and what then? Would you have Naruto-kun, your master, risk himself again bringing her back, she further added, glaring at the blonde spirit. Her immense powers flared, evidenced by her nine tails making Elysium drop to her knees. Enough, Naruto ordered firmly getting fed up with their growing argument. I'm getting a splitting headache from the two of you arguing, he added, before glancing towards Sally and Percy. Kurumi's words were true, there were too many variables and too much risk with little guarantee of success. Even if the transfer is successful, there was a chance that her body could implode or simply melt away. Too many variables and no positive outcomes only made things worse for the blonde filling him with more regret and sadness. Ah, damn it, he mentally cursed, which for him was a first. Naruto sighed sadly and turned his eyes to meet Percy, with a remorseful voice he spoke, Percy, I'm sorry there is nothing I can do. The look of devastation in the teen's eye only made him feel worse, Sally's in a better place now and remember, she loved you, she truly did. So in return, live for her, continue on in her memory, but never forget, Naruto finished firmly. Percy nodded but didn't say anything. I come I will. And tears staring to flow like a river. Moxie brought the teen into a comforting hug and whispered soothing words. Just let it out Percy, it will only hurt more if you bottle it up. Naruto looked away in shame and cursed himself for his weakness. I should have ended my battle earlier. I could have saved her, he thought in regret. Once again, I find myself in a similar situation and in both situations it the ended the same. The only difference is it is someone else's precious person that died. Regret, that's all he felt right now. Somewhere from a distance two lone figures watched from afar. Is he in? The first figure asked. The second figure nodded. Yes, the distraction provided by the Jinchuriki proved most useful. The second figure confirmed. None of them suspect a thing. The first figure chuckled, cuckoo, excellent and with the beast guarding those weapons we can move freely with our plans, cuckoo. He said, his yellow snake-like eyes glowed menacingly. The two figures suddenly vanished in a swirl of leaves. Naruto's eyes widened when he felt a familiar energy. Impossibly, how could, his thoughts were interrupted when he saw a pink light surround Moxie and two symbols appear above her head. A snow-white dove with a pinkish aura around it and an owl. Symbols of two goddesses that Naruto knew. Well, that explains a lot, the blonde thought, recalling all the schemes and plans that his partner would think up. Her features changed as well, making her even more beautiful in Naruto's eyes. Once the light died down the clothes the brunette wore changed to a purple double-breasted uniform that showed off her thighs, a v-neck pattern that showed her, and her dark blue panties. Black and white stripe patterned leg covers, and white high heel boots. On top of her head was a purple top hat that had a queen of hearts card stuck in it. A, and Moxie's costume for Borderlands 2. Well, I thought you were beautiful before, now you're downright gorgeous, Naruto commented with a whistle. It has been determined. All hail Madeline Mox, daughter of Aphrodite, goddess of beauty, love, lust, desire, sexuality, and pleasure, legacy of Athena goddess, of warfare, wisdom, and battle strategy. Naruto heard Chiron and instantly everyone kneeled down. Naruto went to congratulate her but stopped when bright lights began to envelop him, 
causing everyone to look up at him and gasp. Above his head were fifteen symbols each depicting the major Olympians from both generations, but the last and most prominent symbol frightened them, it was a star in a crescent moon. By order and chaos, how is this possible, said a girl with curly, golden honey blonde hair and gray eyes. Everyone in camp had the same thought in mind but they were too shocked to say it out loud. I don't know but, regardless, it has been determined, Chiron said and once again kneeled down along with everyone else. All hail Naruto Uzumaki, son of Nyx, goddess of darkness and protogenos of the night. Chiron started before continuing, legacy of Hestia. Goddess of the hearth, home, and family, legacy of Hera. Goddess of marriage, motherhood, and queen of Olympus. Legacy of Demeter, goddess of the harvest, agriculture. And the harvest, legacy of Poseidon, god of the seas. Earthquakes and horses, legacy of Hades, god of the underworld. Wealth and lord of the dead, legacy of Zeus, god of lightning. Lord of the skies and king of Olympus, legacy of Aphrodite. Goddess of beauty, love, lust, desire, sexuality, and pleasure, legacy of Athena, goddess of warfare, wisdom, and battle strategy. Legacy of Artemis, goddess of the hunt, childbirth, and the moon. Legacy of Apollo, god of the sun, prophecy, and healing. Legacy of Hermes, god of messengers, travelers, and thieves. Legacy of Hephaestus, god of fire, the forge, and volcanoes. Legacy of Dionysus, god of grape harvest, wine, and madness. Legacy of Ares, god of war, rage, and violence. Chiron finished. Well this is unexpected. When the glow died down, Naruto heard another set of gasps. Naruto you, Percy trailed off on the last part with wide eyes, though they held intrigue and confusion. Naruto caught on. Of course, he sighed, since the seal he placed to conceal his mutation in appearance, which happened after he regained the other half of Kurumi's Yoki chakra from the fourth Hokage's corpse, dropped. Kurumi said it was a side effect from her Yoki entering his body. He felt weird at first but learned to accept it and used a genjutsu seal to hide his appearance. The good thing about this mutation, aside from his wonderful appearance as Kurumi put it, is his senses were enhanced and he got an increase in stamina. As for power level, it did not increase. It only furthered his chakra potency. Naruto's whisker marks darkened and became more distinct. His untamed hair grew shoulder length with six strands of hair like streaks running down the front, side, and backside of his head. But the most noticeable features were his nine tails, fox like ears on top of his head, and his sharp claws. Like Moxie, his clothing changed to a black and red colored male kimono that showed off his figure. Four of Naruto's nine tails were reddish gold. This signified his level of power. If Naruto were to rank himself, he could say he was around a high B rank to middle A rank, that's with using the two soul swords a rank with Kurumi's Yoki since he could only maintain three tails worth of her power and has yet to fully master controlling it. Are you afraid, he asked, already assuming they now saw him as a monster. No, came the quick response from Moxie and Percy, he looked at them in a bit of disbelief. You are my friend Naruto and you are nothing like those monsters. Percy knew his friend was nothing like them and said the last part with venom. You're my partner Naruto and I don't care about this new appearance. To me you're still the same guy the first met in the cafe. If anything this just made you even hotter, Moxie said with a look on her face. And how about all of you, he asked the campers. Some had a look of weariness on them but it was overlapped by the awestruck look they had. None of the campers are afraid of you, Mr. Uzumaki. Chiron stated firmly, shocked and weary yes, but afraid, no mostly shocked because of your lineage, he said. Naruto nodded understanding what Chiron meant. I suppose so, the blonde said in agreement. I'm related to 14 Olympians and one primordial being, so I suppose it's a shocker that I exist, he concluded. Naruto made a one handed seal doden. Shikyu Meso no Jutsu, Earth Release, Earth Burial Technique. As the name implied, it was a technique used to bury the dead. I pride myself on being an excellent judge of character and I firmly believe that Sally Jackson was a kind, considerate, and overall great mother. Naruto said in a somber tone. I only wish I could have saved and gotten over, he ended, bowing his head in respect, a gesture everyone else followed in respect for the passing. 
I'm sure if things were different me and Mrs. Jackson could have easily become friends. But I felt we were, she was an easy person to get along with, did not judge me for what I am and accepted me. For that, I thank her and wish her peace in the afterlife, Moxie said bowing her head and wiping away a stray tear. Thank you, Percy said to his two friends. I never realized that my mom gave up a lot of things for me, but hey I guess that's what defines a mother, right? For that I am thankful and I'm sorry mom for doubting you. I love you mom, he choked out as tears began to flow once again. Moxie allowed the sea green eyed teen to lean on her for comfort and said teen silently thanked her. Percy nodded towards Naruto and the blonde made a hand seal, causing the coffin to sink into the ground. Once it sunk down a tombstone appeared with the image of Sally Jackson etched into the rock with the inscription. Sally Jackson, a loving woman and a great mother. Looks like Percy tired himself out. Understandable that he is emotionally exhausted, Naruto said summoning two shadow clones to gently carry him. He turned his attention to the honey blonde haired girl, who straightened up when she realized her fellow blonde's gaze was on her. Show my clones where the infirmary is will you um, Naruto trailed off. Annabeth Chase, daughter of Athena, she introduced herself. Naruto nodded. Yes, nice meet you Annabeth. Can you please direct my clones to the infirmary? Yes, she answered. Naruto nodded in thanks and ordered his clones to follow the girl. Now, Chiron. Where are we supposed to stay? The blonde asked gesturing to both him and Moxie. Well since Ms. Mox, Moxie, just call me Moxie, okay? Chiron nodded. As I was saying Ms. Moxie can stay in Aphrodite's cabin, cabin 10, since she is her daughter. Moxie shook her head. Sorry but I'm staying with him, she said pointing at Naruto and, by her tone of voice, she wasn't going to take no for an answer. Well, Mr. Uzumaki could stay with you at your mother's cabin since he is her legacy. Naruto nodded, not having the mental strength to say anything else. Good, Selina here will show you to cabin 10. The trainer of heroes gestured towards a young teen with blonde hair with brown streaks, blue eyes, and a slim figure. Hello, I'm Selena Beauregard, she introduced herself. So, you're my sister huh? Moxie looked at her sister with analytical eyes. Selena felt a bit small under Moxie's intimidating gaze and she knew her sister was judging her. A bit scrawny, but I can fix that and I guess that goes for my other siblings as well, Selena heard her say. She nodded confirming Moxie's words, I see, don't worry me and Naruto here will fix that. Naruto just nodded, not even trying to do or say anything else at this point. Um, let me show you to cabin 10 then. While I'm at it, I might as well show you to the other cabins. Both nodded and followed the daughter of Aphrodite. The duo saw 12 cabins to which Naruto raised a brow in confusion. I'll ask her during the tour, he thought. We have 12 cabins, as you can clearly see. The first is Lord Zeus's cabin, cabin 1. The cabin was a marble cabin that looked like a mausoleum with heavy columns and big bronze double doors that had holographic projections of lightning bolts accompanied by thunderous sounds. A bit excessive, Naruto thought while his partner was in the same line as him along with thinking that the Lord of the Sky was a bit too flashy. That or he might be compensating for something. You know, since you are a legacy of Lord Zeus, it's possible you could get to stay in this cabin. Naruto gained a thoughtful look at Selena's remark and thought of asking Chiron about that later. Next is Lady Hera's cabin, cabin 2. The second cabin was formal looking, graceful with slim shimmering columns garlanded with pomegranates and flowers. Naruto nodded in approval at the simple yet elegant design, as did Moxie. There's beauty in simplicity, he thought. Aside from the statue, I see no furniture, why is that? Moxie asked as she had assumed that she would see elegant furniture inside, but it seems that wasn't the case. Instead of Selena answering that, a voice behind them answered for her. Lady Hera doesn't run around having affairs with mortals. That is her husband's job, the voice behind them joked. Naruto turned his head around and smiled. Grover, it's good to see you awake, are feeling okay? Grover nodded with a sad look on his face. I'm sorry that I wasn't much. Naruto cut him off, already figuring out what the satyr was going to say. Don't Grover. Don't blame yourself, okay, he stated softly. It was my decision to split the group, so the blame falls to me and me alone, he stated firmly. But, he tried to protest but a raised hand from Naruto silenced him. But nothing, 
As leader it falls to me to shoulder the blame and responsibility. Naruto stated. Yeah and you helped. Don't you recall handing me ammunition when I was running low and you patrolling the Montauk area allowed Naruto's clones to set the traps that got us a head start? Moxie reminded, pointing out the things Grover did that helped the group. So stop blaming yourself, got it. Naruto ended with a glare. The Caucasian satyr nodded. The tour continued with Grover acting as the second tour guide. Poseidon's Cabin, Cabin 3. A long, low building with windows facing the ocean which was made from what Naruto and Moxie could tell, rough sea stones. Pieces of coral and seashell were embedded into the outside wall and there was a trident with a big bronze number 3 over the door. So this is to be Percy's new home, the blonde thought. The next cabin was cabin 4, Demeter's cabin. The cabin was covered in flowers and tomato plants growing on the walls and doorway with wild flowers and roses on the porch and an actual grass roof top. Well, at least I know where to get vegetables and grains. The blonde thought with Moxie thinking the place looked like nice and that she wouldn't mind staying in the cabin. The next cabin was Aerie's cabin, which was painted red and had a large boar's head over the door with barbed wire on the roof. Moxie thought the place looked dull, while Naruto thought the cabin needed work or a change, something to the likeness of an army base tent. It would be more fitting, he thought. Hey Selina, showing the new campers around said a rather tall girl with long, light brown hair and a feminine build with some muscles. Guys, this is Clarice LaRue, daughter of Ares, Selina introduced. Naruto nodded. Nice to meet you, he said offering his hand in friendship, which the young teen accepted. Nice grip, a fighter, he commented. Yours as well and yes, I am a fighter. Comes with being the daughter of the god of war, Clarice said with a smirk though it hid the fact that she was a bit nervous and weary of the blonde after witnessing him transforming and decimating the minotaur. Naruto's appearance, to be honest, only made him look attractive in her opinion. Moxie shook her hand as well and the daughter of war knew her fellow brunette was a fighter, like Naruto, and Clarice respected that. Care for a spar tomorrow, she challenged. The nicknamed Blood Queen smirked. Sure, she accepted. Naruto had a knowing smirk. Looks like the two of them are getting along nicely, he thought. Clarice decided to join the little tour group and the three girls started chatting with each other. Scratch that, it seems all three of them are getting along nicely. Cabin 6, or Athena's cabin, was a grey building with an owl carved over the doorway with plain white curtains. Hello Annabeth. Naruto greeted his fellow blonde before asking, how is Percy? He's asleep now and your clones stayed behind apparently to monitor his condition. The honey blonde teen informed. Naruto saw the look in her eyes and mentally sighed. You have questions for me huh? Annabeth simply nodded as she stared at the blonde's nine tails, whisker marks, and fox ears that made her fellow blonde look like a large plushie. Well, save them for tomorrow. I'm a bit tired and after the tour I'll head to bed. Is that acceptable? Naruto asked. Annabeth was still busy looking at those tails of his but managed to hear his words. Sure. This just gives me more time to think up questions. Behind the two blondes, the three tour guides and Naruto's partner rolled their eyes. Moxie rolled her eyes because the look on Annabeth's face was the same look Naruto would have if he had some questions or was thinking of something. You know, aside from the whisker marks and the angular jaw, the two of you almost look alike, just like brother and sister, Moxie commented, knowing full well her partner and secret love interest, which she plans to rectify soon dream was to have a large family. The two blondes blink once and registered the brunette's words. Well I am related to everyone in camp so yeah I'm kind of the older brother or something, the blonde said. Wait. Naruto, how old are you? Wow princess, forward much, Clarice teased. Already trying to claim the strong blonde all to yourself huh, Selina added, smirking. The blush on the honey blonde teen's face would put a tomato to shame. My. My I never knew she was the bold type, Fufu, Moxie said, further adding the level of embarrassment and flustered expression on the daughter of Athena. I never knew you were that kind of person Annabeth, Grover said, throwing his own words into the mix. Despite his tired self, Naruto couldn't help but chuckle and decided to spare his fellow blonde, now, now. No teasing her, he stated calmly. And Annabeth, I'm 18 okay. Annabeth nodded finally getting her blush under control and glared at the four who teased her before huffing in annoyance. But then she smiled. 
So that makes you like my uncle or big brother. Well in terms of relation, you would be my aunt, but that seems strange so instead I and Moxie can be like your older siblings. He said with an honest smile, which Moxie rarely saw. Annabeth gained a small smile at that and nodded. Okay, good. Let's continue with the tour, want to join in? Naruto offered, which she accepted. Inside his mindscape, Elysium smiled at seeing her master's more gentle side surfacing and hoped to see more of it. I hope you can find the happiness you always wanted Naruto-kun, she thought. To some it would seem strange how readily Naruto accepted them as family though some people would be right. The thing is though, none of them have lived a life of loneliness, a life where everyone shuns you or turns you away. So his less than stellar life was the reason for his optimism, but it is not to say he didn't view Lilith or her girls as his family. He loved each one of them like his own actual family and it only fueled his desire to find his actual family. So you can only imagine the emotions he felt when Chiron explained about the camp and its residents, that there could be a chance that he has actual, albeit half, siblings. A sense of hope that he thought died long before and the dream he had long forgotten suddenly resurfaced and filled him once more. The next cabin may look normal or ordinary at first glance, and the two new campers really thought it was but Annabeth explained that when hit by sunlight, cabin 7, or Apollo's cabin, would look like it was made of solid gold and gleam so much that it is difficult to look at. Yup, just like the sun annoying because of its brightness, the blonde thought. Moxie made no comment and simply shrugged, not really caring enough to do so, verbally or mentally. The next cabin made Naruto frown a little. With his ability to sense negative emotion, he could feel the lingering anger, sadness, and betrayal within cabin 8, also known as Artemis's cabin. Who uses this cabin? The Jinchuriki asked. Well, the hunters use this cabin since Lady Artemis's cabin is more honorary, but seeing as you are her legacy as well, it's possible you can stay. Though I wouldn't try it considering, um Lady Artemis's dislike of males, Annabeth answered. The daughters of Athena explained everything she knew about the hunters and their history, as far as she knew that is. Moxie scoff about the hunter's thoughts on males. I think they are biased. Sure, there are dishonest and despicable males out there, but it does not mean all males are like that. The brunette stated and pointed at Naruto, who blinked. Take this knucklehead for example. The two of us sleep together naked every single day and not once did he ever take advantage of that or ever make a move without my okay. Moxie said with a factual tone. Which is true Naruto would never take advantage of any woman, enemy or not. He would just leave them flustered enough as a distraction to knock them out. Even after Lilith gave him the birds and the bees talk, which is one of the most dreaded experiences of his young life, followed by her lesson on seduction and pleasure. How to resist and how to seduce, the pleasure points in the human body, specifically on women and the reason why it is important for him to learn the topic. The first reason was so he could resist being seduced into being captured. Almost all information gathering or assassination involved seducing your target into lowering their guard. The majority of those targets were males. Second, so he could turn it around on his would-be seductress so he could escape. Third, so he could satisfy his girlfriends or wife, Vays. That particular lesson was taken out by the foolish civilian council of Konoha, but it was taught by those who knew the subject pretty well. It's still an important Kunoichi tool to use their feminine charm to lure their target into a false sense of security, causing them to drop their guard. Make no mistake, they still have their pride as woman, but a mission is mission. They knew the risk and the things they would have to do once they became ninja. The art of seduction was taught to newly instated kunoichi by either their female Jonin sensei or someone else who could teach it. Though not many could perform seduction as most, if not all, men had one taste, curvaceous and bodacious women. Unlike the female gender who, and this supported by research conducted by both parties, had more particular tastes and kinks than men. As the male gender is more direct and with simple tastes in bed, though some did have certain kink as it was more of the vain and outgoing types. Oh, so are the two of you a couple, Selena asked, her mother's personality surfacing like hot lava. Moxie grinned saucily. Well we've been partners for a long time, and not in the sense you think of. She explained about their relationship and their job, which Clarice nodded in approval. But we do have sex after every mission, so you could say we are sex friends or buddies, though I will change that soon, she thought on the last part, which her sister somehow caught on to since Selena gave her a wink. 
It seems the daughters of Aphrodite could tell what the other is thinking about. Naruto still had a frown on his face. If they don't quell the hatred they have, someone could easily use it to their advantage, among other things, he thought. One of the many things that could easily bring down an enemy or an empire was hatred. It was by far the easiest emotion, next to love, to manipulate. A proper and competent strategist worth their salt could use this to their advantage to take down the hunters. It was a tactic that, at one point, the blonde used. A prime example was on his former teammate Sasuke when the two clashed at the Valley of the End. Naruto knew the black-haired Uchiha's hatred for him, as he began to slowly remove his mask of ignorance. Sasuke began to see that he was being surpassed by the class clown or by a no-name commoner. Jealousy turned to resentment, and resentment turned into hatred. This fact allowed Naruto to dictate the course of their fight and easily topple the Uchiha. Since he is related to the goddess of the hunt, by extension the hunters are his family, and as an Uzumaki he would protect his family above all else including his own life. Which to say this is one of his fatal flaws, I'll have to find a way to mend their hearts so they can let go of their hate, cause I will not allow someone, anyone to take advantage of any of my family members, he promised himself. The question is how will he do that? How will he accomplish that if he didn't even know where they are? Wait, Annabeth, do the hunters visit? Said girl nodded. Yes, since we hold somewhat of a traditional camp versus hunters competition, she said. Naruto detected a bit of animosity. I see, is the camp doing well? He asked slowly. He got a quick shake of the head indicating a no, by how much? He asked. Fifty, the three campers and the one satyr said in unison. I see, he said and pondered. We'll be fixing that, he stated. What you'll take all of the hunters by yourself? Clarice asked, though she was still awed by how he took down the Minotaur. No, no but I won't say anything till I have a talk with Chiron, which I will do after this tour and before I head to bed, he said, his previous exhaustion gone, replaced with curiosity on just how and why the camp is losing, though he had a sinking feeling. I will confirm it with Chiron, he mentally concluded. Inside his mindscape Inferno had a vicious smirk on his face. I see Master's cunning and devious mind is active again. He, those campers are in for one hell of a time he, he thought, mentally laughing like a madman on drugs. Moxie saw the cogs inside Naruto's head started spinning and it could only mean one thing. Oh boy, I pity them if whatever Naruto is thinking of comes to pass. The last time she saw that look, well, let's just say bodies started piling up and blood flowed down the streets like a river. Yeah, gruesome indeed but their client wanted to send a message to those human traffickers and illegal traders. So Naruto located the most dangerous group and killed them all in one night leaving their bodies for all to see. Oh, made me remember how horny he got me after that fufu. Moxie, for intents and purposes, is a sadist who loved the screams of her enemies and blood splattered around, something that a lot of people would resent her for. Not Naruto though, he accepted her for who she is, faults and all. So both of you are like mercenaries for hire, Annabeth said in astonishment since by Naruto's explanation of the contract missions was the same as quests. Naruto nodded, yeah, but the difference is that we work under contract, not by contract, he stated before continuing. The missions we usually accept are a rank to s rank missions and the people who hire us are, well, the government. Sorry, can't get into too many details. But why are you a student then? She asked in confusion. Well it's my cover, simple as that, he said. The campers and satyr nodded in understanding. After not much longer, they arrived at the next cabin. Cabin 9 is Hephaestus's cabin and, to Naruto, it looked like a smith's shop, with brick and smokestacks like any other forges and lots of gears around the entrance. Naruto are you thinking? Moxie trailed off and Naruto nodded, both having the same idea. Naruto greeted two teens. The first was a male African American with a slight scowl on his face, muscular like of those ball players, and a working man's hands. The teen's name was Charles Beckendorf or Charlie as he preferred to be called. The second was a female teen with cocoa brown skin, also had a firm grip, probably from forging, black hair that was tied up with a red bandana. The young teen's name was Nissa. She was currently eyeing Naruto, with said blonde being completely oblivious. He chatted with the two of them getting quickly acquainted with Charlie and Nissa. Both found Naruto easy to get along with as he projected this kind and calming aura around him. Here, 
This is a bow I personally made and the arrows, or what I managed to save. Both children of the smith god nodded in approval at the craftsmanship and work Naruto had done to make such weapons. And these are the only bullets specifically made for Moxie's weapons. Naruto showed the bullets he made and the share Amy. These are impressive weapons, Charlie complimented with Nissa nodding in agreement, I like the overall appearance and uniqueness of the gun. Well, Moxie prefers guns over my ways, but don't think she knows how to handle all kinds of weaponry, Naruto said. Moxie nodded, affirming the blonde's words. So, do you have the tools to make these weapons? Charlie asked looking over the blueprints of some of the weapons Naruto drew up. The blonde nodded. I do and I would appreciate the help. Sure blondie, and besides, I'm interested in seeing how good you were with your hands, Nissa said with a subtle innuendo. Not discouraged by Naruto's different appearance since there wasn't much change and, to be honest, it only enhanced that feral look he had, which she found to be sexy. Moxie sighed and whispered something to the dark-haired girls. Seriously? And Moxie simply nodded. What did you tell her? Naruto asked curiously. Moxie smiled and said, Sorry Naruto, but it's just between us girls. Naruto simply nodded, saving himself the headache and moved on to the next cabin which was Moxie's soon-to-be new home. Cabin 10, Aphrodite's cabin, was a wooden building with a blue painted roof, pillars, checkerboard deck with wooden steps and light gray walls. Naruto did not need his enhanced sense of smell to know the place was heavily perfumed. Um, Moxie, I won't be staying here. My sense of smell is too strong and the perfume is making me dizzy. Naruto said in the kindest way possible. It was too much perfume. Not even Lilith's main bordello was this heavily perfumed. The fluffed out door opened, revealing the inside was like a life-sized dollhouse with pink walls and white window trim. The lace curtains were pastel blue and green which matched the sheets and feather comforters on all the beds. With his keen eye Naruto could see the row of bunk beds were separated between boys and girls by a curtain. The cabin looked clean but Naruto easily spotted chocolate wrappers, letters, and other things under each bed. Yeah, I'm staying in another cabin. I'll even risk staying at the goddess of the hunt's cabin, he said with a shudder at the amount of pink. Don't knock it till you try it handsome, said a tall Asian girl with dark hair styled in ringlets and brown eyes. Moxie narrowed her eye at the look the Asian girl was sending Naruto. Oh hell no bitch, you won't get to wrap your fingers around my man. The brunette thought and to add more ire, the Asian girl walked up to her Naruto and wrapped her slim arms around his neck. The names drew Tanaka, what's yours handsome, the Asian teen asked, rubbing her body against the blonde. She found the blonde quite attractive and his whisker marks made him even cuter in her eyes. Moxie was about to step in but stopped herself as she saw Naruto's sudden expression change. Drew. Yup, that was his cold tone which caused the other to straighten up and shiver. Such a display in public is unacceptable as well as any other illicit behaviors. So will you kindly let go, he stated slowly as a miasmic dark aura surrounded him and nine demonic masks appeared behind the blonde making the Asian teen shriek in terror and quickly nod in fright. Naruto had his disarming smile on his face. Good, you know how to follow, meaning we can fix that attitude of yours, he said as he had already guessed what kind of person Drew and what kind of personality she had. He turned towards his younger siblings, as he viewed them. My, my, all of you look so slim and a bit skinny. I, or rather me and Moxie, will be rectifying that soon. Very soon, he stated sending chills down their spines, with the exceptions of Moxie, Selena, and Clarice as the three of them were blushing and turned on by display of dominance by the blonde Jinchuriki. Annabeth, she was just curious as to how the miasma and masks appeared since the blonde was not manipulating the mist. Grover noticed the look on Naruto's face, the same look that he gave anyone who violated the rules, and turned away. Naruto, you go on ahead and finish with the tour. I'll stay behind and assess each and every one of my siblings, Moxie said with a disarming and sadistic smile of her own. Selena, stay behind would you kindly? said girl nodded in fear of her elder sister's look. Naruto nodded and his dark aura vanished. Very well, he turned towards his supposed tour guides. Shall we continue? he asked, acting like nothing happened. They followed behind the blonde with both Clarice and Annabeth asking him questions. Now my little siblings, let your older sister assess all of you, she said while dragging Drew, who tried to escape, inside. 
Don't worry, I'll be gentle Fufu. They paled at Moxie's tone of voice. Naruto sighed as he saw the gleam in his fellow blonde's eyes. Fine, you can pet one of my tails. Annabeth beamed and quickly rubbed one of Naruto's nine tails, causing to blonde to purr, which he tried and failed to suppress, this made them laugh. Ha ha the big strong blonde, you're more of an oversized plushie, Clarice teased and joined in on petting the blonde. Said, plushie, simply grumbled incoherent words in his pout, much to Naruto's dismay, made him look even cuter, something a man like him could not accept. He was handsome, not cute, thank you very much, but he couldn't say it. This attracted the attention of more campers, more of the younger and curious ones. Some of the younger girls pleaded with him to allow them to pet the tails with the infamous puppy dog eyed jutsu. Naruto sighed in defeat and nodded. Why? He screamed mentally to the heavens. Grover was chuckling at his friend's dismay and snickered as he became a living plush toy for the female gender's amusement, though he was slightly jealous of the attention his friend received, as were every male within the vicinity. Can we please finish the tour? asked an irritated Naruto as he tried his best not to purr, still failing miserably. Face it koi, you've become these girls plushy he he, Kurumi teased. Inferno snickered at the sight of his master's current state. Elysium did find the scene cute. Well I think it's nice that Naruto-sama is bonding with his family, the blonde sentient spirit said. Oh yeah he is, Kurumi said offhandedly, he better not let his guard down or grow soft she stated loud enough for the blonde to hear. I won't and I can sense their emotions so it won't be any sort of trouble, Naruto responded. He could easily detect if any of them had any sort of ill intent with his ability to sense negative emotions, such as hatred and anger. The next cabin was a bit old and worn down. A little cleaning and fixing up should change that, Naruto thought after seeing cabin 11, otherwise known as Hermes cabin. Naruto was greeted by a sandy blonde teen with blue eyes, athletic, muscular build, and this sneaky look on his face as well as a deep pale scar that ran from the bottom of his eye down to his chin. The camper's name, Luke Castellan son of Hermes, he said. Naruto nodded. I'm sure enough you know who I am, he said, trying not to sound snobbish. His instincts were telling him to keep his guard up around the son of Hermes. Luke nodded. Yeah, it's kind of hard not to know the guy who turns out to be the legacy to all 14 major Olympians as well as the son of a primordial goddess. That and how you took down Pacifi's son. He shuddered a bit. Recalling the gruesome visions of death brought by his fellow blonde's killing intent. I notice how overcrowded the cabin is. Why is that? Naruto asked while assessing how much of a threat Luke is and how he would have to kill the blonde if he ever becomes a threat. I'll kill silently and make it look like an accident. He thought the cogs in his mind started turning. Cabin 11 takes all newcomers, all undetermined and unclaimed kids stay here until such time that they are claimed, Luke explained. So you welcome all newcomers, all visitors, naturally because Hermes is the god of travelers. Naruto deduced and Luke nodded confirming his words. I'm guessing the claiming takes time, a lot of time from what I'm seeing, he said, seeing how cramped the cabin looks. Luke once again nodded. Yeah, it takes a while, he said. Naruto sweat dropped. He guessed that they would have to prove themselves. The blonde realized the irony since, at one point in time, he had wanted the villagers to acknowledge him, not as a monster but as a person. But now he could care less what they think of him. I see, Naruto sighed. Can the cabin be renovated, expanded, or even fixed, he asked. You'll have to ask Chiron about that, Luke said. Naruto nodded. I will in nice meeting you Luke, he said before heading to the last and certainly not the least, cabin 12, Dionysus cabin. The roof and walls were lined with grapevines and overall looked decent with two occupants, Castor and Pollux. Naruto found the two to be quite decent and friendly, discussing about certain vineyards and drinks. It seems that this is the end of our tour. I hope you enjoyed seeing our wonderful establishment, Clarice joked a bit, surprising both Grover and Annabeth. It would seem so, Naruto was cut off by a small earthquake and something rising up from the ground. His eyes widened as a new cabin appeared from the ground, this also alerted all the other campers, including Chiron. The 3764 square foot cabin was rustic in design with a mixture of large log shaped columns, galaxite stone, which seems to shimmer like the night stars, and vertical siding. 
On the front door was the symbol of Nix and had the number zero on it. Well, that solves my cabin problem, he said. Wow, Naruto, your cabin looks like one of those expensive log cabins I read about in that magazine that one time, Moxie said. Naruto turned towards his partner, you're done assessing your siblings, I take it. Moxie nodded, yeah, basically. They need work on their stamina and strength, she said. I'm also making a diet plan for each of them. Oh, he inquired. All of them are too skinny and eat too many sweets, not enough meat and protein, she said. Naruto nodded and saw Chiron amongst the crowd. He changed his expression to a more cold and serious one. Chiron, he called out slowly. Yes, I need to discuss something of importance with you and no, this cannot wait until tomorrow, Naruto said in a serious tone. Seeing the seriousness in the blonde's expression, the trainer of heroes nodded. All campers please return to your proper cabins, he ordered. Naruto could see the curious looks. Guys, you can visit my cabin tomorrow, for now, rest. They nodded to his request. Once everyone left, Chiron explained that both he and Moxie would need permission to enter his cabin because of circumstances. The inside of Naruto's cabin was stocked with expensive furniture such as a marble table, a black silk couch, and a Sony 50-inch flat-screen HD television mounted on the wall with surround sound speakers. But the one thing that attracted Naruto's attention was a portrait of his two mothers. Nix, who was in her Mina form was a woman with shoulder-length blonde hair, D-cup breast, peach-white skin, bright blue eyes and a slender but curvaceous body. And Kashina Uzumaki a woman with long crimson red hair, vibrant purple eyes, E-cup breast, and a voluptuous yet feminine build. Both were in a loving embrace as their hands were around Kashina's pregnant belly. Moms, he thought with a slight tear in his eyes. So these are your parents, they look beautiful, Moxie commented, holding Naruto hands in comfort as she could read the blonde's emotion. Naruto nodded and wiped the single tear away. Yes they are. He quickly recomposed himself. Let's um, talk in the dining room, he said. The dining table was a long wooden oak table that was large enough to seat 20 people. Now, let's discuss about the camp and everything concerning it. Naruto stated. Chiron nodded and knew the discussion would be long. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.